Ladies and gentlemen, welcome to the Field of 68's Media Day Tour. We are live. It is CAA Media Day. Rob Doster here. I got Jeff Goodman with me. We are going to be joined by every single head coach in the CAA here in the next three hours. And then to take us home, we have John Fanta. We got Monica Moore. We're going to be talking to every single head coach on the women's side as well. Best part about this, Jeff, we're also going to be getting connected with uh, the preseason All-CAA First Team Preseason yeah. Player of the Year. Spoiler alert, Amari Williams at Drexel. I don't think that's much of a surprise to anybody. Uh, but before we get into all of that, uh, we have a preseason poll to break down. Who doesn't love a nice preseason poll, Goodman? The way that it shook out, Charleston. Shocker, I know, right? Charleston was the first team in the CAA men's basketball preseason poll. UNCW coming in second. Drexel with one first place vote is third there. We have Hofstra. We have Delaware. We have Towson. Northeastern rounding out the top seven. And then William & Mary, Stony Brook, Elon, Monmouth, Campbell, Hampton, and North Carolina. a and you can see it right there on your screen. Jeff, uh, give me your takeaways on this poll. You know, obviously, you got Charleston at number one, but I think there's still some questions, and I can't wait to talk to Pat Kelsey um, about, you know, the fact that they lost the bunch. You know, they bring back uh, some really good pieces from last year's team, but again, uh, you're losing four of their top seven or eight guys, and how is he going to revamp this team with a couple transfers that they brought in? So I think, you know, this league might be a little bit more wide open than people think. Yeah, I think what's really interesting about it is uh, two of the the better programs and two of the better coaches in the league and, and Bill Cohen at Northeastern and Geno Ford at Stony Brook are picked in the, the middle to the bottom half. And to me, that kind of speaks to the depth of the conference overall. Yeah, like those are two really, really good coaches. And uh, we'll, we'll talk here to Geno uh, after we, we open with Pat Scary. I, I'll tell you what, no media day will ever open with the juice that this one will of Pat Scary and Gino Ford, maybe the two most entertaining coaches in America going back to back. So I, I can't wait. Uh, Scary's probably had three or four cups of coffee already. I, I've, I've got my Dunkin' Donuts. I'm ready for Scary. And uh, yeah, the preseason team, you know, certainly one that um, has a lot of talent in it. And you and I, um, you know, we'll talk to a couple of these guys, but uh, Ante Brzevich is 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 on it from Charleston. I saw him a bunch last year, and his story is amazing, Rob. I mean, you know, coming out of Croatia, he told me nobody wanted him. Nobody at any level of college basketball. Now he might be the best player for one of the best mid-major teams in America in Charleston. Yep, to round out that uh, that first, and we already mentioned Amari Williams from Drexel, preseason player of the year, two-time CAA defensive player of the year. Uh, it's not often you see a guy that known for his defense that gets that kind of uh, preseason pub, so I think that it kind of shows you the respect that teams in this league have for Amari. Tyler Thomas from Hofstra, Charles Thompson from Towson, and Trezarian White from UNC Wilmington round out the first team on the preseason uh, CAA all second uh, all CAA preseason second team. Sorry, I need to have another cup of coffee like Pat Scary here. Uh, Jair Davis from Delaware, Anthony Delorso from Campbell, Max McKinnon from Elon, Rain Smith from Charleston, and Tyler Stevenson Moore from Stony Brook. You know what I love about this league, Jeff? We got a Croatian. Go we got uh, we got a guy from England. We have three Australians. We got a dude from Connecticut, a dude from Texas, a dude from Delaware, right. all over the map. Yeah, I, I love this league. Again, I think it's one of the best um, mid-major leagues in America. Uh, I would love to see them get a shot to get two teams in the tournament. You know, obviously, last year you had that maybe an opportunity with Charleston. Um, but, yeah, I, I think it's time to get this party started, Robert. And I think uh, we know the guy to get it going. Yeah, that would be Towson head coach Pat Scary is going to be joining us here uh, in just a second. Towson picked uh, tied fifth in the preseason poll. Pat, what's going on, man? Jeff said that you've had four cups of coffee by now. Can you confirm or deny those allegations? I'm going to vehemently deny that. I've had one coffee. Um, I, I worked out on the Peloton, and I've been doing oh, research the last five minutes I out where Goodman rented his suit from because I know he doesn't own it. <laughs> 
Hey, Pat. Uh, rumor uh, has it. Ask you, who's but, your? Go ahead, Rob. Who's, go who's ahead. your favorite uh, Peloton instructor? <laughs> you know, Jen Sherman is just, you know, it's a little bit my era, the music. So, like, uh, you know, Jen Sherman who I was on this morning with for 45 minutes. How about you, Rob? Uh, I like Kendall Tool and Alex Toussaint. Those are my two go-tos. Depending on the mood, right? You got to have the right mood, the right vibe, the right kind of music for that day. That's what it is. All right, Pat, let's get into talking about your team because uh, you turn over a lot of talent on this roster. But Charles Thompson, first team preseason all CAA comes back. Uh, what what does it mean to be able to get a player like that to turn down the opportunity to go into the portal, the opportunity to chase the, maybe a higher number in NIL, maybe a higher level of basketball to get him back to the program? Well, you know, one, we're pretty sure of that. Uh, Charles is the unicorn when it comes to college basketball. He's in it for all the right reasons. Um, you know, I, I firmly believe that he, he'll finish his career here in, in the same breath as the kid Benjamin that we had, you know, um, who was player of the year. So, I think he's as, you know, 1A, 1B the type of players we had. And he's the captain. He's the face of the program. And, and he's doing an outstanding job. He's I'm going to tell you this, Rob. He's had as good an off season as anyone we've had here in the last 12 years. So, Pat, we, we know about Thompson. Who else is going to step up this year? Because, again, there, there's there's a lot of opportunity with everything that you lost. Yeah, we're going to play a lot of guys. I think, you know, uh, I was proud of the group last year, Jeff. Uh, in spite of all the injuries, we were able to hang in there and have some success. Obviously fell a little bit short. Um, but we've had quite a few guys waiting in the wings for their opportunity, you know. Uh, and, and, you know, we think we've got really good freshmen and a couple of good guys out of the portal. So our expectations internally are, are, are pretty high. But uh, Christian May will be a key guy for us. You know, we've been uh, – We've had, a, you know, three or four guys that have taken big jumps from year one to year two. And for us to have the success we want, I, I think he's the guy that, you know, need, needs to do that. When we published the Almanac, more, Jeff, Pat, you said – when we published the Almanac, you said of Dylan Williamson, I should not have redshirted him. Why? Yeah, he, he's talented. You know, um, we did last year because we had Hicks – who started at the point for us, and then Gibson, who was an all-league point guard. And, you know, some people forget it. Oliver Gibson missed the last 30 games uh, with an injury, but it wasn't like a season-ending injury, Rob. Every couple weeks, uh, we were like, hey, we think we're going to get him back. We think we're going to get him back. And then the middle of February, where I'm kind of like, are we going to get him back? And they're like, no. So Williamson had a good year last year in practice. Um, he's had a good preseason. He's a, he's a really dynamic guard that can score. Um, and yeah, in hindsight, I, I wish I hadn't redshirted him. I know why I did, but it ended up being a mistake. So a year ago, Pat, uh, you, uh, you came back to Twitter. It was a huge day for obviously X previously called Twitter. <laughs> um, your words of wisdom are, are something I look forward to every single morning when I wake up and I go to Twitter today. Has it helped you? you absolutely. It's changed my life. All right. Today, you quote the great Don Meyer and late Don Meyer. Uh, on a good team, you have players who do the dirty jobs. On a great team, everyone does the dirty jobs. Uh, what is your, without quoting from somebody else, Pat, what is your, 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 the quote you use the most in practice that you can actually repeat? No profanities. <laughs> what, what is something that you use for your team uh, that, that resonates? You know, we can have results or, or we can have excuses, but we can't have both. That's one that they'll hear a lot. I try yeah. to tell Doster that all the time. I, I use that, maybe not those exact words with Doster, but I try to use those too. And he just doesn't quite buy in like your players buy into your coaching. They, well, these what, guys did you buy into what Goodman was telling you? Depends how many lagers I've had on a Saturday night, you know. <laughs> All right, um, Pat, I, I do want to ask you about uh, Nenda Tarke. I hope I got his name right. I never get names right. Uh, but he's obviously waiting for a waiver. Do we have any update on his status this season? We don't, and but we certainly don't have any bad news. Um, you know, uh, 
we're, ju- we're, ju- we're just waiting. He's practicing. He's talented uh, and certainly will help us. Um, I do believe, Rob, that we will get the um, the appropriate news that we are anticipating. I also believe if we don't, then we'll be back on with you guys. It'll be a very interesting story for you guys to talk about. So, so you guys are picked tied for fifth in the preseason, Pat. Um, again, it makes sense with everything that you lost last year. You're losing four starters. You know, I think there, there's some, certainly some question marks. What what gives you optimism that you can fight for one of the top spots in the league this year? Yeah, it's uh, they work really hard, um, and they're in- incredibly connected. Um, I, I think our leadership with Thompson and Hicks will be the best we've ever had. And I think this has a chance to be the best defensive group we've ever had. Um, and we've certainly had some some good ones. As good as we were last year, um, we were a little more offensive oriented. I, I couldn't get our group, I don't think, to consistently commit on the defensive end of the floor like some of our other teams. I don't anticipate that being an issue with this group. You also told us in the Almanac, Pat, that this could be the, quote, best rebounding team that we've ever had. You're known for having teams that get on the glass. Um, what What is that? One, why is that change heading into this season? And two, what does that do for you heading into the year? Well, first, I think it, when I first said that we were shooting the ball really bad, so if you miss a lot of shots, you better go rebound it. We've started to shoot the ball pretty good. The uh, No, this, this, the other piece of that is we're actually like an inch and a quarter taller than we were a year ago, so we're bigger, longer, stronger than we've been. And um, a couple of the transfer guys we, we brought in, that was kind of a, not just Tark, who was a great rebounder, but Messiah Jones and Tamiwa Suleiman are – grown men um, physically that both both attack the glass and and obviously having Thompson back that you know that 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 needs to be a strength of this group hey Pat when you took over in 2011 uh need I remind you you won one game that season um give me your your I don't know favorite memory because there probably aren't a lot of positive memories from that year but give me a great story from from that season of again where that program was and how you dealt with a one win season in your first season as a head coach. Well, you know, one sports is humbling, right? I'm on a staff the year before that wins 30 games and there's a one seat at Pitt. Then you lose 31 and then you go win 18. So I, one thing I've learned is, is just try to, it, it is a daily process. Can we get better that day? But I, I give you a, I give you a, a crazy story. They, I think they wrote about this years ago. We're, we're playing UNC Wilmington, right? And we're, we are at the time 0-21. And, you know, you talk to the team like an hour before the game or something. And, and I had my phone on me. My wife is – I got like six missed calls from my wife. I call her. She says an owl just crashed through the window in the house. We had this three-season port. So I'm like, what do you want me to do? I got a game. Like, call the police. I said, kill it. Do whatever you have to – you know, like, what do you want me to do? So – Kill the I owl. talk to the team. Yeah, I, I talk to the team. I come back out of that. I call her. She's like, hey, the, the fire the fire people came over. It was actually a hawk that crashed through the window. Wow. I said, it's an epiphany. I went in the locker room. I just told the guys, we're playing the Seahawks. We're 0-21. We're playing the Seahawks. We just slayed a hawk at the scary household, and we're going to slay – the Hawks tonight. And there it was, Jeff. Attendance of 714 people. I still remember it. And we and we and we got the first win. And I wouldn't wish that year upon anybody. Anybody. <laughs> History. History. I'm just glad that you, that didn't turn into you sacrificing animals before every single game to try to be able to get yourself <laughs> on a winning streak. You ever talk to anyone that lost 21 straight, Rob? There's a lot of things you think about <laughs> that you can't you can't talk about on the field at 68. Let me tell you. <laughs> Well, listen, Pat, we always appreciate the time, man. It's always good to see you. It's always good to connect. I need you to go out and win some games so we can get you back on the field of 68 later this year. I, I look forward to seeing you later on on the field of 68. <laughs> this is the, the first and, and last time Pat Scary will ever hit leadoff, by the way. <laughs> it's all downhill for the rest of these coaches. You got It would be like talking to cardboard boxes for you guys the rest of the day. Good luck. Thanks, Pat. Thanks, Pat.
Best of luck this season. Pat Scary. Uh, he's nothing if uh if, if not entertaining here. <laughs> Jeff, coming up oh, next, we best. have uh we have Geno Ford, Stony Brook, head coach. Uh, they were picked seventh in the Almanac preseason poll. They were picked ninth by the CAA. Uh, I guess was that media coaches, whoever made those decisions. Um, but it is a confirmed fact that uh field of 68 in the Almanac is bullish. On the Stony Brook, uh, Stony Brook Sea Wolves, um, they're coming off a, a tough year last year. Where uh, Gino, correct me if I'm wrong here, you did not play five on five in practice last season until January 21st. Lost a ton of guys, and I've been looking forward to this year. And it's awesome that you guys are doing the preview, and then you. I have to follow the Skip Prosser Man of the Year. I mean, what a pressure that is, <laughs> trying to follow Scary. I mean, God Almighty, I feel like I'm still under the gun out here. Uh, but, um, you know, he, he, it just anytime I see Pat, I think Man of the Year, uh, just like we all do. Interesting fact, he got the award. Uh, his wife did not vote for him. Uh, but he did win. So that's, you know, a little under the under un, un, understated fact, I guess. Duster, I, I, I've said this. This guy, as good as scary is entertaining wise, Gino might actually be a step above scary. Uh, now, I, I am told, I, I've got a source that said that uh, Gino is a terrible, terrible golfer. The last time he went out uh, and played against Kent State head coach Rob Senderoff, <laughs> I don't know what the final scorecard was, but it was it was not pretty. Uh, I think Gino Gino probably lost a few bucks to Sunday, is my guess. Uh, it, tough to admit that first time in his life, and I would like to say it was because he played well. It wasn't. Uh, I was just <laughs> extraordinarily poor. Uh, but that was a tough one. That was a tough ego uh, uh, shot. I, he has never beaten me in his life. Uh, that's that's changed. Uh, he he certainly enjoyed it, and apparently he's got the word out on the street uh, about his uh, his golf victory. So good for him. Uh, but we'll get the world will be back in order in this uh, in next spring and summer. I'll have to get him back in his proper place. But for right now, he's feeling awfully good. He should be. He should be. Tell uh, Gino. Hey, tell I, me I a little bit you. about the last year's preseason. Gino, Go ahead, Jeff. And just how difficult it was for you. With all the injuries, you went in, obviously, new league. You knew it was going to be a step up. And then you get absolutely torn apart by injuries in the preseason. Um, what was that like? And and pull it forward now to this preseason. And are you guys healthy? Yeah. Um, you know, last year was, was totally difficult for the reasons. You know, we have 20 – I don't know. I've done this 25 years. We lost a kid to an Achilles – I've never had an Achilles injury. Uh, we lost a guy to a blown knee. I've had three of those. We had a turf toe, missed a whole year, never had a turf toe. Uh, and we had another guy who had a back injury that was actually an autoimmune issue. And I've never had autoimmune issues. So the injuries were freakish. And unfortunately for us, it was all of our top guards. Um, and, it, you know, it's always hard to play shorthanded. But when you're missing a lot of guards, it gets a lot more difficult. So... We had a tough year. I mean, there's no question. I thought that Tyler and and, and Frankie and, and and certainly Keenan Fitzmorris uh, kept us in games, uh, but we had a hard time finishing. And uh, this year, right now, we're in good shape. I mean, those guys are back. Dean Knoll, who had torn his knee that was all league in the Ivy League two years ago, is back and healthy. Aaron Clark missed last year. He's back. He's healthy. Um, Sabri Phillip is back from the Achilles and Jared Fry with the turf toe. So that we throw four guys in, uh, and we're old, we're old, which is the good news. Um, you know, Dean's a 60 year senior, AC's a 60 year senior, Tyler Stevenson Moore, uh, who was on the all league team preseason. He's a 50 year senior. Uh, Fitzmorris is a 60 year senior. Chris Mido is a 50 year senior. Uh, so of our top, you know, seven, eight guys, we got a lot of guys that, that, that have done it for a long time. We just got to put it together, but I, I really like our group. Yeah, so you mentioned Tyler Stevenson Moore, who was a uh, preseason all a uh, all CAA second team. This is what you said about him in the Almanac, you know, I can't think of a guy that I've coached in 25 years that has led at the level that Tyler leads. What does that entail? Well, it, Tyler is, is literally what, Every coach wants to have all the time. He's a super good human being. I mean, he goes to class, he gets a three, five. 
Uh, everybody on campus likes him. He's a smiley guy. And then you go to practice, and he hates getting scored on, and he wants to he wants to win every drill and every practice in every practice. So, you know, it's hard to come across those guys. Uh, a lot of times, the guys that have those intangibles. Uh, they don't have tangibles. Uh, you know, they they don't score, they don't rebound, but they're great rah-rah guys. And uh, Tyler, actually, he produces on the stat sheet, and he does all the right stuff off the floor. Uh, and, and he's well-liked in the locker room, so his voice, uh, you know, his words carry meaning. And so I, I've just it's, – it's been a real privilege to have gone through his college experience with him and, and to see where he was as a freshman, which he would tell you – he was skinny and weak and couldn't dribble uh, to an all-league player who plays both ends of the floor. I mean, it's, it's been as big of improvement as anybody I've been around. Uh, and when we lose, he, he's accountable. Uh, he, 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 he holds himself to high standards. So, you know, I, 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 could, I could fill your whole segment uh, either making fun of Pat Scary or telling you how much I love Tyler. I mean, we could do either one. Hey, so uh, I can't wait to hear. What are your conversations like with Keenan um, Fitzmorris? Because this is a kid who transferred from Stanford. So I want to know, like, what does a conversation like that go like be- between you and 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 Keenan? Who, by the way, I did a story on a few years ago. No social media whatsoever. I don't know if that's changed. Uh, it, very little social media. He fired one up after the article, I think, just to experience it. I, I would imagine he hasn't been on it at all. Um, conversations with Keenan, they're, they're very down the center of the road because you take a guy who had a 3.7 at Stanford and graduated on time, who's extremely bright, and then you take me and my 17 ACT. And then in between all of that is <laughs> – is where we are uh, because I, I, I don't understand 98% of what the heck he's talking about. Um, he, he last year in a press conference uh, had had a, a couple big plays, had a career high in points and, and rebounds and had a big block. And they asked him a question after the game about the, the block shot and then scoring on the other end, which, which sealed the game. And in his answer, he used the terms meditation, flow state, I mean, I've heard of meditation, flow state. I don't know what the hell that is, and I, I don't. I've never been in it. Uh, but uh, but he's he's done a great job. I mean, he's a really interesting guy. I mean, he's he's into a lot of things. Yeah. He he's he's very thoughtful and very. Uh, uh, his mind is constantly churning. Uh, so he he's great to have around. Uh, I do a lot of listening, not a lot of talking, because a lot of what he's talking Smart. about is at a level where intellectually I don't get to. <laughs> Well, I'll, I'll tell you this. I wish uh, it would make my life a lot easier if I could just put Jeff Goodman in a flow state for uh, 90% of the time <laughs> I have to deal with him. Gino, I want to ask you about the guys coming back from injuries because I think a lot of – like that's not always the easiest thing to do, but you also have older guys who probably understand a little bit more the importance of doing things to take care of their body, how they have to rehab to get back to that point. So what are you expecting out of those guys? I mean, look, you had a hyped up transfer class coming in last season and you lost them all. Now you get them back. It, well, I think the hardest thing for them is just going to be timing early in the season. Uh, they've done a great job physically. They're all back. Uh, vertical jump tests, all those kind of numbers are right where they were. Um, it's amazing the technology with those GPS trackers where they're tracking, you know, they're wearing those chips every day and you, you can see their speed and distance travel and all this kind of stuff. Well, those numbers all check. We check every box there. I do think it's going to take us, you know, whether that be two weeks or, 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 or a month to figure out how to play together because we haven't done that. Uh, we're piling a lot of guys who have had very good seasons the year prior but a couple that haven't played in a year. And, and to your point, uh, usually that gel doesn't just happen overnight. I, I think we'll be a drastically better team in February than we'll be in November. Uh, but but we're, we're talented, man. Like, I, I'll be honest with you. The team we have would beat the team we had two years ago when we were picked to win the America wow. East. We're not in the wow. America East. So we got to find a way to compete with Charleston and – you know, the, the job they've done down there is is just incredible. I mean, I, and I know, like, having now been in four different, you know, 
what people would call them mid-major leagues. And I was in the Mid-American Conference and for a long time. And I was in the Missouri Valley when Wichita State was ranked number one in the country. And I'm going to tell you that last year, it would have been absolutely criminal if Charleston didn't get in. And I don't know that they would have. We're right, you know, on the, on the cusp. And I haven't stood on the sideline and watched a team play as hard as that since I saw Wichita State when they were number one in the country and had that thing rolling. So we have to rise to that level to be relevant. Um, you know, like you can't just, you know, kind of muddle your way through and, 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 and feel like you're doing something. So for us, I mean, that's the goal. That's where we got to get to. And we played them twice last year. And in the first game, um, if it was a boxing match, it would have been stopped. Uh, they, they would, I actually asked the, uh, scorekeeper if he'd pull the fire alarm, if I promised to bail him out and pay the fine. Uh, you but we, we you should have pulled the Roberto, minutes. you should have pulled the Roberto Duran and just thrown a towel in and said, no moss, you know, <laughs> listen, that's where, that's what it looked like. Cause they beat us by 40 and it's only because, uh, they decided to suck. Uh, so, um, you know, I, I just, this league is elite, man. And, and what Wilmington, uh, and Drexel has a special team, and, and, and you got to point to the fact that they were able to get everybody back, nobody in the portal, um, which is unheard of. Uh, and, and so, you know, for us, man, it's, it's, we, we got we to gotta hit the ground running, and it'll be hard because the teams we got to beat are, are excellent, and the coaches are excellent. And so I'm excited that we're better than where we were two years ago. Uh, but, you know, the schedule, we're not going to the same venues. We're not playing, you know, go to Wilmington, play in front of six, 7,000 people people and uh they not only have talent they run good stuff you know it's just it, it, it's a tough tough league man tough league and everybody says it but uh but i'll tell you you you, you watch the non-league results and our league's gonna gonna do what they always do which is pull some big upsets and we just gotta find a way to get a second team in if if that's what needs to happen well, you mentioned well, listen, UNC th- Wilmington. Thanks, we are going to be joined next by Takayo Siddle, um, UNC Wilmington head coach, coming up here next. Gino, always a pleasure, man. Send me one of those GPS trackers so I can put it on Goodman next time we go to uh, the Final <laughs> Four. We need uh, we need to be able to keep track yeah. of them. Gino Ford, Stony Brook head coach, always a pleasure. Yeah, Gino. Um, coming See up you, next, Takayo Siddle, UNC Wilmington. Um, they were picked second in the CAA preseason poll. Uh, to Kyle, Coach, what's there going on, man? How you doing? Good to see you. What's going on, guys? It's to KO. You're not – hey, you're not – I know. Okay. I'm sorry. That up, it's to KO. Thank you, know, you guys he, for having me. He would know this. Guys. Hey, to KO, he would know this if he followed – those old school Hargrave Academy teams, all right, where where mm-hmm. where you were, you know, you're backing up some pretty good players back in the day. I'm going to actually start you with with a scouting report of you as a player from Kevin Keats. All right, this is the scout that. of you as a player. Ready? <laughs> I already know what you're going to say. Small shooting guard in a point guard body. Shoot first <laughs> guard. Good three point shooter. Plays hard on both ends. Average defender. Average defender. Not great with ball screens. Student of the game. He says, side note, he hated to be trapped. What, what do you think of that? <laughs> Come on, Keats. Be a little bit kinder That's- on his defense. Hey, you know, for a guy that you helped win so many championships, you'd think he'd talk good about you. Um, <laughs> but, no, he that's, pre- that's pretty accurate, man. He um, – you know, I was just an okay player. Uh, got right out of it and and uh, got into coaching. So, uh, yeah, I would say that's pretty accurate. So you, you right, guys coach, are picked. You've been to uh, two straight ahead, CAA title games. You've been to two straight CAA title games. You were picked second in the league this preseason. What do you have to do to be able to get over the hump, to be able to get that tournament berth? You know, obviously you need a little bit of luck, but, um, you know, having everybody back uh, from that team, just about everybody that we wanted to have back, um, we have them back and we've added some some key pieces to our to our group. Um, you know, you just hope to, to get better um, each and every day and I hope you get lucky enough to get back to that, that point again. And I think, you know, having everybody back, they understand what it's going to take to get over that hump and, you um, you know, with, with key pieces that we added, like like KJ Jenkins, I think he could really elevate us and help us uh, get over that hump. But you know, you, you have to have a little bit of luck. 
Trezarian White uh, really kind of burst onto the scene a little bit last year, started his career in, in the junior college ranks, averaged about 14 points, rebounds well for his position. Uh, what have you challenged him to, to be able to take that next jump, maybe be a little bit more efficient, uh, scoring the ball? What What is it that you've kind of talked to him about in the offseason? Well, I, I know you talked to him um, yesterday, but he, he's an unbelievable kid, unbelievable kid. I'll start off with that. And, you know, the challenge for him was to, um, you know, improve his habits daily, you know, getting in the gym more and, and working on the things that he needed to work on. Uh, to, to elevate his game. And, and what we talked about with him was his ball handling, you know, being able to make plays off the dribble in pick and roll situations, being able to, you know, keep the defense honest uh, by making threes. And so he spent a lot of time on that this summer and he's improved tremendously. Uh, he'll be one of our playmakers. Um, you know, his game is, is take, you know, went to another level. So I expect big things out of him. Takeo, in an era where the transfer portal is is dominating the conversation and where we see uh, programs at the CAA level lose guys to 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 higher higher leagues, bigger leagues, bigger programs, you guys are bringing back 72% of your scoring. You're bringing back a lot of really good pieces that probably had opportunities um, to go elsewhere. How are you able to keep this group together? Well, I like to I like to think we have a pretty good culture. And, um, you know, we try to try to treat them like family and uh, we know we're completely honest with them and, you know, every step of the way. So I'd like to think that those things factored into it. Um, you know, I think that when you look at it, this group, we were close. A lot of those guys, um, you know, have been to two CA championship uh, games and fell short. Uh, so they wanted to come back and and give another shot at it. Um, I think we have a really good team. I think we'll have a chance. And I think they feel the same way too. And they're working with that type of mentality. I want to ask you a question, a little bit off topic, but tournament expansion. You know, it's a hot button topic right now. Obviously, if they did expand, it would certainly help uh, the CAA have a chance to get maybe a second team in. Uh, where do you stand with this? As, as a former player, you know, I've been pretty adamant. I like it kind of the way it is because, again, I think it's a pretty good number and, and the tournament certainly has been uh, pretty successful over the years. But where do you stand with it? You know, I I, I always like to see us get two bids. Um, yep. For me, I'm a realist. I don't I don't know if I'll ever if we'll ever see that um, here in the near future. Uh, but. I'm not opposed to it, but I'm kind of like you, Jeff. I, I like the way it is right now. You know, it's been like that for some time, and I think that's what makes it special. That's what makes it special. So, but you know, we talk about two bids in this in this um, CA a lot, but I just don't see it happening. Um, you know, last year if we if we would have beat Charleston in a championship game, I don't know if they would have gotten in. Um, yeah, you know, it's, it's just yeah. how it is, and I, I just uh, I like it the way it is. You know, if you could ask me if, if we were, you know, kind of on a bubble and, and lost in the championship game like Charleston could have, you know, I'd probably be up here saying, you know, I wish we, we could get to be uh, have a two bid <laughs> league. But, uh, you know, I just don't see it happening. All right. Last one I got for you, Takeo. KJ Jenkins, New Mexico transfer. You mentioned him earlier in the Almanac. You said he will, quote, be a pleasant surprise to everybody. What have you seen from him this fall? Man, um, he's a special, special score, elite shooter, uh, one of the best, if not the best I've ever coached, um, a guy that's going to gonna really fill it up. And he's competitive. He's competitive. You talk about, um, you know, a single player being able to, to really change the dynamics of your group. Um, he's that. You know, he's been um, very coachable. Big time kid, strong in his faith, um, you know, everyday guy, uh, but he is an elite, elite shooter. Um, so, you know, that's something that we needed to add to our team, and uh, he certainly is going to provide that for us. Coach, it's always a pleasure to catch up with you. Pick second in the league. You've been runner up the last two seasons. Here's to hoping that you find a way to get over the hump. Appreciate you joining us, as always, to KO Siddle, UNC Wilmington. Thank you, guys. Thanks, you guys have a good day.
Thanks. You too. Take care, you man. Too. Coming up next, Jeff Hampton head coach, Buck Joyner. Um, coming off their first season in the CAA, they made the jump uh, last season to join the conference. Um, I don't think it necessarily went as well as he probably would have hoped. Uh, we're going to ask him about that coming up here. But um, changing leagues is interesting. You know, realignment is not something that just affects the, uh, the the highest level of the sport. We see a lot of leagues. Um, there were four additions to the conference last season, and they will be bringing in Campbell this season. Coach Joyner, Rob Doster, I know you know Jeff Goodman. Yeah. Last year was your first year in the CAA. How How was that adjustment for you? Uh, I can probably say a rude awakening at best. Uh, you know, it, it, was a, it was a different kind of jump. Uh, we kind of anticipated that. But uh, because of how late we actually decided to join the league, I don't think we got a, a recruiting class that we that we wanted to be able to bring into the league. So, again, it was a tough jump. But, it, but again, we made it. Uh, we feel like we're making strides to get better now. So, you know, hopefully we'll be able to compete a little bit better this year. Hey, hey Rob, I bet you didn't know. Uh, Buck and I have some history. And, and – and Rob rips on me, Buck, for my uh, dancing ability. Okay, Rob uh, rips on me because I'm not a, you know, I was at a wedding with him, Jeff so. Corzella's wedding. I didn't dance very well. But Buck can attest to the fact that I got a few dance moves when I was with him and his team back in, was it 2015 NCAA tournament? So. Yeah, right? we played Kentucky. Yeah, I think it was 2015 yeah, or something. I, I, I got in there before, started dancing with the team a little bit. It it, it wasn't all ugly, right, Buck? No, nah, you, you didn't embarrass yourself. I thought you did a good job. You know, the guys got part of it. You know, you, you look like you had a little rhythm to you. You know, it was there. That's right. <laughs> I had a blast. I did. It was one it was one of my favorite things that I've honestly ever done uh since I've been in this business, spending uh that time with you guys and getting a chance to know you a little bit better. And um mm -hmm. how do you how do you adjust to, to the league? Again, this is year two. What do you do this past off season that helps better prepare you to be more competitive this season in the CAA? Well, I think I think the first thing we had to do was evaluate the season, I evaluate myself, you know, evaluate the team, evaluate, you know, everything that we thought we need to change. And we thought the biggest thing was uh, depth and toughness. Uh, jumping into that league from the Big South uh, and then before that, the MEAC, uh, it, it was totally a different style to play. And when I say that, it was from, from the officiating on down. And I'm not saying that in a bad way. It was a much tougher league. You know, and we, and we had to uh, uh, first adjust to that piece of it. We didn't feel like we, we, were, we were deep enough to be able to compete night in, night out, you know, for 40 minutes. And, of course, you all go through injuries. You go through all types of things during the season, you know, not to make any excuses. We didn't feel like we had the bodies. Uh, so the first thing we did was to make sure that we that we got the bodies. Now, of course, you got to have talent. That goes hand in hand. If you don't have that, I don't care what you got. Uh, so we thought we addressed the talent that we needed, but made sure we had the bodies so that we could compete for 40 minutes night in, night out. Well, Coach, I, I will say this. I do believe you're going to find a way to get talent into that program because if you can say with a straight face that Jeff Goodman has a rhythm, then I know that you are going to be a hell of a recruiter. Um, I want to ask you about Jordan Nesbitt. We, I, I want you to tell me just how good he is second, but first I want you to uh, – there was a viral video that went out last year where on a fast break, Jordan on a one-on-one a -on -no break, Goodman, I don't know if you saw this, he threw it off the backboard to himself for a dunk. When you when you're no, watching this happen, what what goes through your mind when you see your player come down, throw the ball off the backboard to himself, and then dunk it? Is it you better finish that thing? Uh, you want? I, I ain't gonna tell you what my exact words to myself were, but that that was the, <laughs> that was the thought. You know, if you don't finish this, we're gonna have a problem. You know, but again, Jordan is one of those guys where the sky's the limit. Uh, with him coming from, I think Memphis first, and then St. Louis, and then to us. Uh, his role changed. I think that was the biggest thing he had to adjust to last year. You go from being a 1C, 1D type guy to where you're 1A. And I don't think people realize how hard that is. And uh, and when, when what's being asked of you is totally different to one of the guys to be a part of winning, to want to the reason that a team has a chance to win. And that's, that's, that's big for, for a young man or anybody to have to adjust to. It's almost like in the coaching game when you take that one seat over. To where you can make a suggestion and you're never wrong because don't nobody know the suggestion. So somebody else going to get blamed for it. 
you know, he went to being that guy that, that was in the spotlight. And I think that's where he's going to take his biggest growth uh, this year. He's learned, you know, what it takes to put the team on his back and, and how to handle those situations. And hopefully we'll grow as a team because of that. Hey, Buck, what's it been like adjusting to the fact that now, again, you talk about Nesbitt, you bring in Tristan Maxwell and Ford Cooper, two other transfers. You know, you're an old school guy. I mean, you've been in this a long time. What's it been like to adjust to this new kind of transfer environment where you have to revamp a team every year and you have to go heavy in the portal or else? You know, it, it, it's, it's different. You know, because and, and I'm going to be honest, just at our level, we're not playing with the, the fiscal things that a lot of other people and a lot of uh, may be able to play with. So we have to have a different sale, you know, and, and to being able to convince, you know, the guys like a Tristan Maxwell, a Tedrick Wilcox, a Ford Cooper, to be able to sell those guys on my dream and the university's dream of what we're being able to do. That's an adjustment, you know, altogether. Uh, I think it's changed the recruiting game, you know, but. More so, I'll speak for myself. The biggest recruiting tool I have to do is recruit the guys I got here every day to make sure make them feel as if they want to stay and be a part of what we're trying to do. Uh, because there are some things out there that we just can't compete against, you know, at, at this point, you know, in, in, uh, in our program. But uh, to be able to convince them that they could be able to be something bigger than themselves and also be a big fish in this little pond you know, is, 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 is the biggest thing that I, you know, I found that I've had to adjust to. And, you know, I, I think another part of that is, is we're on our third league in five years. Uh, that's not easy. You know, I feel like, in the, I, I felt like for five years, I played 32 non-conference games because every time that, 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 that we sit somewhere and we think we're able to adjust, we're doing something different. And that's not to make any type of excuse. That's been my reality. But hopefully we've been able to do some things now that we can we can sell ourselves and, and, and be a lot better than we were last year. I, I want to ask you about some of the pieces that you got coming in, because uh, in, in the Almanac, one of the points you made is that we need a little bit more talent around Jordan Nesbitt so he doesn't have to do so much stuff one-on-one, -on -one, make life easier for him. You brought in three guys from the high major ranks, and you bring in a guy from uh, – from Campbell and, and Joshua Lusan, I hope I got his name correct. Um, mm -hmm. uh, have do you feel like you've been able to get the pieces that you need to be able to take some of the pressure off of Jordan offensively? Uh, you know, we feel like we have. Uh, I'm gonna start with uh, Tristan Maxwell uh, coming from Georgia Tech. I, I'm I'm gonna be honest with you, and then I did watch him in high school uh, a lot, but. I felt he was more of a scorer and then by pedigree because of his dad, because of his, you know what? I did not realize that he was the guard that he was as a complete ball player. Uh, he's came in and kind of almost from a point guard perspective, taking over leadership of, of his team and brought the IQ of our team up tremendously. Uh, uh, get to guys like Tedrick Wilcox. We, we thought that we needed to address shooting. We had Marquise Garvin last year that we thought did a great job, but we thought we needed more shooting around Jordan. And not only can Tristan add to our IQ, but he can shoot the basketball. Tedrick, we feel like, is an elite level, you know, shooter. You know, he, he can he can fill it up, and we feel like he can fill it up from deep and being six six and a half at a two-guard slash two-guard slash small forward if they have those positions anymore. You know, um, you know, he does a great job. He, he's going to do a great job for us there, we feel. Uh, Josh Lusain, just his experience and IQ alone has been something different. For us to be able to get a guy coming from uh, Campbell and playing a lot at the university from averaging eight and five there, you know, uh, we feel like his role here can be a, a, can be expanded a little bit more. And he's another one of those guys that when we were in the Big South felt like played well against us and, and in the Big South. But once we got him here, he could do a lot more things than we knew because of the system and the style and the way that I like to play. Uh, but th just those three alone. Uh, well, uh, and one more big kid that, that we big young man that we picked up, uh, Javon Benson, you know, from South Carolina, elite level athlete. Uh, we are just going to offer him a different opportunity and a different, uh, uh, way to show his showcase his skills, uh, to be a little bit more or be more of a part of our lineup. You know, guys like that, we felt like, you know, are going to bring up not only the IQ and the experience from what they saw day to day, but hopefully be able to c compete at, at the CAA level and even some higher if, 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 may, if possible. 
Well, Buck, listen, well, it's Buck, always a pleasure to hear from you. Here, here is my guarantee. Here is my, here is my promise. Here. If you mm-hmm. make the NCAA tournament this season, we are sending Goodman down. He's going to be with your program every day. He's going to be dancing with your program every day, and we're going to put it on our platforms. We're going to broadcast that out there. I need the world to see this man's rhythm. Always a pleasure to see you, man. Best of luck this season. And thank you. And, Thanks, I, and I'm going to tell you this. Last time last time Jeff was with us, he was the good luck charm, man. USA Today, everybody was there with us. <laughs> you know, he, he bought us that first on, win. Man. Bought us Kentucky after that, but an undefeated Kentucky right. team. But he was the good luck piece for us. <laughs> Thanks, man. Always great to see. All you. right, thank you. Uh, next, next we will be joined by the preseason player of the year, Amaria Williams from Drexel. Jeff, you're going to be devastated to find out the man is a fan of the same soccer team that Jeff Porzello is. Here's Amari Williams. Now I am thrilled to welcome onto the Field of 68 CAA Media Day season preview show, Amari Williams, a two-time CAA Defensive Player of the Year, the reigning CAA first-team player, guy that averaged 13.7 points, 8.8 boards, and 2.0 blocks last season. Amari, what's going on, man? How you doing? Good to see you. I'm doing good. How you doing? I'm look, man, I'm always good. Um, I want to ask you this since you were named preseason player of the year in the CAA, it's not often that a guy gets recognized for that award when his strength is being a defender. You're a two time CAA defensive player of the year. Does it feel good to have that level of respect for what you do on that end of the floor? Um, yeah, for sure. I mean, you know, there's a lot of good guards in the league, so just you know, being a big to get this award and just. You know, like you said, sticking out for my defense, uh, it's pretty big, so I'm glad I got it. So Drexel last season finished fifth in the CAA. You're wearing a T-shirt that says 2021 CAA champions on it. What needs to happen for you guys to get back to that level? Um, I mean, the team compared to the team when we won it, I think the experience was different. Uh, last year we had a lot of freshmen, you know, a lot of transfers coming in from other schools or JUCOs. So I think that was kind of a year for us to gel together. But now that we all kind of understand our concepts and, you know, how the, how the conference is, I think we've got a good chance. So. so if anyone can't tell from your accent, you are English. How did you end up a basketball player in England? Um, I'll say I started out playing football or you like Osaka. Um, and then I just grew too tall you know, for the, for the sport. My brother was playing basketball, so I just kind of picked up after him at a young age. So that's how it came about. What's the hoop scene like over there? Um, I mean, it's, it's 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 a good scene over there. I feel like we have a lot of good players. It's just the platform we have. I feel like a lot of players kind of go missing, like hidden, just because they don't have the platform like we do out here in America. So. We have a good scene over there. It's just about the opportunity that some of them get. It's not quite like what it is in Philadelphia. I would say so. No. <laughs> All right. So you said that you uh, you grew up playing football, which we call soccer. I don't know if you guys can see that over my shoulder right now, but I am a Tottenham Hotspur fan. Uh, what club did you support when you were growing up? Um, I was a Chelsea fan growing up, even though I'm not even from London. I feel like. That was one team that always stuck out with me. You know, they had good strikers, things like that. So that was definitely my favorite team. We're going to have to end the show. We're going to have to kick you off here, Amari. I think that's it. (laughs) (laughs) Well, um, no, I'm just kidding. Uh, So what what was the biggest culture shock for you you when you came to the States, when you started playing basketball over here? Um... I'll say the rules and the physicality, I feel like, you know, a lot of players from England come over here probably on the right way or things like that for their position. So just, I would say the weight room too, not a lot of us really lift daily like we do here. So just getting used to like the college schedule and just things like that, that was definitely something worth shot to me when I first came. I know it was COVID, yeah, so that was definitely a tough year for me. So you're listed at 250 pounds and you didn't lift weights when you were back in England, is that right? I, I've put on a 30 pounds since I've been there as a freshman. So I think that kind of says how it, how it was. So. <laughs> Fair enough. You are a communications major. So does that mean, are you trying to take my job one day? Is that what's happening here? Um, I'm not really a vocal person, but 
I don't know. I'm, I'm open for whatever. So. <laughs> um, all right. Let me just ask you this then. What has been the thing that you focused on the most this offseason? Where are you trying to develop your game? Where are we going to see the biggest growth from Amari Williams this year? Um, I'll say one thing, which is not really skill wise. I'll say my body. You know, I had a lot of knocks and knee injuries last year, so just making sure that I'm able to play the course of the season. And uh, I would just say, you know, even though I had a good field goal percentage, I still want to finish better around the rim, whether it's both hands, my right hand. A lot of teams kind of shade me to my right, so just taking advantage of that and being able to finish. So. Well, listen, Amari, best of luck to you this season. I hope the best for the Drexel Dragons. I hope the worst for your Chelsea Blues. Great catching up with you, and good luck this year. Thank you. Appreciate it. That was Amari Williams from Drexel, the preseason player of the year in the CAA. And now we are going to be joined by his head coach, Zach Spiker. Uh, the Drexel Dragons were picked third in the conference. They had one first place vote in the CAA. Uh, coach Spiker, we just heard from uh, from your star center, Amari Williams. I asked him what we're going to see from him this season. And he said, basically, I I'm going to be healthy. <laughs> what, what are you hoping to get out of him this year? Yeah, I think that's a, a very good start considering how our season evolved and transpired last year. Uh, we had guys uh, a little bit of a mash unit in the last you know quarter of the season in the conference tournament. So I love that vision and start for Amari and our program. <laughs> um, did I hear a little soccer talk there too? Um, mm -hmm. He claims Chelsea, but he, he grew up in the backyard of Nottingham Forest. So I think he's a little bit – he's got two teams over there, mostly Chelsea though. Hey, hey, Zach, how did you find Amari? Obviously, growing up in, in, in England, how did you recruit him? What was that like? Who'd you beat for him? Uh, you know, I think Amari took two official visits. Uh, we had him on campus during the season, his senior year or his, his final year of eligibility in England. Um, he was on the same team as Mate Okers, who was a fifth-year grad student for us this year. Um, so going over, I, I just think like all of us as coaches, when you go to see one guy, you've kind of got your eye open to see what else is on the team, who's out there. And uh, pretty tough to not, pretty tough to uh, to miss <laughs> Amari Williams when you're over there watching Mate Okris. So uh, that was the first chance to really observe him and see him when we when we visited Mate. And, uh, and then we had him on campus the weekend we played William and Mary with, with Nathan Knight. So I think he saw how we – you know, we had success that night, but also how we played. Um, and I think he had one other visit. Um, I think we split the trip to the U.S. with Charleston and, and Coach Grant's staff at the time. And, uh, you know, we're fortunate that he that he chose us, obviously. Um, but I think it's been a great experience for him, for our program. And uh, really, we're excited for this upcoming year. So you bring back Amari Williams bring back Justin Moore, you bring back 86% of your scoring from last season in an era where everybody is looking to get into the portal and, and move up. How did you, how did you do that? And uh, what, what his personality, Rob, program Rob, it's all his forward? personality. They want to come back for him. <laughs> Jeff, we go back a long way, man. I, I still remember my first season as a head coach at army. It was like the season was over like a 6 a.m. flight out of LaGuardia the next day. Oh, yeah. And uh, yeah. I looked like I'd been run over by a truck trying to get to Florida Let's to go somewhere. And <laughs> I'm like, um, who is this guy? Who Who is yeah, yeah. this guy who, yes, you did not look good that morning. You did not. I look you look a, much I better look so now. Disheveled. Yeah, I look so disheveled. Wait. I think, Jeff, like, hey, here's a couple of dollars. Get yourself, get yourself a, a meal. <laughs> <laughs> um, yeah, but we've, we've all evolved a little bit uh, for the better, I think. Um, but, but your question about having that much experience coming back and, and why we did that, I, I would first and foremost say I think it's a credit to our coaching staff and to our players that they truly, truly enjoy being around each other. Um, it's a beautiful thing. Um, and hopefully we're a little bit of a throwback to, to the, you know, the, college basketball in its purest form of guys loving to be in the gym, guys wanting to be around each other, guys seeing 
uh, an opportunity for our program to to have success and make a little bit of noise and everyone having a little bit of a part in it. Well, you know, whether it's starter or guy, uh, we call it our grade team, but our walk-ons, um, you got to impact the program and you got to appreciate the opportunity and, and, and respect the process. And uh, I think everyone saw that vision and it's not necessarily just for this year. We've had some guys already say they want to come back next year. And we're trying to be a little bit proactive and understanding what the world is and you know there's some risk in the secondary market and and we know every roster is going to have a blend of it but for this season we're excited to have that experience and 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 a group of guys that are really a tight-knit group and it's been a joy to come to practice every day right now love that the secondary market i have not heard it been called that yet uh i like it uh all right charleston got 10 first place votes uh uncw got three you guys uh, are picked third, and you got one first place vote. All right, I, I want you to guess who who picked you guys to win the league this year among the coaches. And I I don't think you can vote for yourself, can you? You cannot. I you know. Okay. Um, you want me Take to a guess, guess who? Yes, yes. I want you to guess. You wanna, I don't you, know the answer. Yeah. You want a name? I want a name. Uh, I would guess Pat Scary, my friend down there. We've both been in the league for a while. He said, let me, let me do this and try to put a little more pressure on my friend, and then we'll just kind of lay low in the weeds there. So that would be my guess. Um, you know what? I think it's um, it's really just a sign of, of our evolution as a program. We're going into year eight, and we've gotten better and better. I think our win percentage or our win total has increased in seven straight years. And um, so right. we're building – and we're still growing um, defensively. Those numbers were not good early on, um, but we've we've gone up each of the last five years as well. So, you know, I, I think it's a good thing, um, but expectations is really external. You know, that's that's something that I think it allows us to have this platform. Um, I'm fired up that we have the relationship with you guys and, and John Fanta as well in the field of 68. I think this is this is great. Um, it's awesome. But yeah. for our basketball team, I don't know that it matters how many votes we have or where we're picked if we're really trying to be intentional every day about the things we're doing. So in, in our world, in our circle at the end of practice and the start, that's what matters to us. And um, expectations are external. It creates excitement, which we all like. But the reality is internally, it's about our intentions every day. And my biggest focus right now is this uh 415 shell drill today we got to get some people out of the paint all right and that's that's what we're talking about a little bit of ostrich season just let's put our head in the sand and focus on us and, and the rest takes care of itself all right well i got one more question about external expectations for you uh in the almanac we do a coaches poll um we anon- anonymously uh quiz all the coaches in the league about certain different things, players scares you the most, best pro sp- uh, prospect. We asked them, uh, breakout player this year in the CAA. Everybody said, Justin Moore. What have you seen from him? What are you hoping to get from him this year? Yeah, I think we all felt that way last year. And we've been excited about Justin Moore since really his junior year in high school. Um, have, having identified that that was a guy that we felt, um, you know, I think right now we've got three Philadelphia Catholic League players on our roster. Um, and that's been a big jump. Three other players um, in Philadelphia. We added Lucas Monroe as a grad transfer from Penn. Um, the most expensive official visit ever. He walked up two blocks. <laughs> um, but uh, you know, we've got we've got a little more local uh, flavor to our roster, which is exciting from a fan base standpoint. I think people will identify and connect with our group. Um, but you're right, Justin Moore um, had a big upside from day one. Uh, physically, I thought the wear and tear of the season um, really started in Italy. Um, he, he went up against some tough nose veteran guards when we we're playing overseas in Italy last summer and a little bit of baptism by fire. Um, but I do think, um, you know, as we're in my office talking right here, he's in the weight room at 7 a.m. today with the rest of our guys. He's upstairs getting shots up uh, with our coaching staff and uh, he's focused. And he's got that uh, ability to, you know, I think so many times you see people take big jumps freshman to sophomore year. 
um, we're very confident he's going to do that. Well, listen, coach, it's always a pleasure to catch up with you. (laughs) (laughs) Fair enough. Um, It's always great to catch up with you. Best of luck this season. And uh, here's to hoping that Amari Williams makes the correct decision and uh and and converts his fandom to uh to Tottenham Hotspur. We don't need any Chelsea fans here. It's not it's not good for the soul, man. It's not good for the karma. All right. So I, thanks, I can't Zach. promise you that. Can't promise you that. But thanks for what you guys do. <laughs> Looking forward to working with you guys throughout the year. Likewise. Always a pleasure, man. Um coming up next. So Drexel got one vote as the uh in the the CAA precinct poll to win the conference. The guy we got coming in now got 10 votes. They were predicted to win the league. Charleston, head coach, at Kelsey. Uh, Pat, first and foremost, where can I get a uh, pair of those glasses, man? That's that's, uh, that's, wow. that's trendy. You What's look a this? lot cooler than I do. Just um, It's an old school song, but but just go to iTunes or whatever. Jay-Z has a song uh, in, in – the way the way the words go, I think it's uh, numbers don't lie. Check the scoreboard, and then there's a little pause, and then he says, "Tom Ford." So um, that's what that's there. I got a little got some Tom Ford action going on. I don't know. I, I my mom's been telling me for um, forever that I squint too much, and I just denied it. Finally went, and I'm almost legally blind. So um, my, I figure why not? Why not cool. like, get get a little something? Mine are older something looking. looking. Yeah, I'm getting rid of these. I hate wearing them, Pat. Like I, I went to a restaurant last night, and I, I couldn't read the menu anymore. Like I couldn't read the menu. My wife had to read me the 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 stuff on the menu. So uh, anyway, you, hey, you, you you ready for me? December seventh. Do we yep. have the red carpet ready in our city? I mean, listen, I, I'm 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 going seven weeks this year. Six weeks last winter, and uh, the coolest part was not only getting a chance to spend some time with you, which we really hadn't done in a while. I mean, you and I knew each other for years. Uh, and to kind of get uh, get back with you and see that team, man, that team was as fun to watch and be around as any team I've been around in years. Because, again, they were all about the right things. How How fortunate were you to be able to coach that group? And how difficult is it going to be to kind of recreate it. I know you've got some of the same key pieces and you're bringing a bunch of new dudes to a culture that, that, that is so strong. Yeah. Well, first we're looking forward to having you back down. We say our city down here, but it's practically your city. Goody, you know more about the restaurant scene in Charleston than anybody I've ever met. And you were only down here for six, seven, eight weeks. Um, yeah. And you saw it firsthand. We had a special team last year, uh, talented enough, but I think what, what made us really strong was our culture. As, as you know, that's an overused word, I think, in coaching and in leadership and business. But the fact of the matter is every organization has a culture. It's either by design or by default. Uh, we try our best to have it by design, by how we work every day, how we operate. When you ask the question is, how do you, basically what you said was, how do you do it again? Um, I, I read something by Jay Wright, the great Jay Wright recently, and after they had won a national championship, which we didn't do, but they had an unbelievable year, and, they, and somebody asked him, how are you going to do it again? He said, our, our focus and our goal is not on winning a national championship again. It's on improving our culture, and that's the task, and that's hard to do because I thought out of all my years of coaching, you know, 13 years, I think, as a head coach, been in Division One basketball for 21 I've been a part of some special teams, but I've never been a part of a team whose culture was as strong as that one. And it is a daunting goal, not to win as many games as we did last year, but to improve our culture. And that's where our focus is. How do you how do you handle the level of expectation that you're going to have coming into the season? Charleston's always been good, right? Charleston's always been a team in the leagues that they've been in that have kind of been circled, right? Uh, But now with all of the attention you got last year, with the fact that Jeff Goodman spent six weeks talking about how great the Cougars are when he was in your city. um, I I do feel like there's a a pretty significant target on your back. 10 of the 14 first place votes in the preseason poll was Charleston. How do you handle that? 
Yeah, well, in regards to the preseason poll, that's it's surprising to me. Um, you know, I, I heard I heard the last interview, and in, 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 uh, Zach, you were asking the, the the question, "Who voted for you for the number one uh, pick?" That was me. That was us. And to be honest with you, it was a really really hard choice because you know all those teams that are are you know at the top of the league predictions uh, could very easily have been number one overall. Um, you name it, you know, Wilmington's right there. Drexel's right there. I think uh, you know, Hofstra's right there. But but the, the other thing in this new era of college basketball with the transfer portal and things like that, you, you never stink and know, man. Like uh, Pat Scary had a team a couple of years ago at Towson. And I want to say in the preseason poll, they were picked close to last. And, you know, because of the guys they brought in, the way it all worked out, I mean, they had a dominant team two years ago and ended up winning our conference. So very easily, there's some teams at the bottom that could end up winning this whole darn thing. We only have two, I'm sorry, three significant contributors from last year's team returning. So I was as surprised as anybody else that we were picked that high in the league. I think we have a good team. Um, we're gonna get better and better, I think, as the year goes on. And uh, hopefully we're playing our best at the right time of the year, which is March. But you, the, the, the original question that you asked, Rob, was like, how do we deal with those expectations? I do go back to the way I answered the first question, and it's not about trying to replicate winning 31 games again. It's about improving our culture. Um, it's very boring in the interview, but I say this all the time. Uh, we just try to have excellence in our standard on a daily basis. The next thing we do, the next drill, the next weightlift, weightlifting session, the next film session, the first rep of the next practice, we try to have – uh, excellence in, and, and I'm a big believer, being process oriented like that and letting the results take care of themselves. Hey, Pat, you had pretty good success uh, getting some West Liberty guys. So you went back to the well. Uh, Bryce Butler, the latest one. What's he going to give and, and what's CJ Fulton going to give? Two guys that you're going to rely on to come in and make an impact this year, kind of like those other West Liberty guys did for you last year. Yeah, you know, the three big returners, obviously, is Ante, uh, Rain, and Benny Burnham. Uh, those guys are heart and soul. They've been around here for so long, but you, you, you and, and, and they've been a part of winning at a very, very high level. And, and like I said, those guys are our heart and soul. But man, the transfers we brought in were very, very excited about because they fit us, they fit our culture. You mentioned Bryce Butler, who was one of the most efficient players in the country last year at the Division II level, a winning player from a winning program. Uh, West Liberty, where we've got several other players. They're tough. They compete. They win. Uh, but, the, you know, the other guys you know, fit that mold as well. Um, uh, uh, Kobe Rogers, who won a national championship with Nova Southeastern, winning player. Uh, Frankie Policelli, who was one of the most productive players in our league last year in the CAA. He was a walking double-double, uh, brings a veteran presence to our team. And then, you know, C.J. Fulton who's a very efficient point guard, led the country in assist to turnover ratio last year. Big additions to our team for sure. All right, Pat, last one I got for you, man. We're going to play a little game of would you rather. Would you rather win 30 games again this season or be guaranteed that Jeff Goodman will never set foot in Charleston again? <laughs> Goody's my guy, man. We go back decades. Jeff Battle, the great Jeff Battle, uh, dear right. friend of both That's of right. ours, who's one of the best things about college basketball, man. If you don't know who he is, Google him, look him up. He's an assistant at Georgetown, dear friend of Jeff and ours, Jeff and mine. So uh, I'll take Goody down here as much as he can. He's a great dude. He's one of us. Um, he's sometimes You're right. Some, hands, sometimes man. right. He, he, he here's how I describe him. He's sometimes right, sometimes wrong, never in doubt. Jeff Goodman. Um, Listen, but we're trying to go December, one more, man. We're not trying to. <laughs> That's the greatest evaluation December 8th, I've ever heard in my life. Hey, hey Kels, <laughs> December 8th. I don't know if you got a game or not, but, you know, it was hard, honestly, getting Kels to come out for dinner last year. Not easy. I know you had a team that, again, you knew was kind of special at that point, and you didn't want to, to to end the winning streak, but we got to get you, your wife out a little bit more. I mean, the best part, Doster, is Kels is literally texting me after I left Charleston, and he's saying I got to bring. I'm bringing my wife out for dinner one night. Where should I bring her? I'm like, you live <laughs> in this city. You live in Charleston. How do you not know this? 
I know you're you're uh, you're, you're such a renaissance man. You got your finger on the pulse of what's going on everywhere. So you're my go to guy for 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 any uh, uh, pop culture, any restaurant scene stuff. You're my go to man. Well, listen, listen Pat, it's been a pleasure catching you. up with you, man. Yeah. Yeah. yeah, it's been a pleasure catching up with you. I'm sorry that you're going to have to deal with Goodman for uh, seven weeks again this year. Best of luck this season, and I hope you live up to those expectations, man. First place, 10 votes. Thank, thank, thanks, guys. Really enjoyed being on. Our city. Our city. <laughs> there it is. Always appreciate uh, catching up with Kels. And um, coming up next, we have another one of uh, Goodman's favorites, uh, yes. a Boston guy. A Northeastern guy, Bill Cohen, in his 18th season as head coach uh, at Northeastern. Coach, I got to ask you this, man. You are in the same city as Jeff Goodman. You've been the head coach at Northeastern for 18 years, and he hasn't driven you away yet. How is that possible? Well, I know it's it's hard work. It's hard work, as you know. But uh, (laughs) I've known Jeff for a long, long time, obviously, uh, when he was first starting out. And uh, I was down over at B.C., uh, for a bit and um, grown to know him and respect him and uh, always enjoy uh, his takes on, on college basketball and other things. <laughs> what you didn't mention, hey, Bill, what you didn't mention and, and Rob doesn't know is guess who Bill lives next door to, Rob? He lives next door to my brother and sister-in-law, like literally next door in the same building. So we, we and, share and Rob, a, you- a common and bond there. And Rob, you have to know that he doesn't visit very often. Uh, he, he doesn't come <laughs> I'm, not I'm not invited. I'm not invited. Maybe problem. that says something, Jeff. I don't know. <laughs> <laughs> all, right, all right, Bill. So last season, you guys dealt with uh, with with as many injuries as anybody. It feels like that was kind of a consistent thing in the conference. What have you seen from some of these guys that are coming back this year? Yeah, I think, uh, you, you know, I think that's a big part of having success, uh, you, you know, is really, um, you, you know, staying healthy. Uh, you, you know, when you have, uh, to, to quote the great Bill Belichick, uh, your, your best ability is your availability. And uh, when, when you have your mm-hmm. best players available, it makes a, a, a huge difference. Um, you know, and I, yeah, I think, uh, you, you know, we've made a big emphasis on that and trying to get to the bottom of that, you, you know, tweaking our off-season conditioning and what we're doing, how we're doing things and how we're, you, you know, kind of built in some durability factors to our strength and conditioning program. But, you know, some of it's just luck, you know, you got to, you got, you got to stay healthy. You got to have your guys ready. And, and, and um, the, the, the more you have your, your full roster available, the better chance, your chances you have. Bill, how, how hard is it in this day and age? Again, you and I have known each other for so long, and you could, you know, when you got in, you could build these teams and, and be older and and have a chance to – because, listen, I say it to everybody, there's nobody better out there in evaluating developing players than you. Nobody, period. I'll put you up against yeah. anybody in the country at any level. Um, it's hard to do that now because, again, you can evaluate, you can start to develop them, and a lot of times you're going to lose them if they play well to the higher level. You might lose them if they don't play as well because they're not going to wait their turn and, and, and fight it out. What, what's what's it like these days? How how frustrating is it in in some ways for you? Well, it's 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 certainly changed, right? So um, you, you know, and some for the better, some for just unknown. I still think we're in the middle of us the effects of COVID. Uh, the extra years there, uh, you, you know, roster management has become much more challenging. Um, you know, but I still believe in the college model. I still believe in, you know, the freshman experience and what that is. And guys get older, and I think guys make the biggest jump between their freshman and sophomore year. Um, it, 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 you know, but certainly the transfer portal, NIL, uh, ha- has challenged every every level of, of co- uh, college basketball and, and college athletics. Um, but 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 I think you're you're right, Jeff. It, it it's very different. It's very challenging. Um, you, you know when you, you know in the past you used to if you got a great point guard you gave him the ball and you asked for it back uh, four years later. Now, you know that's that's not the case. So um, you, you, have adjust, Walker, you have to look at Tyson Walker, that. right? Yeah, Bill, look at sure. Tyson Walker, um, and, and he's thriving now at Michigan State. You know. 
Yeah, but I think you, you find that, like, you, you know, if you're a good player in this league, if you're a first-team all-conference player, um, you, you, you know, you can play anywhere. Uh, and you look at all the guards that have kind of left, uh, you know, Aaron Estradas, you, you, you know, moved up. And, uh, you know, we've had a number of guards uh, from our league gone up and have been impact players at the high major level. And, um, you know, it's, I think it's a credit to the coaching in this league and, and the level of competition and just how good the players are here. Um, they get the notoriety once once they get to uh, – to a di- to to a different platform, but you, you know there's so many great players in this league and great coaches. So, Bill, you had three guys this past season that had been career double figure scores didn't quite live up to that last year. Chris Doherty, Joe Pridgen, and Lucas Sakota. With um, with Jamil Telfort gone, how do you get that scoring boost out of three guys that have proven to be able to score at the Division One level? Yeah, I think each of those guys, uh, you know, obviously, as you mentioned, Rob, have, have that potential, right? They, they, they've, they've proven that. They've demonstrated they can do that at the Division One level. You know, the challenge is to get them back there and get them more consistent. Um, and, you, you, you know, I think the opportunity is there. I think what I've seen from them in the preseason and over the summer has been terrific. Um, the leadership, Luca's coming into our program. So it was really a kind of a, we recruited him out of high school and he visited us at a high school officially. And so we've had a longstanding relationship with him. We knew, um, you know, the type of person he was and how, how competitive he was. So, you know, when he came in, he's, he's hit the ground running. He's really done a, a nice job, um, you, you know, providing some leadership and also demonstrating that he's a really good player. Um, I, th- I think Joe had, you know, he had the sit out year and kind of got a, a little derailed by that. But, you know, that year, uh, getting back into the swing of things and getting consistent, he's had a terrific summer. I think he's going to have a really good year for us. And and Chris had just had some injuries that just uh, just messed with his rhythm last year um, and he couldn't get consistent. But I think each of those guys are going to be terrific for us this year. Hey, Rob, uh, Bill was on the best coaching staff, the best assistant coaching uh, duo I've ever seen in college basketball. It was Bill Cohen and Ed Cooley uh, when BC had it rolling here uh, back in the day. All right, Billy, give me your best Ed Cooley story that you can tell on the air right now. You know, he goes to Georgetown. Listen, I don't know about you, but like, like first of all, I'm, I'm circling that game when he goes back to Providence this year. I said, I'm coming back from Charleston. I told my wife, we have to be back in the Northeast by the time that game happens because it, it's going to be insane. But give me your best Cooley story. Well, well I mean, there's so many. You know, Ed's a huge personality, uh, a great uh, and, and a dear friend. Um, you know, we, we just had a tremendous staff starting out with, you know, Tim O'Shea, you, you know, ended up being a head coach. Uh, at Ohio and later at Bryant and Pat Duquette, you know, be- became a head coach. He's doing a great job at UMass Lowell. And Ed's just, you know, hit it out of the park. He's just, uh, he's got that dynamic personality. He's got, uh, you know, a great basketball mind. He's a great recruiter. He's a great game coach. He's a terrific motivator. Uh, so he's got the whole package. And, you, you know, we just, uh, you, you know, when I talk to Ed, most of the times we, we we just laugh, and it, it's more him making me laugh than than uh, than me making him laugh. But we, you know, we share old stories. We had a great great time. I, you know, so grateful to Al Skinner um, for all he uh, allowed us to be and gave given us that opportunity at Boston College. It was a it was a magical run, um, but it but it also you, you know created friendships for a lifetime, and I'm, you know. I don't know if there's one story with Ed that 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 stands out, but there are maybe a lot. in the higher there are a lot of them. There, <laughs> yeah, this this is a a, a, a little uh, you, you know when we we had the opening up, you know Al uh, asked me to go down, and Ed was at Stonehill at the time, and he was he was working East, Eastern Invitational back when guys could work, so I I I went down, um, you know met him and, and I, th- I think we went to what like one of the supermarkets to get a sandwich or something and just talk basketball talk life and i came back and said al he'd be he'd, he'd be awesome I and mean, just his personality blew you away so really happy for him and his family and and uh wish him all the best at georgetown well bill 
it's been a pleasure. Um, hopefully, at some point in, in the coming weeks, you'll be able to get a visit from Jeff Goodman. We'll see if that uh, that actually happens. We'll see if he actually makes his way down there. But best of luck this season. Always a pleasure catching up with you. Great to see you. Hey, thanks, guys. We really thanks, appreciate Bill. everything you're doing and for college basketball and for the for the CAA. So thanks. Have a great thanks, day. Right. Love that. That guy. was Love Bill him. Cohen. Love. Northeastern head coach. Coming up now, Jeff, we have a man who is in his 11th season at Campbell, but his first season wow. as a coach in the CAA. Kevin McGeehan will be joining us here, head coach of the Campbell Fighting Camels. Um, coach, I got to ask you this. like, Do people actually fight camels? Is this the thing that, that occurs? Like, are we, are we um, am I... You know, it just I, I've never I've never seen a fight. I'd a like camel. to see Rob fight a camel. I would like to see Rob <laughs> lose a fight to a camel. I don't know if they fight them. Uh, I do know that they're um, they're they're meaner than you think. You know that the, we've had a, we've had a few on campus. I've had a chance to uh, to ride ride a camel around campus. Um, those things will spit at you and. And they got a they got a mean side to them. So there's the, the, the moniker is not without uh, some do. All right, so we're we're coming down to Campbell, and we're going to be riding camels around campus with you. Lock that in. <laughs> Figure it out. Find a way I to like get it in our schedule, Jeff. <laughs> All right, Coach. Let me ask you this. So it's going to be your 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 first season in the CAA this year. We heard a little bit earlier from Buck Joiner uh, about the difficulty in. Um, in changing leagues and, and and moving to a different conference, how have you prepared for this? How have you handled this? Have you been just been sitting here watching film of, you know, Towson and Stony Brook and all these other teams? Like, what do, what have you done this summer to get ready for a new conference? Well, we've definitely done some of that. I mean, there's there's certainly a preparation side to it that is important, right? Like um, X's and O's and personnel and and um, you know styles, all that stuff matters. Um, but with the, with way college basketball is nowadays, right. There's so much change, uh, person personnel wise on each team, right. That's why I don't know how you guys do it with these preseason polls and stuff like that. I mean, there's so much that's, uh, different on every, in every program. Um, so, you know, the one thing that's good is that we'll have, everyone will play a full 13 game non-league schedule, likely that will allow us to have a body of work on what this year's team looks like. Um, similarly, like people don't know us, right? So there's a preparation for the league and then there's them preparing for us. And we play, you know, a bit unique. We know we play, we play different than others. Um, it's not just your, your traditional, um, you know, three out, two in cross screen, high, low, you know, there's a lot of movement and cutting. And, and I think that's something that, that has to, you know, they're going to have to prepare for us too. The good news is you go in with a really good player, a uh, young kid, Anthony uh, Delorso, who's been terrific for you last season. What, what do you want to see him? What have you talked to him about in the off season? Try to get him to even expand his game even more. Yeah, well, definitely. He's a terrific player. Um, we kind of knew that the day he stepped on campus, which was, I think, first day of classes last year so it's not like he had the benefit of the summer to kind of get up to speed but everything seemed to come so naturally to him uh, game makes sense to him the way he moves the way he sees the floor um you know the way he can score in creative ways all the stuff was was just in there you know he just had it um you know some of the things that we talked about and when we talked to some scouts after the season that were evaluating his his game and where it translates to the next level, you know, strength is obviously something that um, I think he's got good basketball strength, but, you know, just to endure the physicality of the bump and grind and um, all that he's going to see this year, which will be even more with him being a little bit further up on the scouting report um, for, for the opponents uh, that hitting the weight room hard uh, from a durability standpoint and explosiveness standpoint was important for him. Uh, I think his shooting is better than um, he showed last year and still something that he can improve. His creativity is, is uh, no question one of his strengths. Um, I think his passing is really, really good. 
and uh, something that will show up more this year as we have more shooting uh, surrounding him. Um, and then just, you know, on the ball defense, which imp improved as the year went along. Uh, and I think is a uh, he has solidified greatly uh, over the over the offseason. He put a lot of time into it. And that's just kind of a reminder uh, uh, as we go along and we're, you know, in practice and, you know, I'll, I'll remind him, hey, man, this is an important part of your game, too. Um, you know, in, because I think he puts there's so much on him to do a lot for us on the offensive side of the ball that, you know, it's just reminding him like, hey, this is the next level. This is going to be really important for you, too. You guys lost 63% of your scoring from last season, this offseason. Ricky Clemens, Jay Powell, a lot of key pieces. How do you how do you go about rebuilding that in the offseason? Um, well, we have some player, we had some players in-house that didn't get as much opportunity last year that I think have taken large jumps. That's that's a, a big first part of it. And then I think we've done a decent job with the guys we've added to the program. Um, that I think are really going to help us. Um, again, a lot of what we do when we're evaluating, whether it be freshmen or in the transfer portal, is about fit, like finding guys that match what we're looking for. So that's guys that see the game well, guys that pass, um, that have a great understanding of space, um, that have skill, have a skill set that matches with uh, being able to dribble, pass, and shoot at all positions. Um, and so – just using Jay Powell as an example last from last year, he was two points a game at Jacksonville State. By the end of the season, I think it would be hard to argue that he wasn't the, one of the best players in the Big South and a guy that, you know, obviously he's now at San Diego State. So, um, you know, he really developed. Sometimes, though, it's just putting the guys in positions where they can be successful and opening their eyes to uh, expanding their game and giving them opportunities, giving them confidence, uh, you know, trying to make them feel like they, they can impact the team, be important, uh, and then give them a template for how that can work. And that, that, that showed itself out very well with him. I think we similarly um, replaced some of the guys that we left with guys that are going to fit really well. It's not about, for us, it's not about, you know, five stars or guys from Power Five necessarily as much as it is guys that fit what we do. Kevin, everybody always talks about now the transfer portal. All right, you got to have great relationships with, with these kids. That's the most important thing on the team. Now you've thrown NIL into the mix. And I know you guys, you know, are dealing with NIL a ton, like the high majors are. But how, how has your approach maybe changed over the last year or two with NIL coming into to the equation at least? Because you know if, if your top player um, – somebody else comes after him for a lot more money. Relationships matter, but they may not be enough. Right. Well, I think part of it's just having a really good program and culture in your within your team. You know, like having guys that want to be around each other. We have a really strong international component to our roster. I think we have seven international players, which um, – you know, I don't know where that stacks up relative to the league. I know there's a fair amount, but I, I would imagine that's one of the highest. Um, and, you know, I think that that's a good thing. We, we've, we've done well with those guys. But just guys in general that want to be here, we talk about guys that love basketball, want to be uh, great in the classroom, you know, guys that are self-sufficient so that we can spend our time not chasing guys to class or worrying about their grades. But um, – you know, spending our time working in the gym, getting extra shots, uh, learning how to be a great team. I think we've we we have a lot of guys like that. Um, that's what we're made up of. Uh, I think if you walked into a practice tomorrow or you know our scrimmage tonight, you would you would be it would be noticeable to you. Um, and when you have that, then guys want to be around each other. So that gives you a really good chance to hold on to you know, some guys that maybe would have other options um, because and then you can go back and look at the examples of guys who um, have taken great leaps in our program that have joined us or have developed. I mean, um, Ricky Clemens was a walk on. He was the one of the best players in the Big South last year. 
Um, you know, obviously Chris Clemens was terrific from the beginning. Andrew Udy, who we had years ago, was a really, really good guy that developed. Jay Powell's a very good example of a guy who came in and was put in a different environment and different situation and had great success. And then if you start to look at how those things play themselves out, and I don't have a crystal ball at this point, but I can tell you that Cedric Lindsay, though on a, I mean, <laughs> Cedric Lindsay, Cedric Henderson, though on a great team, um, and a guy who was a major contributor, you know, he went from 16 a game and would have been probably first team all big South to, you know, probably the 30th, maybe 30th best player in the, in the PAC 12, you know? And so right. there, there's different opportunities, but getting a chance to be on the court and be important and be a vital part of the success is a reality and it's something that has to be considered when we're when we're weighing all these things out and you know we can only present all the information and and you know we'll do our best with what we can we can do with nil and all that kind of stuff but um you know there's a there's a component of this that's leaving your legacy right what can i leave a legacy at campbell versus um you know being a part of a, of a greater whole which is obviously also a gr really cool experience but you know, there's something about being one of the greatest all time. Ricky Clemens will go down as one of the greatest all time. Corey Gensler, um, you know, Andrew Udy, Chris Clemens, those guys have done incredible things here and will be always considered as, um, you know, kind of ambassadors of our program. Well, Kevin, it's uh, it's been a pleasure to catch up. Um, if you need someone to use as a shield, if a camel ever gets a little too aggressive on campus, just let me know. I'll send Goodman your way. Uh, he's great at taking punches from camels. That is uh, something that we found out um, this offseason. Always a pleasure. Best of luck this season as Thanks, you navigate Kevin. a new conference in the CAA. Thanks, guys. Thanks for all you do for us. Thanks, Kevin. All right. Coming up next, we're going to be hearing from the CAA preseason all conference first team members we haven't talked to yet we got ante brozovich we got jazarian Wright, we have tyler thomas and we have charles thompson whose father has maybe the best nickname i've ever heard in my entire life that's coming up right now all right now pleased to welcome in two of the best players in the caa two first teamers uh uncw's trezerian white charleston's ante brozovic and uh, let's start with you, Ante, since uh, I'm coming back to our city, by the way, uh, for another long stint this year to get out of the cold weather. And I can't wait to see you guys play again. Uh, but it's a different team. You lose Dalton. You lose Ryan Larson, Pat Robinson, Jalen Scott. Uh, you were second on the team in scoring last year. How do you see your role changing with the turnover? Yeah, uh Coach Kelsey said every every season is a season for itself. And uh, obviously the team that we had last year was pretty good. We lost a bunch of really, really good guys. But, uh, you know, we all have to adapt and, and make, you know, roles for ourselves of whatever coach needs us to do. So my role is going to change, I'm pretty sure. And uh, everybody else is on the team. So, But um, I'm really excited. We got some great new guys coming in uh, who fit our system very well is what I'm thinking. And so... I'm really excited for the start of the season, and, and yeah, that's it. Good, good, good. Well, Trezarian, second team all CAA after averaging 14.2 points, almost six rebounds a game. You guys bring back three starters. Uh, well, again, like I said, Charleston loses a bunch. Hofstra, we know, loses its star, and Aaron Estrada. Towson loses four starters. What needs to happen for you guys to win the league this year? Um, I, I think – what needs to happen is we just got to focus on, you know, getting better every day, um, focusing on a task at hand, not, you know, getting too carried away with thinking about other games and just focusing on the present and not thinking about the future. What do you need to do? What what has coach challenged you to get better this year? Um, just my leadership um, skills, you know, being a leader, uh, you know, in big moments, being poised, uh, keeping everyone grounded um, this offseason, you know, it's been more being a playmaker so I can, you know, help others get the shots that they need. So. All right, we're going to have a little fun here, boys. Uh, we're going to have a little fun. 
because uh, that's what I do. All right, Ante, let's start with what was Dalton's nickname for you? Uh, his nickname for me was, as there's so many, but his favorite was uh, Big Dump. So that's what he called me. Big Dump? Uh, Big Dump. D-U-M-B. Uh, yeah, man, is a... Uh, he called me Russian for some reason, even though I have nothing Russian in me. So it's it's Dalton. So he's he's my best friend, and uh, you know whatever you want to call me, I'm cool with it. So yeah, you're gonna you, hey, you're gonna miss some of that uh, energy that he brought to the court, no doubt about it. He was uh, a little bit out of his mind. I know Trezarian, you probably know that in warmups when you went against him, he was. Uh, you probably look over there and be like, "What is that dude doing?" Uh, <laughs> Listen, congrats, Trezarian. I know you are a, a new, fairly new father of a baby boy, a four-month-old. All right, I want to know congrats. how many diapers, how many diapers have you changed so far in the first four months? <laughs> Too many to count. It's like every 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 thirty minutes. <laughs> are you it's good at it bad. now? Like, are yeah, are you a pro? Good. Yeah, you know, after so much training, you know. I became a pro. <laughs> All right. So better scorer or diaper changer? <laughs> um, better scorer. <laughs> All right. All right. There we go. Ante, what is the tattoo you have on your calf? So it's a, it's a long story. It's a funny story, but I'm going to say it. it it's uh, from my previous college, D2. It was a Saturday night, you know, and I, I think I had few, many more than I should have. And one of my friends from a tennis team, she had like a drawing set uh, that she bought, and she said that she wants to draw something on me. And I asked if, if it's going to go away and when. She said about, you know, two, three weeks maybe. And uh, it's going to be almost two years soon. So she lied to me. And, uh, you know, it's just, it's just, I'm cool with it, honestly. But eventually I know it's going to, you know, I'm going to be, tired of it and i'm gonna go and take it off so <laughs> but it's a, yeah listen when you and i you and i talked last year when i was down there your story is amazing that nobody wanted you coming out of croatia nobody you know nobody really wanted you at all you didn't think or your, your buddies didn't think you could play college basketball at any level and now here you are one of the best players in in, in the ca and maybe the country uh trezarian say you know same thing for you right you came out and a lot of people maybe didn't think you were good enough. And what you've been able to do is is amazing. Last question I have for you: um, What color will your hair be on November sixth for that season opener? Because I know you right now. It looks I don't know what 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 color are we at now. What do we got going on? It's probably going to be gray, like green till. <laughs> but um, I don't I don't know. Ever since I had a kid, I've been thinking about going black. <laughs> Just going back black man normal again. <laughs> the, the the word is uh, after life after basketball. You're gonna try to get into some like modeling. Is that true? <laughs> yeah, you know I, I think I look pretty good, so um, <laughs> I think I could pull off a modeling career for real. Well, listen, uh, really really excited to see both of you this year. Uh, there's a reason you're both season first team all CA, and and uh, good luck this season. Thank you. Appreciate it, man. Now I am thrilled to welcome on to the Field of 68's CAA preseason preview show live from Media Day, Tyler Thomas of Hofstra and Charles Thompson of Towson. Gentlemen, first and foremost, uh, Charles, we just broke the news to Tyler that he was named preseason first team all CAA. You as well were named there. What does that mean to you guys? Tyler, let's go with you first. Uh Definitely accomplishment on all the hard work I put in uh, in the off season before, and you know I have to just repeat the same actions I did last year. Charles, uh, I mean, definitely grateful, but I don't look too much into it because I was named same thing last year, and then I didn't get the the year. So just looking forward to uh, actually proving it right this time. Yeah, well, if we're going to call it a disappointing season, Charles, you finished averaging 12.2 points, eight boards, 1.7 blocks. You were all CAA second team. You were all CAA defensive team on a team that had a lot of uh, a lot of good players on it. Now, you've lost a number of those seniors. Obviously, Nick graduated. 
and he's uh, heading to Kansas. You had some other players graduate. I'm sure you had offers in the offseason from other schools, from high major programs asking you to transfer. Why are you back at Towson? I mean, scary believed in me in day one because – Originally, I wasn't even going to play basketball. I was a football guy. I had office in football. I was going to go play football. But Scary convinced me. He just showed me how much he like loved me and like wanted me to really be here. So from that moment on, it was really like this is like this is it was more than a coaching and player relationship. Like this is my guy. So from I didn't even really think about transferring at any point in time. It was always I'm going back to Towson and I'm going to finish the job here. Now, Tyler, you guys tied for first place in the CAA last season. Uh, but you ended up losing in the semifinals to Wilmington. What do you have to do this year to be able to get over that hump, to be able to win the league, to be able to get to the NCAA tournament? Um, you know, I feel like that's a hard question because I feel like we shot ourselves in the foot a lot that, uh, that game and, you know, with some costly turnovers or a missed rebound. But, you know, to get us back to the same point is, you know, treat practice like every game. Uh, make practice harder than the games, and hopefully make it over the hump uh, this year. With uh, with Aaron Estrada's void being in the backcourt next to you, what do you have to do to be able to kind of make up for some of those numbers? Uh, it's not only just making up some of the scoring. I think some guys will step up. I think some key guys are going to surprise a lot of people this year that didn't get a chance last year to show it um, because of whatever reason. Um, more of a vocal leader. Um, kind of more of a do it by, you know, showing up every day early and working out and just leading by example. But I have to, I think I have to be more of a vocal, uh, vocal guy for us this year. Now, Charles, you're, uh, you have a little bit of family pedigree when it comes to athletics. Your father um, was a boxer that fought for the heavyweight title. And, and my sources are telling me that he had a pretty interesting nickname when he was boxing. <laughs> Yeah, he was um, Tony the Tiger Thompson. Do you have a nickname as well? Uh, I mean, yeah. It's kind of like my tattoo here. You can't see it because, like, I mean, I'm so dark. It's a bear with a crown on it. My mom calls me Charlie Bear, <laughs> and then my dad calls me Little King. So, like, I kind of like – it's kind of two nicknames in the one. That's kind of like the story behind it. But, uh, I mean, so it's just dental dental boxer. Diet. Oh, go ahead. So your dad was a boxer and you were a football player growing up. How did you end up as a basketball player? How did that come about? Uh, I mean, eventually I was just six, seven and it was like, okay, well, I mean, you can really do both. It's really your option. It was never an option if I was going to go to college. It was what sport, if not both, and what sport would I play? So, and my takeover, my AAU team was really good too. So team takeover really like changed my view on how I sell basketball really. Yeah, I think we all know about Team Takeover. Tyler, last thing for you. You left Sacred Heart prior to last season, and you ended up at Hofstra. Did you find what you were looking for in the new program? Uh, yes, I found what I was looking for here. Um, you know, a coach that, that believed in me from day one. Uh, you know, a, a plan for me how to get better. Uh, player development was huge. We do that every day here, maybe more than once a day. Um I basically got whatever I needed at that time and now, too. Um, I think I definitely made the right, right choice coming to Hajra. Well, listen, gentlemen, congratulations on being named preseason CAA first team. Uh, best of luck this season, and I hope I see you guys eventually down the road at some point. Thank you. Thank you, Thank you for having me. That was Charles Thompson. That was Tyler Thomas, and that was the CAA preseason all-league first team. Coming up now, we have Martin Inglesby, uh, Delaware head coach. The Blue Hens were picks uh, tied for fifth in the league alongside Tel uh, Towson. Uh, coach Inglesby, are you sick of having Jeff Borzello wear you out and, and always talk about how uh, great Delaware is? Um, is he – do you want him to be the face of uh, Delaware basketball on social media? Sure. Um, you know, I'm trying to get him to support our collective here a little bit and donate some money to NIL. Exactly. To help us out. I've been hitting him a couple uh, the last two years about that, but uh, no, no, no. I'm trying to get him down here and ha have a cocktail with him on main street and uh, hear some stories from his heyday here. 
Yeah, he'll he's not going to reach in his in his pocket. <laughs> Trust me, Martin. We've tried that enough. It, it, it is. Yeah. It's not going to happen. So you might want to give up on that that idea. <laughs> but uh, all right, talk to us a little bit about what you've gone through in the offseason. Because you and I, I saw you last year at Charleston. And, you know, it, it's tough for coaches at your level right now because obviously you're going to lose if a player has a great year. It's almost understood they're going to try to be poached by the high major level. You, you, That's been the reality for you several times. It was a reality for you in the offseason when Jameer Nelson Jr. decided to transfer out uh, to the the high the highest uh, level. W- what's that like for you to try to just kind of do, – do you just accept it at this point? And almost – I've heard some coaches say, hey, listen, when I recruit a kid, now I almost tell him, hey, we're going to try to develop you to get you to that level. How hard is that to try to, you know, come to grips with? Yeah, I mean, it's been very challenging for us. I mean, um, I think you have to adapt or die to uh, the new landscape of college basketball and the transfer portal and NIL coming in kind of at the same time. Um, really proud of the the student athletes we've been able to identify and develop here in our program. I think you always fear uh, the season's over, you get that text or call, uh, hey coach, can I come in and talk? Uh, We've lost some really, really good players over the last couple of years that have gone to high major levels. Uh, But we're gonna continue to be aggressive and recruit these type of kids. I have not used that in the recruiting process with any of the transfers or incoming guys we're trying to recruit. Um, Really proud of the program and the culture that we've developed here. And I think those guys that have left have had great experiences here at the university and the investment we've made in them as as basketball players and people. So we're going to continue to do what we do. Uh, It does make it challenging, but, um, you know, I think it's allowed us to be very aggressive on the flip side uh, in the transfer portal and and go out there and try to attract guys to fill these holes. Uh, Jameer Nelson Jr. was, he was so productive for you last season. How do you replace that at a position as important as point guard is in college basketball? Yeah, I think it's got to be by committee. Um, you know, we have 12 scholarship guys on our roster right now. We have six transfers. Uh, we have no incoming freshmen. And, um, you know, you've heard my previous boss and mentor talk about getting old and staying old uh, to death. So th- that has kind of been our philosophy. Um, you know, we needed to get uh, a point guard. We needed to get some skilled players on the perimeter. I think we have identified that aggressively through the portal. Uh, I didn't go on the road in the spring um, because I knew we needed to get older and more mature with our roster. Um, And we got six incoming guys that I think fit uh, our program. They fit our culture. They give us versatility to play a couple different ways. Uh, So I'm excited about our group, the energy we have. Um, We're at that point now where we got to go out and play somebody else, which would be good this weekend. But I don't don't think it's, um, you know, you can find one guy to replace a Jameer Nelson. Um, So we, we went out and identified a couple different guys that can play multiple positions to help us kind of facilitate on the offensive end. Martin, who are a couple of the new faces that you expect to come in and make a significant impact this year? Well, one guy is uh, Jalen Trent. I mean, he's a transfer from North Dakota. Um, He's going to have the ball in his hands a lot. He's got great size. He's an elite athlete changing ends of the floor. He can really disrupt some things on the defensive end. So we're excited to kind of see him kind of take over that spot for us. Um, Gerald Drumgoal is a guy that really scored the basketball last year at Albany. He's an experienced guy. He's been in college basketball a couple of years. Um, You know, excited about Niles Lane. I mean, he didn't play as much at Florida. He's came here in the summer. He's a high major athlete, a talent that has gotten better over the last couple of months on the offensive end. Um, so I think those three guys on the perimeter right now, um, you know, ha- have kind of made their mark uh, in practice. And, you know, for us last year, we didn't score the ball as effectively or efficiently, efficiently as we wanted to, especially from the three point line. We were in the bottom third in the league. So going out and identifying guys that could put the ball in the hoop from the three point line and stretch the floor was kind of one of our big areas of need uh, that we addressed. If your roster online is to be trusted, everybody that you have that is projected to be in the rotation this season is between six, four and six, nine. Now, I don't know how much you inflated those heights. I don't know how much you, uh, how many inches you gave each of those players, but um, that is, it's a bigger team. I think it's very, it's great size positionally in the CAA. 
Um, was that intentional? Is that something that you were targeting this offseason? No, I mean, I think it, it was intentional, um, kind of stealing a page out of Coach Cohen's book in our league. They, they always had big wings and big size uh, on their perimeter. And, and I think for us to be able to be a little better defensively, we needed to have, you know, 6'3", six, 6'4", six, guards that has some athleticism, had some length. Um, I do think the versatility that we can play with, whether you play small but you have great size on the perimeter or you can play a little bigger with some of our guys on the front line um, is an area where we got to get better at. Um, and, and I think from a defensive standpoint to be able to switch some things and keep bodies on bodies um, and play certain ways uh, was definitely appealing to us as we kind of put this roster together. Well, Martin, uh, at some point, we need to make it down to Delaware. At some point, we need to make it down to Newark. I will tell you my story. Uh, we it, it can't go out on air about the the last time that I was in uh, Newark. It uh, let's just say I ended up at uh, the the Christiana Care Center, and um, it was uh, <laughs> it was it it was it was an expensive weekend. But I appreciate you being here. I'm going to head down that way, and uh, I need you to show me a blue hen. That's all I want to see. Is I want to see a blue hen. I've never seen a blue hen before. Other than Jeff, Boyce. you have an art. You Coaching come down here. Uh, hey, first rounds on me, and, and three. I look forward to hearing that story. <laughs> Martin, I don't know. I need Borzello, to, uh... We need actual. Yeah, we need actual uh, proof of Borzello's degree because I don't believe it. Yeah, well, I'll have to try to confirm that for you guys and let you know. <laughs> Thanks, man. <laughs> Great to you. Martin Ingles, right, being investigative yep. reporter. Yeah. <laughs> Oh, Good man, I had to luck. get into Jeff Forzello dig there. Um, coming up next, I'm actually really excited to, uh, to to talk to this guy. It is Hofstra head coach Speedy Claxton heading into his uh, third season with the program. He is an alum. He is uh, maybe the best player to, to ever come out of Hofstra. What do you think, Speedy? Maybe. Best player? Come Hofstra on, history? maybe. <laughs> come on. I love it. Give me some credit. Speedy, here. what's up, man? How are you? What's up, Everything Jeff? good? Good. How's everything? Yep. All is well. Really good. Really good. Really good. All right. Well, let, let's start off the elephant in the room here. Uh, the easiest question, I'm sure you're getting all off season. Like, how do you replace Aaron Estrada? Because, you know, I saw you guys down in Charleston last year. It, it's funny because you don't see a lot of guys like him, right? He started at the mid-major level, went up. It didn't work out for him. Goes back to the mid-major level and absolutely thrives under you. Uh, he did everything. And, and at Alabama, they think he's going to be like, he might be their best player this year uh, for the Crimson Tide. How do you deal with the departure of Aaron Estrada? All right. So first, no one man is going to replace a two-time player of the year. Um, so we, we, we can cancel that out. Uh, it's going gonna, it's gonna to be by committee. Um, you know, guys who were here last year, Tyler, J.C., Stone, um, Bryce, German, all those guys are going to have to take steps. And, um, you know, some of the newcomers are going to have to come in and, you know, dive in right into the culture. Um, so we're going to do it by committee, honestly. Tyler Thomas, New Haven, Connecticut's finest, uh, is, is another point guard in that role. And what we've seen from Hofstra over the years, I think this is kind of what the, the program, at least in my mind, is known for. It's just great point guard play. Um, what have you seen yeah, this is this God summer? Here. Where have you seen development? Yeah. Uh, Tyler, he's been, you know, he's been phenomenal um, throughout this offseason. Um, he's been here all three summer sessions, and, you know, he, he's our leader. You know, um, everybody's going to follow his lead. He's been working out two, three times a day, and he's just getting better each and every day, man. We're going to lean on him heavily. He's going to be that next all great right, guard. Speed. Come out of Hofstra. Speedy, all right, you, you, you got to give me a good story uh, from when you were with the Sixers and you played with Iverson. I, I'm told there's a great Bentley story <laughs> to be told there. It's, it's, it's so many stories, Jeff, honestly. <laughs> um, you know, the one that everybody pretty much know about is the practice situation. Yeah. Uh, you know, AI wasn't too – too. He, he didn't like practicing, but um, I remember this one day – this was early in my career, and I was like, I was, you know, I was um, eyes wide. I, I didn't know what was going on. You know, AI didn't feel like practicing. OB, Larry Brown, wanted to kick him out of practice, but um, AI didn't want to leave practice. 
and the AI telling LB that he should have retired last year. And, you know, I'm a rookie. I'm like, oh my god, he's really something. To, like, hey, coach, like this, this is wild. But you know, some of the other vets calmed him down and got him out of practice. But that was probably the crazy. That was a, that was really a crazy story. So you went from playing for playing with Allen Iverson in Philadelphia to. Greg Popovich and the San Antonio Spurs back to back. I got to imagine that was a little bit of a culture shock. Definitely. It was totally different. You know, um, when I was in Philly, everybody was pretty much on their own. You know, once practice broke out, um, guys went their separate ways and kind of did whatever they did. Um, But when I was in San Antonio, we were like a true family. So we did everything together. Um, You know, Steve Jackson, who I, who I was very close with at the time, and Malik Rose, we would actually hang out off the court. Um, after practice, we would go get something to eat, go bowling, go to the movies. But then um, once everybody found out that we was doing that, they just joined in, and it, it, it kind of became a, a team thing. So we had, like, team dinners at, um, at players' houses. We went bowling. We went to the movies as, as a unit. And ultimately, I think that's why we, we clicked on the court and we won the championship that year. When when was it, Speedy, that you figured, hey, you know what, I might want to get into this coaching deal? Because, like, a lot of former point guards we know are great coaches. Like, you almost look at that and say they know how to play the game, their IQ, all that. But did you grow up ever thinking you were going to be a coach? No, not at all. It wasn't until my very last year in Golden State where I kind of had – a knee injury and Don Nelson um, was the coach at the time. And I guess he kind of saw how I interacted with my teammates. And then after practice one day, and obviously my career was close to being over, he he came to me and he was like, sweetie, uh, did you ever think about coaching? And at that time, like I said, I, I really hadn't. Um, and he was like, I said, nah, not really. And he said, you should really think about it. I think you would be a, a great coach. And you know, this is, Don Nelson, who's a Hall of Famer. So once he said it, that's that's what kind of got the wheels in motion. And then once the opportunity with Coach Mahalik presented itself here, you know, I took it and ran with it. And, and Don, hey, you, you mean- to put it, Don hadn't smoked anything before he said that, correct? <laughs> I don't think so. <laughs> <laughs> um, Speedy, you managed to to last nine years in the NBA, which is not an easy thing to do, right? We see a lot of careers go three, four, five years. Um, when you ten, are talking ten, with so guys at 10, 10 years, years. I'm sorry, I'm sorry, ten. I'm sorry. Math is not my strong suit. Math is not my strong suit. Pension is coming up, man. We got to get that out there. Pension is coming up. <laughs> <laughs> That's when you, right. When you're talking, when you're talking with the the guys that you're coaching now, what do you tell them about how about career longevity? What do you what are you talking to them about? I don't know, like maintaining their body, about making sure you can accept a role. How has that uh, influenced your perspective on working with the next generation of players? Yeah, I, I, I try to tell them like your body is your commodity. What you put into your body is what you get out of it. Um, so you got to treat your body right and. You know, everybody wants to make it to the to the NBA or play professionally, but only a only a small amount get the chance to. So it's what you do now is going to prepare you for that moment. So if you're not out there working hard on your craft every day now, it's probably not going to happen because everybody wants to be a professional. But it's what you do now, um, preparing right now that's going to you know get you ready for that moment. All right, Speedy, last thing I got for you. We got about 30 seconds left here. You told us in the Almanac that we have our Batman, meeting Tyler Thomas. We just need to find our Robin. After seeing, what, about the first six weeks of practice or so, do you know who your Robin is? Have you found him yet? Uh, honestly, I'm, I'm going to say no because we had so much um, little practice time because we've kind of been hit with the injury bug. But, you know, last year around this t- say, around the same time, I didn't know who my Robin was going to be either. Um, and then, you know, Tyler just kind of evolved as the year um, went along. So, you know, I'm not, I'm not too concerned about it right now. I think it's just going to play itself out and somebody will emerge.
Well, Speedy Claxton, always a pleasure catching up with you. At some point, we need to get together so I can get some of those Allen Iverson stories that uh, you couldn't yeah, tell definitely. over Let's the air Let's on the record. <laughs> right. Best of luck Thanks, this Speedy. season, man. Always a Appreciate pleasure it, catching up. Hi, fellas. Speedy Claxton, Hofstra, head coach. The Pride were picked uh, fourth in the CAA preseason poll. Coming up next, we got a guy who knows – uh, the CAA about as well as anybody, Monte Ross, in his first season back in the league, uh, he spent seven years as the Delaware Blue Hens head coach. That was back when Jeff Borzello was, uh, was, was still pretending to attend classes in school. Monte, great to see you, man. What's going on? How you doing? Welcome back to the oh, CAA. Yo, man, you really, that uh, math part really isn't a... Uh... Strong suit of yours, is it? I was 10 years in the league. You take, you take an NBA years from Speedy. You take a head coaching years from me. Goodness gracious, man. We really got to get He's that pencil and pen stuff. We got. What, uh, I'm done. what college did you go to? I it could have been an HBCU. He went to Vassar, which is a good school, but he never went to he never went to class, obviously. Yeah, I mean, maybe they just, didn't have a math just requirement. Had one there. Yeah, you do have to go to class. If you're going to get the knowledge that you need, you got to go to class. Hey, Monte, true story. I am the only player in the history of my college basketball program to get kicked off the team twice. So I'm just going to kind of say that should set the level of expectation for me right now. Yeah, I mean, that's hard to do. <laughs> it's, it is hard to do. Monte, what, right, so, what's, it, what's it been like so far for you? Because, again, you know, you get another chance here to be a head coach. You did it for a while uh, at Delaware. What's this been like for you? And again, going back in the league that you had, you you have a lot of knowledge about, but it's certainly different than maybe when you left it. Yeah, no, I think uh, it's been great. First of all, it's been tremendous. I think the opportunity to, uh, whenever you have an opportunity to have an impact on the lives of young people, it's not something that I take for granted. It's not something that uh, it's just uh, smoothed it over. Uh, it's something that I really, really cherish and really, really uh, uh, have a lot of pride in. And, you know, for me, having the experiences that we had in the CAA um, are just tremendous. Um, the last five years we were in the league, which is really an unknown stat, the last five years we were in the league in conference play, uh, we had the best record uh in conference play for the last five years total so it was something that we had established a tremendous uh track record in the league um and i think that's what we're going to try to do here at north Carolina a and t it's not going to be something that's going to be done overnight it's not going to be something that's going to be easy but it's going to be something that we are really really uh headstrong on making sure that we do get done so you have a roster where you basically return three guys from last season's team. You had to rebuild everything, portal, freshmen, all these new people coming in. How do you how do you start that? New coach, so many new faces. Like where where does that process start being able to build a culture, a team, a program, all those kind of cliches? Well, it, it starts, but it never ends and you never finish. And what I mean by that is we started – in April, when we got the job, we started. Now, to today, which is, what are we, October 19th, I still need a roster in my hand during practice with numbers on it so I can know who all these guys are. I have no idea. Like, I, 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 like, I don't call them by the names. I call them by numbers. I say, hey, 23, you got to make sure you, 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 you hit, you're getting a box out right there because we can't. Because it's a never-ending process now. And that's the, the beauty and the beast of college basketball now, and, and, and college sports in general. Like, I think, and, and I hope this doesn't take away from your guys' job, because I think you guys do a hell of a job. But you're going to have to do away with pro prognostications in the next however many years. Because how do you know what someone has with the advent of this transfer portal you have no idea. It used to be, you know, five years ago, you looked at a roster, you see how many guys they had coming back, how many points, rebounds, assists are returning. And then you were able to make an educated guess on, okay, well, they'll probably finish somewhere in there, somewhere in here. Nowadays, with the advent of this transfer portal, people leaving, you're getting people. It's just a crapshoot. And shoot, for us, 
uh, it'll be a crapshoot. You know what I mean? Who knows um, where we're going to be? I know, I know what we have to do on a daily basis to put ourselves in position uh, to be good. Um, that's the beauty of the experience of being a head coach before. You know, you learn what's important to winning. You learn what's important to success. Now, does that mean that uh, you're going to be able to attain that in the time frame that you want to? No, not always. And for us, probably not right now. But we know the road we have to travel to get there, which is comforting to me. I, I, and I'll be honest with you, my first head coaching stint at the University of Delaware you're put into a situation where you're having to build a program and what you're doing, you have no idea if it's going to work or not. You're like flying by the seat of your pants, hoping all of your, your moral compass, your, your, your skill work, your develop, all those types of things, you're hoping it's the right thing and that it's going to work. At Delaware, it did work. Now we have a cheat sheet. We have a roadmap on what we need to do to be successful. Uh, so now it's a little bit easier, just in terms of your mental on if you can get it done. Uh, how cool is it that, that you're going to play uh, Hampton, Buck Joyner on Martin Luther King Day, two HBCUs going up against each other? Uh, I love the idea. I hope every year, um, you know, this happens with, with different HBCUs. Yeah, I think any time that you can uh, magnify the importance of what uh, Dr. Martin Luther King did, uh, you know, across the board, is something that has to be celebrated and something that, like you said, I hope we continue to do it on a yearly basis because, uh, you know, for us, you know, we have the A&T4, who was a group who started the first, the very first sit-in uh, an entire country. So again, for us to be able to highlight something like that um, is very, very true to our core and something that we're very excited about and proud of as well. Who's going to surprise us this year? Who on your roster is going to be someone where um, we see them play, we see the numbers that they're putting up, we see the impact that, uh, that they're having, and it's not something that we would have expected? Ricky Moore, my assistant, he won a national championship as a head, as a assistant at UConn, and he won a national championship as a player. So he's going to be the uh, – he's the uh, dark horse that we have. He's our uh, unknown entity that, uh, in all seriousness, I have no idea. You know, like, we have guys – I love that, this. Uh, Monte, you, you're, so, <laughs> you're so honest and upfront about this. That's the coolest part. No, it is like a lot of coaches are going to give coach speak. Your, your deal is, hey, listen, I took over a team, totally different players that I just don't know well enough yet, especially with the lights being on, right? Yeah, and, and watch, I can tell you what I've seen in practice for the last 50 practices we've had since the summer. But like you said, it doesn't always translate. Some guys are McDonald's All-American practice players. You know what I mean? Yeah, and right. other guys, when those lights come on, uh, you wonder, like, what happened to that guy? Like, he was so good in practice. And, you know, the other thing is, like, like okay, you take your offense and your defense. And I said, yeah, if our offense really goes well today, you know what? Our defense stinks. If our defense really looks good the next day, you know what? Our offense stinks. You know what I mean? So you just, until, and that, that's why I really love these outside scrimmages, these secret scrimmages that you have. Because it gives you an opportunity to what do you do when the lights are? I, I, I call those aren't the brightest lights. They're dimmed a little bit when it's the secret yeah. scrimmage. But it gives you an opportunity to go against other comp, other guys that have been practicing just as hard as you have. And you, you get to stack up and see, okay, well, we really need to work on this. Oh, you know what? We weren't, we weren't so bad at this, but we really need to work on that. And, and so I love those outside scrimmages. So... I'm sorry not not to be able to answer your question, but like you know, Jeff said, I have no idea. Uh, you know, I'm, we're we're just going to we'll throw this thing up, man. We'll play hard. We'll dive all over the floor for loose balls, and hopefully, hopefully, you know, we can make a shot or two. You know, I think you know we, we're going to try to do something no one else has ever done in college basketball, uh, especially in the modern area. If we can win a game six nothing. You know, we're going to take it this year. 
<laughs> Love it. Love well, Monte, it. listen, you talked about uh, McDonald's All-American practice players. I can tell you this. Um, Jeff Goodman is an All-McDonald's American practice player. Monte Ross, North Carolina a t head coach. Always good to see you, my man. Great to see you back in the coaching ranks. Great to see you back in the CAA. Great to see you smiling again, man. Oh, it's great, man. Love being on with you guys, and thanks for all you thanks. do for us in the league, and uh, look forward thanks, to seeing you down the road. Likewise, man. Take care, man. Take care. That was Monte Ross, North Carolina a t head coach. First season back in the CAA. Coming up next, Goodman, we have Monmouth head coach King Rice. And uh, I'm very interested to talk to King because um, he made one of the more interesting uh, grad transfer additions uh, this offseason. I got to imagine this was one of the toughest recruitments you've ever made, Coach. Uh, Xander Rice, your son, you brought him in. I, you know, before you talk about this, I want to ask you, after seeing him average, what was it, 14-4 and four at Bucknell, were you sitting there like, yeah, you know what, maybe I should have brought this kid in as a freshman? <laughs> Well, guys, it's it's great to see you guys. Um, actually, what's funny about about Alexander being here with us is I recruited him the first time uh, a little bit, just a little. Um, but I wanted him to find what he felt was best for him. And guys, I want you to know I'm I was a first time person in my family to go to to college. Okay, and since I've gone, my sister went, my niece went. And now Alexander has a Bucknell degree. Okay, so That's really awesome. for me, that was what it was all about. Nathan Davis recruited him as hard, like I think you should be recruited. And everyone all thought that Alexander was just coming with me. Um, Coach Beheim was mad at me, said, King, your son is a really good player. What are you doing? Why don't you just take him? Um, Jeff Lebo told me, said, King, did you tell him he has a scholarship? Because at one point I was thinking, man, I could get Xander to come and not be on scholarship. And then we'll be able to get another big time player to come. Yeah. And Jeff was like, King, are you crazy? You cannot do that to your own son. You, he has to know you really want him. So when Bucknell came, it was a blessing for our family. Uh, unfortunately, they didn't win enough games. So, so Nate had to change jobs. But the job they did with my son, I'm forever grateful. OK, I, I would call Nate all the time and talk to him to make sure he was doing what Nathan needed. Um, and Nate would always tell me, King, your son is a high achieving kid. OK, he's going to do well in school. He's going to do good in basketball. Just you got to relax and give him some room. <clears throat> so this time through, I told my staff, I'm not going to recruit him. I'm going to be his dad. I'm going to I'm going to listen to all the calls and we're going to come up with what's best for him. But I also told those guys, you better call his mother every single day, okay? Because <laughs> he wants him home. I'm not going to do that one. Uh, I'm just not. And But she wants him home. But she also saw after games, when he had high school games, she saw after his many AAU games, I'd get in the car by myself and drive home mad. When he rode with me, we'd both get out of the car. And we wouldn't speak to each other when she would see us. And he'd go in his room and close the door and she'd be like, what happened, King? And I'd be like, nothing happened. Everything's fine. So my wife was a little bit nervous about him coming, but it's been so much fun so far. Um, Nathan and, and the whole staff at Bucknell, he's, he's really, really a solid player. And he's better than I thought. Um, we, we were on him about his defense when me and his mom would watch all the time. She'd be like, why does he run in the screen so much? He needs, why don't you say something to him? And I'm like, no, why don't you say something to him? I'm trying to get him to talk to me some more. Okay. So I'm yeah, not going to talk right. bad about his defense. I'm trying to be there. So he just wants to call and say, what's up, dad? How you doing? So since he's been home, it's just last night he stayed at the house. We had a workout early this morning. Um, my wife is cooking a lot better meals because he's home. Uh, I do have an 11 year old. So it's like I come home for lunch and there's food on the stove because Alexander's home and she's making sure he's getting the right nutrients and all the stuff. So me and my son Julian are eating a lot better now. Um, and it's, it's just been a lot of fun. That's awesome, man. It's so cool to hear again, you let your son kind of go 
spread his wings a little bit. And I know how you are. I know how tough you are. And it's hard as, as coach and father, right? Like to handle that. So now is he calling you coach? Is he calling you dad? Is he calling you kid? What's he calling you in practice now? He, he just looks at me when, when I correct him or if I correct him too much. He'll be like, all right, guys, we're ready. We're ready now, guys. We're ready. And I'm like, that's what you do to me at home, man. Don't do that at practice. <laughs> and um, but he calls me, you know, he'll call me coach. Um, he's not going to call me dad in front of the guys. Um, when I tell my dad stories about him, you can see him sit there and make faces, you know, because he's like, come on, dad. I'm, I'm one of the players, man. Don't do that. So, but what he awesome, did, man. you know, Jeff, what you said, like I'm a certain way and I'm like that all the time. And I've, you know, some people think you got to tone it down and I'm like that all the time. And he's watched me my whole life or his whole life. So he's like, my dad overreacts sometimes. <laughs> my dad gets mad too much. <laughs> my dad this. So he goes the other way. And guys, since he's been here, he, he's helped me keep my cool. Um, he's he. I understand him so much so I can help him. But I also know that I, I push him hard a lot of times. So I got to I got to let the other guys coach him, too. Um, but he he's he's a kid that's a coach's son. So he's been known to be a pleaser. He tries to do what the coaches want all the time. What we've tried to do with him is make him more aggressive. OK, the style that we play is just a little different than Bucknell's. And some of the shots that I have you take, they probably don't have you take. And Alexander's a coach's son, so he's always trying to make the right play. He played for Mr. Hurley. He played for Chris Chavanis mm -hmm. in high school. So those guys are high-level guys. So he understands the game. And now as his dad and his coach, I'm trying to loosen him up some more and allow him and, and get him to understand we need you to take some of these shots that maybe – you haven't always thought we're the best shots, but we need you to be aggressive like that. And he's uh, he's fitting great with the guys. He's a leader on the team already. I think the guys respect him for his work ethic. Um, he's come in and he did not come in trying to be the coach's son and tell everybody I'm here now. He came in a month early. He jumped into workouts when he didn't have to be here. Um, and he just started being a part of the group. And Xander has a way about him and I, he, he just he's not going to scream at you. He's not going to get in your face. He's not going to say, what are you doing? He's going to come and talk to you on the side and say, hey, my man, check it out. How about you think about this? Hey, why don't you think about doing it this way instead of being super aggressive in your face? Yeah. He gets you on his team a whole different way. And I've, I've watched him closely since he's been home and I'm trying to do it more like him than him trying to do it like awesome. me. That's awesome. Mm -hmm. Really, really, really so, cool. Well, Enjoy it. Enjoy the season with them. Go ahead, Rob. I hope so. <laughs> oh, well, yeah. yeah. So last season, you guys uh, did not get off to the greatest start. We don't have to rehash it. We don't have to relive old memories. <laughs> but you won six of your last 12, finished the season six and six. Uh, what changed down the stretch? And how can you spin that forward into what this season is going to be? Well, I, first off, guys, when you when you go from the MAC to the CAA, you know, and no disrespect to the MAC, the size of the players is really, really different. Okay, it's just a bigger, stronger. I walked out when we played Drexel the first time, and it was a early, I think it was a one o'clock game or something like that. And I got there, and I'm all ready. We gonna get these guys, and you walk out there, and you're just looking at their their, their size, and I'm like. They didn't look this big on the tapes. They didn't like, man, these guys are huge. <laughs> and then you get in the game and and they they really beat us badly. Um, and I like Spiker and we've had really good battles in the past. And um, but it was like, wow, guys, we, we 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 got some problems in this league right now. And but I didn't want to just scrap everything and say, hey, we're just going to go slow. We're, we're going to hold the ball away from people. I can't do that. So we just kept trying to play and, and we weren't as good as the other teams. And then what happened, we had a good group of kids and we just kept kept telling them, you got to keep fighting, guys. You got to be more together. Right now, we're, we can't even out team somebody because we're not together like we should be. 
And we just kept plugging and kept plugging and kept plugging. And then when we played Wilmington down there, we almost beat them. Like it, it was a really, really good game for probably 36, 37 minutes. And I was like, okay, we, we got better because Wilmington was so good. It, it was like, man, we, we at least went in their building and played them well. And then our next game was A&T, and they had been playing really well. Early game again, a um, couple of our guys went out with some of their guys. <laughs> okay, so now I get to the game, and two of my guys are suspended because they weren't home on time. And it's like, guys, we're having the worst season ever, and we're, we're going out and hanging out with the other team, like hang out with them after the season. And that day, our kids, Richard, Dakari Spence, really played well. He played the whole game. Um, and we just kind of outplayed him that day. And I think it gave our kids a lot of confidence. And I think a t thought the game would be an easy game because we, were, we weren't a good team. So they watched the tapes, and you can tell your team, hey, they're tougher than they look. But when they're kids and they're seeing our record and how much we were losing by, they probably they were like, man, we're going to beat these guys badly. And then we had a good night. <laughs> and then we got a big lead. And then they tried to turn it up, and we were already rolling, and we were able to hold them off. Well, when you're owing it forever and you get a big win like that on the road, you know, now it's like, well, we beat them and they beat Delaware. <laughs> you know, maybe we can at least be in this game. And then same thing. I think Delaware thought um, they're just not any good. And we weren't. So I, I, I can't even be mad that people thought that. And in the Delaware game, we, we trapped our point guard every time he got the ball because he was really good, Jameer Nelson's son. And every time he got it, we just trapped him. He, he trapped him. If he came on a boss trap, trap, and he had to give the ball up. And they didn't score for a while, and, and our kids gained confidence. And then we outplayed them the rest of the day. And you you guys been doing this a long time. When, you, when kids get confidence, you know, anything can happen. And I think that's what happened in those games. I think Clem Vuga. We, we did a better job of coaching him and trying to limit all the things that he tries to do. And Clem became a 13 and eight guy for the end of the season. So now we had him and Miles. So we at least had two guys that you could put some numbers on the board if we played through them. And towards the end of the season, they started playing well together. They wanted to play together because they knew both of us have this skill set. Earlier in the year, they weren't, they weren't you know, cohesive four or five men and late in the year they became like yo guys we we can both get 15 20 points and that helps us win and then we pieced a few together that you know we beat drexel which was was big time because the way they beat us the first time um and then guys it just it was just a tough tough year for us and um you know i i i didn't feel good about it um, I watched everybody and everybody was like, he should get fired. He should this. And guys, I made some bad mistakes last year. I didn't think I made mistakes that, that I should have got me fired. And my mistakes were one, I schedule hard every year, but to start of that season to go to Seton hall, Virginia, and then Illinois, that was just not good. Okay. If, if it's three games in the middle of your season, you can deal with those losses. You can deal with them, but when they were three and you get beat that badly three times in a row with a young group, that was just terrible on my part. And I felt bad right when, when I was at Illinois. Uh, I was at that game, and they're beating us right from the beginning. And that made me feel like our night at Kansas, and it made me feel like our night at, at uh, Kentucky, where I looked up at the score at Kansas, and I'm like, Ricky, is that 38, 37? And he goes, no, King, that's 50. And I was like, that man, my Carolina math isn't working today. You know, and you just you <laughs> feel bad when you're in a game like that because yeah. yes, we play by games. We don't we don't have to, but I take my kids to these cool places because Kansas is one of the best places. Kentucky, you get to say you were on that floor. That's cool when you're this level. Three in a row the way I did it last year was not right. And that was the first mistake. But uh, the second one. And guys, I, I can't really call it a mistake, but the year before I brought in basically four older guys. Okay. I had George Pappas and Marcus McCleary. They stayed. So that's two older guys that wouldn't be on your team anymore that stayed. 
Then you bring in Shavar, who I probably should have recruited out of high school, but I had a whole bunch of guards at that time. He walks on at Seton Hall, and he has a great career up there. And each year I talked to the Seton Hall coaches, and they were like, King, will you take Shavar? And I'm like, yes. And then he would stay there and end up a starter. <laughs> and I'm like, you guys stop calling me about this kid if you're going to keep him every year. Well, the last year, Shavar was in the portal. I called him myself. I didn't wait to talk to anybody else, and I called him. And he was very, very interested. And I, I, I watched Shavar hit game winners against Villanova. You know, so I'm like, this kid is a real, real major player. And the things he was looking for were the things that I, I'm known to do. Okay, then I brought in Walker Miller. And no one thought Walker was going to be as good as he was, but I'm a Carolina guy, all right? And I knew he was Wes's brother. I watched him when he was in high school. Wes is one of my best friends in this business. I'm the big brother in that relationship. And when he was in school, I rebounded for him every single day. Okay, I moved back to Chapel Hill and I rebounded for Wes Miller every day when he was a kid and we got tight. So I watched his brother grow up. And when there was a chance, I, call, I called actually Wes and just to call him to see how he was doing. And he was like, well, I'm sitting with my brother and we're me and my dad, we're trying to figure out where he's going to go to school. I think we lost King. I think we lost King. Um, <laughs> I think King Rice. I, I feel bad that right in the that, middle uh, of a pretty good story too. Yeah, it was talking about another anyway, Carolina King Rice, guy. Yep, yeah, that was King Rice, um, Monmouth head coach. Uh, we are going to be joined now by William and Mary head coach uh, Dane Fisher. Um, hopefully, we don't lose Dane in the middle of a, of a question. Dane, I don't know how much of that you got, but uh, um, thank you for being here, man. Good to see you. Yeah, good to see you guys too. King was on a roll. He was on a roll. He was on a roll. The part the part about his son was actually awesome. Um, no doubt. All right. So you, you go in, uh, you got three starters back. Uh, this is a team obviously you want to make the jump this year and kind of get a little bit uh higher up in the standings. It, it, it's a tough league. We know that. I mean, there's some programs in this league that are gonna be tough to beat. They have great resources um you guys have history though you do you have history what what's going to allow you to make that jump this year with those three starters back and some of the new faces you added Dan? yeah I, I, first of all i think you're spot on the league i mean this is a terrific league and it, it keeps getting better and better uh, some of the teams that some of the players coming back and obviously the years that, that some of these teams had last year uh it's going to be really competitive you know, I was talking with someone the other day, and we have five new players this year, two freshmen, three transfers, and someone's like, boy, that's a lot of new guys. And it's like, not when you had 10 the year before, it's not. You know, so um, you know, I, think we're, I, I think we're starting with a good, um, with, with, with a, a good foundation, uh, which you mentioned, the three starters back. And, you know, we've got guys that I think can be, uh, can really take the jump for us to, from freshman to sophomore year. And, um, and, and I'm looking forward to the pieces that we have and, and building and, and getting ready to go for the league play. What did you learn last season? Learn about yourself as a coach, learn about the profession, dealing with, like you said, 10 new players in a program. Yeah, I think uh, the first thing would be the importance of really having really good people in your program. Uh, I, I loved our team we had last year. Absolutely loved being around and coaching, and we had great players. We had great chemistry uh, on and off the court, and you know it makes this it makes this a lot more fun when you're around guys you want to be around and and guys that will work hard every day. Uh, and then you know for us, one of the big things that I learned last year is it's really important to stay healthy. You know we 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 played the last uh, six to eight games last year without two of our starters. Uh, Gabe Dorsey was our leading scorer and lead play went down and missed the end of the season. Noah Collier missed the end of the season. Those two guys were really key guys for us and. You know, I think I looked at, at uh, I think Charleston had like nine guys that played in every game last year or something like that. I mean, the, right. the importance of staying healthy and, and you know, how valuable that is uh, is obviously key to all of us uh, as we head through the season. What do you want to see, Dane, out of Gabe that maybe you didn't see last year? Obviously, he's one of the best shooters, not, not just in the league, uh, but in the country. Uh, what's the part of his game that, that you've challenged him in the offseason? 
Yeah, probably the, the, the biggest thing we've talked about is, is the defensive end. And he's a really smart player on both sides of the ball. He understands positioning. Uh, he's not the best athlete out there, but he's got really good size, knows where to be. Uh, I, I'm imploring him all the time to use his voice more because he always knows where he's supposed to be and usually where his teammates are as well. So, you know, seeing him take that step from a leadership standpoint. Uh, and then offensively, uh, it, it's going to always be about just building his game off of his ability to shoot. And he's one of the best shooters I've ever been around, uh, can get the thing off really, really quickly, can shoot it from deep. Uh, and then it's about being able to to put the ball on the floor a little bit, uh, make you know, whether it's getting all the way to the rim or, or being able to just draw two by putting it on the floor and, and, and make that pass play. But I'm really, really excited uh, about the jump that I think he can make this year. So you, you had Gabe Dorsey. You brought in his brother, Caleb Dorsey. Are there any other Dorseys out there that you're going to go after? Are there any other brothers? Are you going to make this just be a, a full family affair? <laughs> it was it, it, uh, their, their their mom went to Hampton, so we're we're kind of just uh, oh, cornering wow. the market here in this area of the Dorsey. Yeah, so um, but uh, no, I think this is the last one for us. Um, you know, it's funny. I actually, when I was an assistant at Ryder, we actually had two sets of brothers on the same team: uh, a, a sophomore and a senior Thompson. were brothers. Uh, the, se- the senior was Jason Thompson, who obviously was a right. phenomenal player, ended up being a lottery pick, and then. Uh, freshman and junior were, were a set of brothers, so um, I've had the I've had the opportunity to coach coach brothers before. It, it, it's it's a pretty neat thing, and you know I know there's always moments that they have that I'm like, okay, they're having a little sibling thing right here. I gotta I gotta let that be, and uh, and then also know that they gotta be teammates. Who is uh who does is their mother gonna be rooting for when you guys play Hampton? Where where do her, her loyalties lie now? Oh, she's she's green and gold all the way through for sure. <laughs> she better be she better be we've got two different sons on the same team all right last thing i got for you dane what is the you know, we saw growth from your your team last season where do you need to see improvement this year to be able to get up in the mix for top four top three making a run at uh at a caa regular yeah. season title yeah, the biggest thing for us is going to be on the defensive end. Uh, yeah, I thought we made some pretty good strides a couple of year, years ago and then felt like we had to start over again last year. Uh, we got to defend better. I think it's it's pretty simple. We've got a lot of really talented offensive players. Uh, I think we brought in some more firepower from the perimeter. Uh, I imagine we're going to shoot a ton of threes this year. And we got, uh, we, we, we've got we got a transfer guard and, and a sophomore guard that can really get to the basket and, and at- attack the paint. Uh, but it's going to be about the defensive end. And we, we, we've got to be much better on that end. We've got to hold teams to one, be, be a much better rebounding team than we've been. And uh, I think that's going to be a huge key to us as we, as we head into the season. Well, listen, Dane, it's a pleasure. We'll be rooting for you this season. We'll be rooting for uh, – uh, the minimization of sibling rivalries going on uh, within that locker room. Just make sure they both get the same amount of shots. That's what I found with my kids, right? As long as you get them the same thing, you don't have the squabbles. Dane Fisher, William & Mary head coach. Great to see you, man. Thanks, That's right. Thanks, guys. Thanks, thanks for everything you're doing for college basketball, too. It's a lot of fun to watch. Thanks a lot, Appreciate Dane. you, man. Appreciate Thank it, man. That was Dane Fisher, William & Mary head coach. Uh, we are now waiting on Billy Taylor. Um, Elon head coach to uh, to make his appearance. We'll be joined by uh, Commissioner D'Antonio here um, in about eight, Joey nine, D. ten minutes somewhere around. You can there. just call him Joey Before, D if you want, Bob. I know you too know, many like Joey D's. Call, I knew a Joey D in high school. Well, we call I you knew a Joey D in college. All right, all right. Well, we call you Bobby D. And, so and Bobby D and Joey D coming up. I will tell you this. If you knew the Joey D's that I knew back in the day, uh, you would not want to be associated with those, uh, those Joey D's. Um, at about 1150 or so, we will be having John Fanta and Monica Moore jumping on with us as we transition from CAA Men's Media Day to CAA Women's Media Day. John and Monica are uh, two of the best. They're going to bring you the preseason women's all league teams are going to be bringing you the preseason women's uh, uh, poll um, before the season starts. So, uh, Jeff, I want to ask you this. So when you look at this league from the top to the bottom, where do you think it stands in terms of the hierarchy of the other mid-major conferences around the country? 
listen, it, it's up there with the best of them. Again, because a lot of these uh, these mids have a big uh, a big jump, and the bottom really holds them back. You know, for me, you look at you know Monmouth towards the bottom last year. They've had success. Hampton in a different league now, but they've had success. It's just going to take time, and a lot of them, you know, like a Hampton have to figure out the resource part of it, right? Coming in, you know, you're obviously going to have to be competitive. You have to step up in the resource department. And I think it's going to take some time for a buck joiner to be able to get those resources to compete towards the, the, even the middle, middle to certainly the top, but man, it's hard to crack the top right now of this league. Yeah. And, and Charleston is, you can correct me if I'm wrong because you probably know that program better than I do, but it does feel like Charleston is kind of a step above everybody else when it comes to the resources, when it comes to the availability of NIL, when it comes to uh, what they are able to offer, right, in terms of facilities and all of the above. Um, and I, it does feel like this is going to be uh, something where a lot of the teams in the league are going to be chasing Charleston for a while. Do you think that's fair? Yeah, I, I would think so. I mean, again, like Charleston has NIL at a high level for a mid-major. Uh, you get kids to visit Charleston. Plus, now they've got momentum. That That's a hard trio to fight right now, right? NIL is probably the most important factor right now within college uh, basketball in terms of recruiting. And, and they've, again, they've got it more than probably almost any other mid-major, not just in the CA, but the entire country, Rob. Yeah, that's tough you know, to battle so. with when you're when you're another team in a mid major league. Um, uh, the the one thing that I am kind of looking forward to seeing this season is the bigs. There's a lot of really good big guys in this conference, from Ante to Charles yeah. Thompson to uh, to to Amari Williams to um, Jair Davis down at, at Delaware, um, and I do think that uh, when we are talking about being competitive in this conference. Uh, you need big guys. Um, we teased it a little bit earlier. We are now bringing in Elon head coach Billy Taylor in his second season uh, with the Phoenix. Billy, what's going on? I mean, I want to ask you this. So this is not your first time, your first uh, stint being a head coach, um, but you had about a 10-year gap in between. What is different now compared to what it was when you were the head coach at Ball State? Uh, first of all, thank you, uh, Rob and Jeff. Good to see you. Uh, just glad to be on with you guys, have the opportunity to discuss our program here at Elon and what we're doing and how we're building it. And, you know, as you mentioned, you know, things have, have definitely changed. And I, I was fortunate enough to get the opportunity to be with a mentor of mine, uh, Fran McCaffrey, uh, for six years at the University of Iowa, uh, serving in a, in a lot of different capacities. And, you know, really getting an opportunity to work with one of the best offensive minds in the game. I think a lot of times, uh, you know, what, what Fran has done gets a little bit undervalued with the type of players, the type of young men that we have in Iowa and how we develop them. And I think that's something that we were trying to do here at Elon, uh, trying to, to imitate that and, and, and hopefully be able to, to play a style of basketball and develop student athletes uh, to be very successful both on and off the court. All right, Billy. So while we're on the topic of Fran McCaffrey, I hear you do a pretty good uh, impression of Fran. Uh, can, yeah. can, can we get that, please? Like, uh, like, give know, me something good really here. Any, I don't really have anything in my bag for that. Uh, you know, sometimes right. it's, it's not right. language appropriate. Uh, but but Fran is uh, <laughs> he, he's one of the best, and I love him to death. Um, his son Patrick is uh, is my godson, and yeah. very close with Margaret, who I, we were both at Notre Dame together at yeah. the same time. So, uh, very close to their family, love them to death, and uh, I would do anything for them. So there are about thirty seven McCaffrey sons, right? Am I am I right there? Thirty eight, maybe thirty nine. Um, what what was it like uh, seeing that group of boys grow up into being the players that they are now? You know, that was really uh, an amazing experience to be part of that. Uh, we were blessed that our family could go back and and kind of be there for, for Connor and his journey through University of Iowa. Uh, then Patrick, get an opportunity to coach him uh, as he redshirted and then and then kind of went on to, to some of his playing successes. 
uh, Marit, their daughter, and then their youngest, Jack, uh, who is uh, was high school teammates with my son, Savian. Uh, so they grew up together. Uh, so just being around their family and watching how Fran was able to coach his two sons and really the consistency that he brought in coaching his boys. Um, you know, he coached them just as hard as he did anyone else. On and that, uh, that was something that was really impressive to watch, you know, how he led and, and how he was consistent. And now my son's on the team here at Elon. He's a freshman here at Elon. And uh, having the opportunity to have him on our roster and our program uh, is really just an amazing experience. So Max McKinnon, uh, preseason all second team guy. Um, they always say you make you know your biggest jumps from your freshman to your sophomore year. What do you want to see from him this season uh, that maybe you didn't see last year? Yeah, you know Jeff, uh, you know Max was really consistent for us last year. You know he had 17 games where he was in double figures. So when you have a freshman that you know, shows up every night and you can you can say, you know what, we know he's going to produce. Uh, he's going to score the basketball, uh, rebounded the ball, average over five rebounds a game and, you know, high assist guys. So really stuffed the stat sheet. So now for Max, the, the growth will be in his leadership. We still have a, a very young team, uh, you know, 12 of the 16 guys on our roster are freshmen and sophomores, uh, which is, you know, very abnormal in this day and age of college basketball to have that much youth. But, you know, for us, we're, we're trying to build the program. We want to build it the right way. Uh, we were able to get some key transfers that we think will help us, especially at the point guard position, uh, adding some experience. And we've got some other veteran guys that can help us. But I do think that this is a time to see a jump from some of our freshmen last year that got an opportunity to play. And now hopefully we'll, we'll step their games up as sophomores and produce even better. And even as you mentioned it, you know, last year we had a, a, a sophomore, Sam Sherry, that jumped from two points a game as a freshman to nine points and over four rebounds as a sophomore. So, you know, this is the time to see the jump, you know, for a lot of our younger players and then have guys like Sam Sherry also step up for us and, and continue to produce. Last one I got for you, Billy. Um, you, you saw up close and personal what it was like for Fran when he was coaching his son. How are you, what did you learn from there? What experiences are you taking with you now that your son is on the team? Yeah, you know, I, I think what I really enjoyed about that experience, you know, being around Fran and, and, you know, we would be at practice at Iowa and Fran's youngest, Jack, and my youngest, Savian, would be on the side baskets, getting shots up during practice, uh, you know, and, you know, like, hey, boys, you know, ho hold the ball when coach is talking, okay? Let, you know, when coach is teaching, can you guys like, Maybe not like you playing one on one, like, like oh, okay, okay. Um, but you know, for my son and for his boys, they just grew up in the gym. They always grew up around it. So now it, it doesn't really feel entirely different because they've always been in the gym. They've always been in the locker room. They've always been around the players. And um, now you know, again, it's it's just the opportunity that that for my son and his boys, they always look up to the players on the team. Now they are the players on the team. And having that opportunity to remember uh, that people are looking up to you and that you are a role model and the values that we talk about, whether it's being selfless or being accountable, uh, loving your teammates, like people are looking at you and, and they're going to hold you to that standard. So, um, you know, I, I learned a lot. I experienced a lot. And I think it was great for my son to experience that and, and now get an opportunity to be in the locker room with us on the, you know, on the floor with us full time. Hey, Rob, by oh, the way, before Billy. we let him go, before we let him go, Rob, just so you know, if you ever need help with your taxes, Rob, Billy's oh. your guy, former CPA, former CPA. How long has it been? Do you still do your taxes, Billy, or no? Uh, I am embarrassed to say yes, I still do my taxes. Um, I still do them. I still do the taxes in the house. Uh, I take care of that for the family. So um, even though I was on the, the financial statement audit side, I wasn't a tax guy. Uh, I still my, my pride gets in the way and says, you know, what, I, I have to be able to do my own taxes as a, as a former CPA. So I keep that license. I got it somewhere. You know, I can you know, if I have to go back and blow it off, you know, uh, but it, it's, it's great to have that. That experience was amazing. And I learned so much in terms of working in the business world and working with great people. Well, win enough games this year where you're not going to have to worry about that. All right, Billy. Listen, man, it's been a it's been a pleasure seeing you. 
Best of luck to you. Best of luck to your son. Um, and I hope you guys have a great season uh, at Elon this year. Thanks for joining us. Thank you, Rob. Thanks, Thanks Jeff. That was Billy Taylor. We are, uh, before we get to John Fanta and Monica, uh, we're going to be joined by uh, Joey D. Do I have to call him Joey D? Can we, uh, Joey D. <laughs> yes, you have, <laughs> we to, have call to call him Joey that? D. Good man. <laughs> Absolutely. That's Damn the rule. Right. That's law. All right. Listen, D. Joey D, commissioner is. of the CAA. What's going on, man? How we doing? What's up, Joey? Can Joey, you hear us? Gentlemen, can you hear me? Yeah, yeah. We got yep, you. We, we got, got you. you. How are you? All right. We we, we got Joey. Hopefully, hey. he's going to be able to hear us here soon. Here Joey, we go. Are you Joey, here? you got us? us now? There we go. Now I got you. Good afternoon. There we go. All right, perfect, perfect. So you you missed my my rousing intro uh, where Jeff said that we have to call you Joey D, Commissioner of the CAA. So how you doing, man? What's going on? Thanks for being here. I, I'm doing great. Yeah, Joey D is perfect. And thanks for having me. And thanks for all you folks have done for us today on the men's side. I know we're going into the women's side next. Greatly appreciate it. It's been a great day so far. No, this is – it's been a blast. Listen, the one thing I'll say um, – you got really good coaches, you know, they're, they're personable, uh, great X's and O's guys, guys that can recruit. They're, they're honest. Um, I know a lot of them. I've known them for years. Uh, you know, the speedy Claxton's, the Kelsey's, the scaries, the, you know, for, you can go up and down, uh, the list. I, I know it's been a blast for you. Let me start with this, you know, in a world now where, where NIL, transfer portal realignment everything has hit this sport so hard so quickly joe how difficult is it to be a commissioner right now yeah it's not not easy jobs uh, by any stretch of the imagination but i think you hit the nail jeff right on the head uh, you and rob right at the beginning is we're really fortunate within our conference to be dealing with great people right and i think Nine times out of 10, when, when you're dealing with good people that are grounded, you know, care about their institutions, care about the well-being of the game, uh, but most importantly, care about the well-being as, of their student athletes, not only as athletes, but as students. That puts us in a really good spot. We're not going to be able to conquer or solve every single problem. But nine times out of 10, when you're dealing with good people, you're, you're, willing, you're able to navigate and work through most issues that arise. Joey, so last season you brought in four new programs, Stony Brook, Monmouth, Hampton, and North Carolina a and You're bringing in a fifth uh, school this year in Campbell, the Fighting Campbells. Uh, we talked a little bit earlier about what a Fighting Campbell actually is. But uh, I'm curious, okay. as you go through the process of evaluating schools, evaluating athletic departments, evaluating uh, – probably locations, uh, academic profiles, whatever it is, what goes into your consideration when it comes to bringing different teams, different uh, universities into the CAA? Yeah, Rob, you know, that's a great question. There were really three things, three things that we focused on, three main things that we focused on in the expansion process. And, you know, in a, in a world of great instability right now in college athletics. I was really fortunate to be able to work with our presidents and our athletic directors on our expansion initiative to put, I really feel our conference in a position of great stability right now. I mean, there's always going to be changes. You'd be kidding yourself to say that there'll never be another change in the CAA. We know that's going to happen, but I just feel as though we're in a good spot. We can, we can pivot and absorb things as they happen. Uh, as a result of some of the great initiatives we put in place. Specific answer to your question, we looked at things such as, number one, there needs to be a geographic fit, right? When you look at the fact that we've kind of aligned ourselves with great institutions that run up and down the East Coast, uh, we, we do have everybody in basically a geographic quadrant running from Boston to Charleston. Uh, number two, uh, we wanted to be in a situation where all of our institutions were an academic fit within our conference. And everyone we've added, everyone we've added has indeed a great academic prowess. And then lastly, we were looking for institutions that were committed to not only the betterment of their athletic departments, but also committed to the betterment of their student athletes as students and as people. 
And in the institutions that we've added, uh, we have found all of those uh, scenarios to be true. So, Joey, uh, I'm inviting you down, okay? My wife mm -hmm. and I are, are doing the Charleston thing again. We're there from December 7th through January 24th. Uh, we got an extra bedroom. There's a stretch Perfect. there. January 11th, they got Elon. 13th, Monmouth. 18th, Towson. The Kelsey Scary Battle on the 18th. It's a Thursday night. Um, come on down. Come on down and, and hang with us for a little while. Let's do it. Don't that would be tremendous. I'd love that. What did you say? Don't do it. <laughs> <laughs> Don't do it. We'll go to Don't halls. No. We'll, Actually, we'll go to halls. You get a free meal. A free a free meal at halls. You're going to turn that down. Not not like Goodman years. is going to reach for his wallet. Day. That's a lie. That's a lie. He's going to slide <laughs> the check over to you. I will say this though, Joey. If if what you need to do is you need to to pick out a night where Jeff is going to a game. And take his wife out. Like she's delightful. She is definitely the. Uh, I would say that. I would say that if you're going to power rank the Goodmans, it goes Melissa and Talia in tier one right there, and then tier four is probably Goodman. Uh, no, I did want to ask you in all seriousness uh, uh, about tournament expansion. It's something that we've heard um, a lot about uh, this summer specifically. It's, it's something that's kind of been uh, bandied about for years now. What are your thoughts on expanding the field of 68? And I want you to keep in mind all of the branding that we have. <laughs> that is that 68 when you give us. Yeah, might have to become you know, the field, of, the field of something else. Right. But you, you, you guys are going to stay well. If, 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 if we have to change the, the last number, we're, we're all good. We're all good. Yeah. All right. Good. You know, you know, certainly, certainly we would love for there to be more opportunities, but, but we also recognize the complexity surrounding that, right. There needs to, it needs to fit into a timeline. Uh, it needs to, it, as it relates to television coverage and just being able to get the games in. So it's a it's a timeline issue, it's a television agreement issue, and you're also dealing with potentially. I mean, some people could argue this. I think you're dealing with one of, if not the greatest sporting event in the United States, right? Obviously, the Super Bowl is up there, but when you, Super Bowl is one day. When you look at an event that capsulates the country or cap captures the country really for a period of time. It might be the greatest sporting event in America. And if we're going to make decisions to change it, just want to make sure you're making the right decisions and, and the event itself is not being compromised in any way. So, uh, you know, Danny Gavitt does a tremendous job, obviously, overseeing everything for us. We'll, we'll make the right decisions at the right time between Danny, the members of the basketball committee, uh, the commissioners, and other folks that are involved. I have, I have the utmost confidence that we'll make the right decisions when presented with the opportunity to do so. Well, listen, Joey, it's been a pleasure. Um, again, my advice is to uh, stay out of Charleston in the seven weeks when Jeff is there. Um, but uh, but if you do, if you are forced to go, just make sure you leave as soon as the check comes so he'll actually pick it up. Joey D, I'm not. I, I'm, the, I'm contractually obligated to call you Joey D from now on, commissioner of the CAA. We appreciate you being here, man. It's been a blast today. Yeah, thanks, gentlemen. We appreciate the partnership and, and looking forward to what's coming up uh, soon here with John and Monica. So thank you. Awesome. Thank thanks, you. Joe. Appreciate it. As, uh, as Joey D teased it there, we are going to be joined now by the one and only John Fanta and his partner for the women's show, Monica Moore. What's going on, guys? How are we doing, Johnny Fanta? Look, I will say this. Um, he dressed I, up. I am he dressed that up. You Look guys at him. Able to be on here, he looks great. Hey, all I know is, Fanta, you're not out dressing me today. No chance. <laughs> <laughs> Good man, I have seen that jacket on you thirty thousand times. You've not always seen this on me. I I brought out the true. pockets for it today. This is this is CAA Media Day, where we are Listen, raising the game with no the matter CAA. No matter what, none of us are going to look as good as Monica. So it doesn't matter. Monica, uh, love having you on here. I'm sorry that you're going to have to carry Fana for the next three hours, but I can't wait to watch um, some great coaches in this league, both on the men's and women's side. So make, make sure, again, you guys stay tuned, uh, whoever's watching, for uh, the women's version uh, for the next three hours. I'm well, I, will, I will say and, this, Monica. And, uh, go ahead. Do whatever. Just do whatever you can. 
I have a lot of experience doing shows with uh, with Mr. Fanta over here. Sometimes you're gonna have to rein him in. Sometimes you're gonna have to reel him in. So um, I hope that you're I hope that you're ready for that, and I hope that you're prepared for it. No, well, the league speaks for itself. John and I had a fantastic time broadcasting the championship last year. When you have a number seven seed defeat the one, two, and three seeds and win for the first time. I'm not quite sure how we're going to follow that up this year, but very excited to talk with these coaches and see what's in store for us for a great season. All right, well, John, this is me officially handing you the torch, okay? This is your show. This is your world. I'm just living in it. I'm just here. I'm a spectator. Um, it was fun, man. I'm, I, I love the CAA. There's a lot of really fun teams, a lot of really fun storylines in this league. Yeah, it, it's the type of league where it's a four-minute league, which is what, what I mean by that is in this conference, as we've seen in recent years, you get down to the final four minutes of games, and it's going to come down to one, two, three possessions. The coaching in this league is phenomenal. The ability of the conference – to generate a storyline nationally is clear. We saw that last year, as you guys have brought up, with the College of Charleston. And at the top of that league, it, it was just a fantastic season. And on the women's side, we see plenty of parity. So, gentlemen, great show. Loved watching you this morning. And here's to an, an even better afternoon with the women's coaches across the board. I, I'm, I, I can tell you right now, uh, the question asking from Monica Moore is going to be, it's going to be night and day from the, from the last two hours. I can guarantee you that. Good man. Well, it's a very high bar, John. <laughs> yeah, that's putting a lot of pressure on her. <laughs> but, uh, no, I know. I'm really guys. feeling that pressure. All right. Good Thanks, luck, guys. guys. We'll be watching. Thanks, guys. We look forward to it. Welcome you to CAA Women's Basketball Media Day coverage on the Field of 68 Media Network. Hi, everybody. It's great to have you with us. I'm John Fanta. Monica Moore is with me. And let's get right to it. In the CAA, this is a league where last year, as Monica alluded to just a few moments ago, we saw Jenny Boggess's Monmouth Hawks go dancing for the first time since 1983 as a seven seed winning the CAA tournament. It said it all, Monica, about this conference, the parody in it, the drama in it, the fact that they were able to beat Towson, a very well-coached team by Coach Harper, on their home floor to take home the title. And that's where we begin as we unveil the women's basketball preseason poll. Let's get right to it. No surprise, Monica, uh, Towson at the top at number one, Stony Brook, Northeastern, Delaware, Charleston, and that defending tournament champion, Monmouth, rounding out the top six. I'll tee up right here, Monica. What do you see in this preseason poll? What pops up? Well, first of all, you have to take a look at that Northeastern team. That's one I'm really excited about. You have to remember that they finished last season on a nine-game winning streak before they ran into red-hot Monmouth in the tournament semifinals. But they returned so much talent on their squad. They're ones to watch, I think, early on. Stony Brook was one of our newcomers last year. They certainly impressed. And I think that that was one of the biggest storylines last season. All four of the newcomers who came into the league really made big splashes. You think about North Carolina A&T, they went 12 and 6 in league play. That's very difficult to do in this league. I'm expecting big things out of them as well. They returned some key talent. And Campbell, we all have their eye, our eyes on them to see what they're going to do. They're a great team. They've got a good amount of returning talent. You never know what to expect in the CAA. But what I can tell you is there's going to be some big upsets. And come tournament time, as we saw last year, anyone can bring home the crown.
We've got coaches coming up just in a few moments. Amy Mallon, the head coach at Drexel. The Dragons picked to finish seventh in the preseason poll. But I want to get to preseason honors here. No surprise here either. If you followed the CAA last year, you know her name. She is ultra confident in what she could be this season. Kylie Cornegay Lucas of Towson, the preseason player of the year in the CAA. What makes her special? Well, one thing that we saw last year was the defense. She was our conference defender of the year. She is so impressive in her ability to disrupt what other teams are doing. She's a great leader. And my favorite thing about Kylie Cornegay Lucas, she gets better every year. She went from being the conference sixth player of the year to the defensive player of the year to the preseason player that we all have our eyes on. She's a special one. Yes, she is. And you see the rest of the all CAA preseason first team folks some tremendous talent on this list darren artagon is a really intriguing player uh, a big time guard from turkey and she'll be suiting up for northeastern again jada logan of charleston sharice Pittman of stony brook raven preston of elon as well monica I, I think it's interesting you brought up stony brook the fact that they've got sharice Pittman and Gigi gonzalez who's on the all caa women's basketball preseason second team as we take a look at that second team it's clear that the sea wolves have some top tier talent they really do those two players work so well together we saw that combination last year they are a pair that we're looking to see but you see some of the other players on this list you have malia bracon she is one of the best defensive players in the league. Really enjoy watching her play. And then Nyla Young, that's a big storyline. We'll talk a little bit about that later today. We saw her play last year with Hampton. She has moved over to William & Mary. So she's another player that I'm excited to get to continue to watch in this league. Jamima Motema as well on the all-conference preseason second team of Northeastern. It's a Huskies team that won 19 games a year ago. They were right there in the CAA semifinals. Now Priscilla Edwards-Lloyd and her group, they look to keep on building on the success that they've had. And again, they were ones to watch. They got that hot streak, and it was because of all the talent that they had on the roster just gelling at the right time. When you return that many good players out on the floor, I think they're really going to be ones that will hit the ground running as this season progresses. When you think about this league, and the identity of it and, and what we saw last year in the conference tournament. What comes to mind? The first is the coaches. And I think this is probably some good foreshadowing for what we're gonna have because this league has some of the most phenomenal coaches, not just in terms of the X's and O's, but the caliber of the leadership. And I think that we saw that in the tournament. You saw teams just continuing to rise and rise. You would see the coaches on the sidelines making adjustments, really giving the players the game plans that they needed, the encouragement and motivation that they needed. When they would encounter adversity, you would see the coaches working so hard on the sidelines. These are just tremendous people who are leading these teams. That was one of my favorite storylines, one of the biggest things to watch. We have a couple of new coaches coming into the conference, excited to meet them, to see what they're going to do with their clubs this season. And I think the other thing is just the players. The players really come together on the court, support each other so well. There's great chemistry between these teams. And again, the upsets that we saw they were really exciting to watch. We know we're going to get some big ones. And then I guess the last thing that I will foreshadow and we'll talk about with some of the coaches, you look at some of these non-conference schedules that these teams are playing. Oh, my goodness. They are really challenging themselves in the early goings. And they're going to bring all those skills and learning experiences that they get from that non-conference schedule into league play. These teams are going to be ready to go. It is going to be a knockdown, drag out fight to the finish to see how we end up come tournament time. You talked about it, new CAA member Campbell. We'll get to them, but let's get right to it here, folks. We're going to start with the Drexel Dragons. This was a 21 team, 21 win team a year ago. They've had six consecutive seasons of 20 plus wins, and their head coach has been a fixture with this program. She's one of the great ones. Amy Mallon is joining us to tip off CAA Women's Basketball Media Day coverage on the field of 68. Amy, a pleasure to have you with us. How are you? I'm um, so excited to be here. Of course, you know, this is the time of the year. All the coaches are working hard and excited to 
um, you know, talk about um, the players and the staff that's working so hard to get, get you ready for the season. So, so excited to be here. Good to see you too. Coach, I know one of the things that your program is so proud of, and we see it all the time, is how these players progress throughout your program. We saw it with Kishana Washington, just got better every single year. Can you talk about some of the players that we're going to see this winter who you think have made those big progressions just that your program has come to be known for? And I love that you said that because that's something that always comes to mind. Um, you know, the conversations we've been having is, you know, Kashana Washington obviously graduated, but I think what you said, a lot of people forget that she was in the program um, for her whole career, you know, and a lot of times I, I heard, I would hear, uh, well, where did you get her? I said, well, she's been here, you know, she, she developed and she certainly uh, was a, a prime example of someone who developed throughout her time in her program. And, and that said, I'm, I'm really excited. You know, I think, you know, people forget that we have had a Satman back, you know, as a fifth year who's been part of our, um, obviously our success, um, on the court for over the last four years. And so to have her back as a grad, we always say it's like an adult in the room, you know, she's continued to grow and develop and do the things that we know she's capable of doing um, within our program to be successful. So I'm really excited because her growth has been tremendous. And, um, you know, another, you know, we have a few other players back, Chloe Hodges, who um, came off the bench for us last year and really had some great minutes for us, especially towards the end of the season. She's another one who just continues to, like you said, develop work. We, you know, one of the things we were able to do this summer is go to Ireland. So that gave us a little extra time to see that development and that growth on the floor. She, she's definitely one to keep an eye on. Grace O'Neill, one of her all uh, rookie selections last year. You know, she's a worker. You know, I always say she she epitomizes a point guard in our program. Some of her all-time greats, Hannah Nihill, Megan Creighton, um, that you've seen play. She, she's the same mentality. You know, she's continuing to work and really lead our team you know, on and off the court with her work ethic and just her commitment to getting better as a player. So I definitely see those three really making some strides. I mean, we have some other seniors back in Jasmine Valentine and um, Aaron Sweeney, but people have been part of the growth in our program. And one thing I always say about Drexel that I love, most of the reasons someone might not be happy is because of playing time, but that's usually something that happens by the time they finish. So they're, they're great leaders in the sense they can, they can actually form the team and the culture by just saying, hey, you keep working you're going to get on the floor because it, it does happen. Coach, you mentioned that trip to Ireland. I'm so jealous. Just from reading about it on your website, it sounds amazing. Can you give us a couple of the top highlights of that trip for your team? Yeah, I'd say, uh, you know, we, we were able our last night to have a farewell dinner um, at through one of our, um, you know, alums, the Rose family, and they set up, we were able to do Celtic dancing, have private dancing with um, two dancers from, River dance, And so if you know that show or the Irish dancing goes on, it was really like a memorable moment because we all got up, you know, and they said this is the first time we have everyone in the group that wants to get up and participate. But everyone at some point got up and learned some dancing. Um, we had, we just had a great, it's hard to explain the, the amount of things you do in a short period of time, but those memories you make with, you know, if you have like 40 people on the trip, it's like a once in a lifetime thing. How often are you going to be in another country with a group of people that are all really on the same page with um, what you're doing and really have that opportunity. And I'd say that's probably one of the memorable moments. We got to do some of the things. Um, one of the things we did, we got to go to the Blarney Stone. And, um, you know, the tradition or one of the things of, about the Blarney Stone is if you kiss the Blarney Stone, it gives you the gift of gab. So uh, we often say some some needed to do that and some didn't, you know, on the trip. So we, um, uh, you know, we laugh about that, but just some really great memories overall. You know, we had a bonding and obviously just a really young roster in different ways with some additions. Um, it was a great time for us to bond and do the things we need to do, you know, going into the trip just to get ready um, for the season. Amy, you welcome in a transfer from Villanova in Brooke Mullen. And the college basketball follower out there may wonder, Wait, is is she related to? Yes, she's Chris Mullen's niece, coming yes, over uh, from Villanova and coming to play for Drexel. Do you see some similarities in that jumper? I mean, it's got to be part of the Mullen genes. And what can she bring to the table? Um, uh, yes, I definitely. I, I think she she's someone who um, you know I kind of said about Hedda being a being a, a fifth year gives you like an adult in the room with some younger ones, and I think she's bringing that aspect in so many ways. And um, she's such a team player, you know, and I think it's something she had with her experience at her prior school 
which obviously, you know, there's so many connections with us, but so bringing her in and having her step in and really just do, it, it's the same thing. I had a conversation with a player in the past that we had that come in from another school. She just wanted to impact the program and she's certainly going to do that, you know, in, in her approach to making the team better and doing what's best for the team and doing whatever it takes for the team to win. But she does. I like that jumper. I'll, I'll take that jumper any day, you know, knocking down shots and, and the threes and the things she can do. Um, I'll definitely take. And, and I think just that competitive mentality, you know, and I, I know a lot of people, we, we know, you know, um, her uncle, but um, some might not, but I remind them, you know, that competitive mentality of not wanting to lose. We know that goes a far, a, a long way. And we're certainly um, really excited about Brooke Mullen on the roster this, this year. You know, don't, I, I'm not going to have you short yourself here on our show, because for those who don't know, Amy Mallon is a CAA great on the hardwood. I, with the <laughs> Richmond Spiders, I wish we had some of the old, some of the footage here that we could break out. 1990, 1991, back-to-back -back conference championships. You were on the all-defensive team in 1991. And I guess that, that makes me think, number one, Wow, what a playing career for you. You, you went on to, to play a little bit professionally, of course. But number two, you've been embedded with this league, both as a player and a coach. What's the CAA mean to Amy Mallon? You know, I think you, you know, I, I keep forgetting everyone's like, what What year is this? My 20th year as a coach um, in the CAA, right? So then you go back to, I do have in my office, I'm, I won't say to you, but you know, my CAA championship, um, the first one we had, you know, the because that was the first CAA championship for Richmond at the time. And it was a huge moment because we upset James Madison, who was a constant, you know, not only rival as a coach here, but as a player and just the, the great teams that have been in the CAA that you, you were able to compete with. And when, when I think back to that, it, it's like full circle, you know, I, to be to still be able to coach in the CAA and um, have had that experience of what it's like to win a CAA title and, and do those things. And, and, you know, like the all conference teams, we are a defensive team. You know, it's one of the things we've been since I, um, started coaching here at Drexel is, is definitely, I think, one of our staples, you know, as far as like being in the top of the league and scoring defense is really a priority for us. Um, so that I'm so proud of, you know, and I think I take pride in the fact that I had an opportunity to play in this league and now continue to coach. And it's always evolving, obviously, with the addition of teams and um, those those rivals are still there. But ultimately, you know, it, it was one of the things when we won our first CA championship in 2009. It was definitely, you know, the last time a team had won since Old Dominion was Richmond, the team I played on. So that was like a really cool like line that year we won, you know. So um, I think those things um, for me, I, I do. It, it's special, you know. It's special for me to continue coaching, and obviously being at Drexel is just a place where I want to continue to um, see us sustain some success and hopefully, but also the competition in this league, as as we know, um, with the new teams, you know, and, the, and some of the challenges um, that, that we're getting. You're, you're seeing across the board. Just um, everyone coming in, ready to get in. That's what I'm excited about most of the season. I don't know if we have time for one more question, but Coach John already alluded to the fact that you've had six consecutive 21, uh, 20 win seasons. And I know that sets the bar high. I know as a player, you want to live up to that culture in your program every year. That's a lot of responsibility. It can be a little intimidating. So I wanted to ask about how the team is, is looking at that streak and, and what their goals are to try to continue the tradition. Um, great question. You know, I think that is one of the things where being here so long, I've never taken for granted, you know, the where we started um, in, in my first year and where we are now. And I think it's 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 one thing that I'd say our academic person or one of our administrators, she's done a great job. And, you know, we've, you know, I, I, I take so much pride in us getting the back to back, the back CA academic awards, you know, and I think I was talking to her about that exact thing. And, you know, she said, Amy, she says, you have to match the success. Just, you keep following it. You just have a different group every year. And that's really our theme this year. You know, we look at it like we, we know what it takes. You know, we've done it. And we have a whole different group, you know, and we, we did lose a lot of production from the, what you see on the paper, but we know what it takes. So if we can follow that map to success and just continue, you know, it's like ways it's taking a detour, you know, maybe some things change a little bit different, you know, things on your roster, but I think we'll get there. And I think with this group, I'm, I'm excited to prove that, you know, we're, we're not looking right now at like, you know, where we've been um, from the beginning of the last three years, even the last four, but I think we can get there. And I think this group is really um, motivated. To, to prove that so i think and it will be like we've always done it as a team you know and that's one of the things i you know i'll go back to our 2018 team kelsey lidge we won the ca uh, regular season title we lost three starters three thousand point scores 
her senior year. And she said, you know what? No one's expected to do anything. We're going to find a way to win. And, and we did that year. So I think she sets, you know, that example in 2018 is, is to me, this team, you know, if they, we can find a way, I think we will. So we're just going to keep doing what we do and um, hope that paves, you know, the path, you know, to where we need to be. So. When you talk about consistency among women's basketball programs in the CAA, the Drexel Dragons define exactly that. They are a consistent winner, and that's because Amy Mallon lays a terrific culture, and we look forward to seeing that play out again with the Dragons, who will aim for a seventh consecutive 20-plus win season. Another WNIT appearance last year. We'll see what they could do this year. Amy, thanks so much for the time. Loved catching up with you. Best of luck this season. Thank you so much. It was great seeing you, too. Take care. Coach. Awesome. Amy Mallon. Monica, it's clear talking with her, the way that she glows about her program, it's really, really special. And you talk about great coaches. We're going from Amy Mallon to someone who's won 41 games in her first two seasons with Stony Brook. We're talking to Ashley Lankford right now. Stony Brook coming off of an 18 win season. Coach Langford entering year three at the helm, and she's got talent. Sharice Pittman is on the All CAA preseason first team. Gigi Gonzalez is on the second team. So, Ashley, looking at, at the way that you've built this program thus far, heading to year three, 41 wins in the first two years, what has the foundation entailed? Well, what's up, guys? How are we doing? That's a long day today, huh? yeah this is it's the best time right everyone's excited we're popping it's it's great uh no we we just do what we do all right our identities we defend we rebound and we run and we're just constantly every day just working hard to get better um taking it day by day and we just challenge them every day with that so um we try to have fun while we're doing it and mixing things up in practice and whatnot to keep them motivated but um i'm excited about the year Coach, just looking at your non-conference slate, you have some challenges in there. Of course, the one that jumps off the page that you're going to go play against a Big Ten school, Minnesota. You're really going to test this team before they go into league play. Can you give us your impressions of that schedule and where you think that's going to help this team get ready to make the impact that I think everyone is expecting out of Stony Brook this year? Yeah, I mean, that was the that was the point of the schedule, right? We, we want to play, you know, top tier competition right and that will prepare us for the league but yeah going to minnesota is going to be a challenging environment i mean we open up with columbia at home and everybody knows how good columbia is um you know we've got buffalo on the schedule this year too so we want to be challenged early i think you're going to learn a lot about yourself when you when you have those challenges you know in uh november and december that's what we're looking for so that we're ready you know going into caa which is a really good league in itself and we're gonna have a battle every day you know every friday and sunday so uh, i'm happy with the non-con uh we'll find a lot about our women in those first 11 games which i'm excited about coach obviously john's already mentioned it you have Gigi gonzalez returning and the numbers from last season absolutely speak for themselves 133 assists 60 steals just averaging 12.5 points per game. She does a little bit of everything and obviously a leader out on the court as well. What have been her biggest focuses in the off season to prepare to help lead this team this year? You said Sharice Pittman or Gigi? Oh, Gigi. Out. Okay. Gigi Gonzalez. Uh, I mean, Gigi's a, she's a fifth year, fifth year senior. Um, she's been the starting point guard for me ever since I've gotten here. And she's tremendous to our success. She gets us going on the offensive end. She's feisty on the defensive end. Um, and she makes highlight plays. They, they get us going. I mean, I, she averages, that's a kid that averages one ESPN top 10 play a year. So uh, she's exciting. And, and I trust her tremendously. And her teammates trust her as well. And we'll, we'll ask the same question. Sorry, John, about Sharice Pittman, because that that's another one that everyone has their eyes on. I'm already thinking of them as the dynamic duo in terms of what they bring to the floor. So can you talk about her progression, what she's looking to do this year in terms of making a statement with this team? 
Yeah, Reese, Reese is just solid for us. Um, everyone looks at her as like the cool, calm, and collected one. Uh, but she's done a really good job this offseason, and she's expanded her game. She's shooting it much better from three, which helps us uh, space the floor on offense. Uh, and then she gets to play a little bit more of her natural position at the power forward and not always the five in the center So because we have Kari Clark now. So I think she's excited. I think you're going to see a little bit more versatility with her. I'll be on the perimeter and being able to knock down that three. I'm excited for her. Ashley, when you look at, at the offseason in this sport, there is no such thing, uh, as, sure. as we all know. It, it's nonstop. I'm curious, when you've got these returnees that are high-impact players and you're scanning the transfer portal, what are you and your staff exactly looking at? Who is a Stony Brook player? And how do you identify the right fit versus somebody who might just – collect or accumulate numbers? Sure. I mean, I don't know if I have the exact formula, right? But it's uh, moving pieces all the time, right? So, you know, we, like I said before, Sharice was paying a lot of five last year. So we really wanted to get another post player that could come in right away and give her some flexibility to move to her natural position. So that was like a, a aim for us in the transfer portal. And we were able to come up with Kari. Um, and then we knew we were losing Annie Warren, who was a knockdown shooter from three, right? So we kind of needed to replace that. And we got Victoria Keenan with that and a sharp shooter from Seton Hall. So those were the two immediate needs that we we fell and then after that we just kind of went for best available and knowing who we were losing and kind of what we wanted so uh, but that's on the court right but we got to recruit and I'm big on getting to know people and, and their families and who they are and you know for me you got to work hard you got to work really hard you got to love the game of basketball and you got to be coachable and if you can do those three things then I pretty much know that you'll probably make it with us all right and you'll fit our culture because that's what we already have here we've got a great group of women who are eager to learn who who want to just get better every day and who work hard on a consistent basis and they're great people what did you learn last year about caa women's basketball that you apply to the 23 24 campaign well on any given night <laughs> it could be anyone's game i'll tell you that there wasn't it, the parody, I mean, it was a, it was a competitive league last year. Um, obviously, I was in the league before with JMU, but, um, you know, re-entering it again, I was reminded of just how any given night you got to be ready to go. There's talented teams, um, you know, playing on the road is tough. And, and yeah, you just got to be prepared and, and bring your best effort every night because you, you just never know. Coach, you've already talked about some of your transfers coming in. You also have Zeta Gonzalez, who I know got a little international experience um, that she's going to bring into the program as well. Can you talk about when players get those opportunities and how that helps them come back and contribute almost at a different level because they've had that experience? Sure. I mean, they're playing against pros. They're playing against the best players in the world, right? And and also on their team. Okay, so it gives them another challenge uh, to, to see where they stand and on different venue, right? So. I always let our players do that. Nighty Vargas Reyes did it last year. India Pagan has done it as well. So, and when they come back, they have a different sense of confidence, right? Um, and I think that helps them and it pushes our team. So Zeta was able to do that and it's awesome. And I, I think it's a great opportunity for all of our athletes to be able to get that exposure. And they go to pretty cool, you know, countries too, that helps. <laughs> Absolutely. And Coach, my, my last question for you, obviously, a lot of people have very high expectations for this team and, and you guys are one to watch. Is there a word, a phrase, something that the, the team has as their mantra this year that you guys are going to be repeating a lot or something you can share with us about what, what that kind of mindset phrase or word is? Yeah, consistent and persistent. That's all we're preaching. So every day, be consistent in everything that you do, right? And then when it gets hard, you got to continue to be persistent with that. So that's every day we're saying those two words, and, and that'll carry us all the way through. Look, Monica, we're talking to the Tulane Green Waves all-time leader in career assists with 722. And I've got to ask you, Coach Langford, do you ever – get back out on the hardwood and, and get into five on five with your team because I, I still think you've got game. I do still have game. I can still dish out dimes. That's a fact. Okay. Now I don't get out there and defend unless I know exactly what we're working on. All right. Getting in a stance is a little difficult. All right. But no, I, I get out there on the offensive at any time and show them and it, it's fun.
one on one with CG Gonzalez is is in the cards or is not in the cards? I mean, these are the hard hitting questions that come to you on media day. Yeah. So a long time ago in my coaching career, I decided if I think a player can beat me one on one, I never challenge them to it. Okay. And so she's one of them. <laughs> All right. So I don't play GG in one on one unless we're working on an individual workout and I know exactly what we're doing. We're doing the jab series. You can only use these moves. Other than that, I'm not playing her. <laughs> my takeaway from that is Ashley Langford never lost. Never lost. That's, that's, that's the right Undefeated. mentality. Undefeated. 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 Coach Lanford, thanks for the time. Thanks for having some fun with us. Best of luck to you and your Thank team you, this coach. upcoming year. Appreciate it. The head coach of the Stony Brook Seawolves in year two in the CAA last year. We were able to see Stony Brook, Monmouth, Hampton, North Carolina A&T come into the league. Now Campbell will be joining to uh, fill out the CAA, a 14-team league. It'll be fascinating to see how Campbell fits in. We continue on here on CAA Women's Basketball Media Day with Robin Harmony, the head coach of the Charleston Cougars. Now, Charleston is a team that was picked to finish fifth in the women's basketball preseason poll. They did receive a first place vote. So, Coach Harmony, it's great to have you with us. It, it immediately stands out how much you bring back to Charleston. What's that like to have roster continuity? And how much is this group fired up to try to turn things around after last year? Absolutely. We have all of our starters back and four new players, three freshmen and a transfer. And our kids are, are really good. We're deep this year. They're excited about, you know, getting on the court and competing. Um, you know, last year we were picked second. And when we lost our point guard to ACL, you know, we were just trying to get the ball over the court, you know, over half court. We lost probably four or five games by, you know, a couple of points that, you know, we lost in the last five minutes of the game due to the fact that we didn't really have a true, true point guard. So. We're excited to have Jenna back. She's full go. She's 100, and, you know, she's ready to, to get it done for us. Coach, I think I, I speak for every fan in this league that we are all so happy that Jenna Anna Carico is going to be back out on the floor this year. We missed her. We're glad she's back. Now, I know that sometimes at least, and I, I know in her case, athletes turn these things into a positive because they spend that time when they're not able to play on the floor, really developing their game, learning, almost sometimes becoming coaches. Can you talk a little bit about how she has used that time to make her an even better great than we have already seen her be on the floor? Yeah, I think that was the hardest part for her is sitting and watching. But, you know, her future, hopefully, she doesn't change her mind. She wants to be a coach. Um, but, you know, she watched every single game, whether it was on TV when we traveled or at home on the bench, and she was, you know, giving them – pointers and you know helping our team get better just just because of her competitive nature um but you know her game is pretty solid it really is she can you know score at three levels the the three ball off the bounce finish with contact the only thing that i would kind of yell at her almost every other day for is she doesn't shoot enough she's not selfish enough she wants to feed everybody else before she feeds herself so if we can talk her into doing that this year make sure she gets her 20 plus points it will really make a big difference to our team. Coach, I also wanted to ask you about Alexis Andrews, because I saw on your website that she won a special award within the athletics program, the, the Coug Awards, I think they're called. Yeah. She was the top newcomer, not just for basketball, but across the sports, I think for the women's sports. I think that must be a very big honor just to be recognized for your contributions coming in as a rookie. Can you talk a little bit about her year last year, her progression this year, and just what she means to the program? Well, she, she's made a big impact on our campus as far as being a regular student, student athlete, great grades, never have a problem with her. Um, you know, and everybody loves her. She's real quiet, but she goes to work every single day. Um, on the court, she's actually really worked on her game as well and is is going to be really good to help us and and definitely is in the starting lineup. And it's, it's, it's tough to keep her out. She's so quick and, you know, she can just flat out play. And she helps us with our defensive schemes. In the in the past, we always say that we hang our hat on defense, but we didn't really have the personnel to play our style that we wanted to. But now we have it. Now we're going to be 10 deep, 
and Lex is a big part of that 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 head of it to to really get our defense going and that that pressure that we give. Um, she she's just relentless. She never wants to come out of the game. She gets hit. She gets her ear ripped. She's still back in there playing. Um, but we can already see that it's really hard to believe that she's still only a sophomore because she plays like an upperclassman, a junior or senior. So it, it is nice to have her on the court. She helps Jenna. We get in trouble bringing the ball down the floor. Um, she can knock down a three at will. And it, she's just a great kid. And it was a really good get that we got her. Um, not a lot of people really recruited Lex out of high school, you know, an AAU ball. But, you know, she had a few. But we just knew that she was going to be a big piece of our future and, and making us be successful this year as well. Robin, I look at your journey and I'm fascinated by it. You spent 18 years on the staff of the University of Miami. You, you've been in coaching for four decades. How have you seen women's basketball in general grow? And when you think about your why, your coaching journey, what, why you do this day in and day out, how that's evolved through the years and the state of the sport right now, what comes to your mind? Well, I think that when we look at the WNBA and if you watch the game last night, it was great competition and, you know, it goes down to the wire. It is the social media. It's having the, the professional league that our players can go into afterwards. They don't necessarily have to go overseas, which is not, you know, it's a great experience, but it's not the exposure that they deserve. So having that, it's just seeing our game getting better and better. We are competing with our men. Um, you know, men have kind of set the tone of everything that happens on TV, social media, and we have women's side has finally joined in and we are getting the exposure that we need to the NIL money, things like that, that is happening to women's basketball. It's just making us grow. And, you know, if we could just keep going in that direction, it's great. You know, add some more WNBA teams to give these guys that future that they, you know, definitely get their degree definitely go on with their lives. But the ones that want to play ball, it'll be out there for them to do. So that really does help. Um, you're not going to ask me about playing one-on-one -on -one or anything with my team, because if I do, I'm definitely going to win uh, because I'm going to trip them. You know, it's, it's, it's this way it goes. Um, but, you know, I've been doing this for a long time and you have to have great players. You have to have, you know, really good coaches helping you to be successful. And that's, you know, the teams that win, that's what they have. Coach, we haven't even talked about Jada Logan yet, which is another player that we have to mention. What she did last season was really impressed with everything she did out on the court. I know people have high expectations for her. Where have been her focuses in the off season and where the most did you see that growth and development last year with everything that she was able to do? Well, Jada played out of position all last year by running the point guard. She is not a point guard. She didn't like it. Um, but she did it just because we really needed somebody that had a bigger, stronger body that could get the ball down the floor. And, you know, we ask a lot of that kids. We ask her to score 20 plus points, be our leader. Um, she, she was, her natural position is like a three, four, you know, where she can rebound and she can bang. But, you know, now with her playing and in the right spot, she's really worked on her three point shot because she didn't like to take it last year. And when she did, we had to, you know, force it. Now, when she's open at the three, she's going to jack it. You know, the other day in practice, she went five for five, and it was just butter. Um, so it's kind of what is going to help her now where if we do have to get some help bringing the ball down the floor, we get pressed, or she can run the fast break, and her three ball is much better. We already know what she can do off the bounce. She's really hard to stop because she's crafty, and she's going to make that counter move, and she puts the ball in the bucket. So having her and Jenna – um, we're going to have that one-two punch where, you know, and we still haven't really even talked about Annika McGarity, who can just shoot. She's going to also make sure that somebody's going to be on her 24-7 because you leave her open, she's going to knock it down. So we do really have a strong starting five and a supporting staff that, you know, I can start two different lineups and it'd probably be pretty good. That's got to help your practices, right? It does. And this year was the very first year that last year we had one practice player, uh, but it was hard for us to find male practice players in Charleston that wanted to give up their time. And, you know, if they weren't student athletes, we, you know, obviously we couldn't use them if they were on another sport. 
and we found five guys that really can flat out play. Um, I'm trying to keep them away from Pat Kelsey because he could steal two of them. They're really, you know, good players. So we go against them every single day, and that doesn't wear out our kids where we can do rotations, the first five, then the second five, and then mix a team. So they are helping us get a lot better really quick um, just because they're, they're strong, they're quick, and, and they're ballers. They really are. So that was the, I think, the missing piece that we never had before as, as far as going against somebody better than us every single day. All right, where's your favorite spot to go in downtown Charleston? Uh, we're talking food. We're going to be foodies. Um, of course, say if we say food, If it's food, it's going to be Hank's um, Seafood. If it's steak, it's going to be Hall's. Um, and you can't go wrong, but there's so many great restaurants. There's so many things that you can do here as far as go to the beach, just hang out, walk King Street. Um, if, if you're bored in Charleston, there's something wrong with you because there's just so much to do. I, I think we should have our Ronald conference Marshall. tournament here. Every single year. What do you guys think? You guys think? <laughs> Coach, don't put us on the spot like I that. Know. But don't put us. I'll tell you this much. There's not unpopular. a better. There's a lot of coaches on this call if we take a position on that one. <laughs> yeah, Coach, you're know, asking us. It's great, though. It's great that we're, what we're doing it in Washington with the men. Uh, that's going to make our, our conference even that much better. Really will. Well, Robin, we appreciate your time, and we're excited to see you this season. And, yes, what we can say is this. Charleston is absolutely beautiful. It is the perfect place yeah. for anyone to go. And uh, I, yeah. if I'm a recruit, uh, that visit has to be very pleasant. Uh, and I very much yeah, am not a recruit, but that, that, that area is just awesome. We wish you the best of luck this season. Appreciate it. Thanks, guys. Thanks, Coach. There she is. Robin Harmony, applying some pressure to us, Monica. I know. Asking us the big questions. We're the ones that are supposed to be asking the questions. <laughs> well, let's keep asking those questions. Now to someone who really came into this conference last year and in year one aaron dickerson davis led william and mary to 18 wins the most by a first year head coach in william and mary women's basketball history 12 caa wins by the tribe it matched the record for the most in a single season aaron dickerson davis second year head coach of the tribe is with us now aaron great to see you what did you take away from your group in, in year one and in, in putting those bricks down that now you try to build on here this upcoming season? Yeah, I think my last year's crew really just built the foundation that we needed to find a way to sustain some success here at William & Mary. Um, it was not an easy road. You know, the people that followed us last season knows that our non-conference was a bit of a struggle. We started conference playoff. Um, not our greatest, but, you know, my kids, they just stayed the course. They knew that it was a process, and they they bought into that process every single day. And I really do believe that they laid that foundation. They had fun. They worked harder than they've ever worked before. And now my newcomers, and uh, they, they see that. They see what what was built uh, in year one, and, and now they don't want to lack in year two. Coach, I'm going to pick up on your word of laying the foundation, because obviously if you look at your roster, you lost a lot of talent from your squad last year. But the name to me that jumps off the page is Rebecca Frisbee-Smith, because I have to imagine that in terms of maintaining that foundation, that culture, really bringing that leadership into your program, she's a name at the top of the list. So can we talk about everything that she brings to your program? Rebecca Frisbee Smith is literally the player that you hope to build your culture like she literally did everything that we asked her to do from day one she bought in she fought every single day and you guys have seen her play she's literally fighting on the court um you know at some points her body is so banged up because she's throwing her body around she's on the ground she's taking charges she's rebounding she's pressing she's always in the mix um we're just so lucky to have her her energy on the floor you guys know she's gonna hit a three and she's gonna go crazy and 
and our whole team just kind of takes that energy um, from her as well. So we're so excited to have her back and really leading this group. And then we've also had some other upperclassmen that have stepped into that leadership role. You know, they tasted winning last year and they never want to go backward. And, and I'm just super proud of them. And really stepping into to big shoes, you know, everybody knows they had big shoes to fill and, and they're working every day to do that. Coach, we see this a lot where there are players who've had great experiences at the programs that they're at and they want to transfer for a new experience to just add more depth and more layers to their game. And we kind of see that happen with your program this year with Nyla Young coming in. We watched her play last year. We loved seeing her on the court at Hampton. But I think that says a lot about your program that she thinks William and Mary, seeing what they do is a place that I would like to go and evolve my game. Can you talk a little bit about adding her into the mix and what she's bringing to your roster? Oh, absolutely. I mean, Nyla brings experience. She brings experience overall, but also within this league. Um, she knows what post play is like in this league and how to be successful at it. She had an amazing year, first year in the league for her last year. Um, she has mixed into our team so well. Like you would never know that she was a newcomer. And she just adds a level of post play that we did not have last year. You know, uh, my, my post players were more stretch and we were trying to put them in the block and that's not really where they succeeded best. Whereas Nyla, she just has, we talk about her having a deep bag all the time, right? Like she can go in the post, she can spread out to the three point line, she could ISO at the elbows and the short corners. She's a great passer. She's been working on her shot um, and, and the confidence in taking that three pointer, which you know we love to take. So, I mean, she has just come in and she's made an impact right away. And, and I really do believe that she'll continue to impact throughout the season. We're, we're grateful to have her. Aaron, I love the fact that, that we're talking to you with a great backdrop. So I'm putting you on the a spot. First off, is, are you talking to, you, to us from your office? Yes. <laughs> What's behind you there? I see a quote. I, I wanted to see always something right over your other shoulder. Oh, always wear your invisible crown. Always wear your invisible crown. What's the meaning behind that? Yeah, you know, I talked to my girls when we first got here just about empowering women and, and really getting them to open up and use their voices. Um, we have a couple different leadership committees within this team just because I am a firm believer that we have to use sport to empower our young women to be leaders, to be CEOs and presidents and own their own businesses. And, you know, I never want them to lose sight of that. You know, we're going to have good days. We're going to have bad days, but there's a crown up there. Like you're still a queen regardless. And we have a we have an opportunity to bounce back from whatever adversity hits us so uh, i just put that up there just as a reminder to my girls like you got this like we're queens and we're gonna figure this out together coach i also saw dream big written on something behind you and i know that that is something that you talk about and that's going to lead me into my next question i'm looking at your non-conference schedule you've talked about last year your team really learned a lot, I think, going through the non-conference schedule. This is a challenging schedule when you look at the names on this list. Obviously, you play a lot of local teams, a lot of teams within the state, Virginia, Virginia Tech, James Madison, also play Navy. Can you talk about that schedule and how you think that's really going to help you prepare your team for conference play? I mean, last year we were one game out of tying for first and one game out of being eighth or ninth right? That's how tough the league is. And we love that about this league. We love that every single night, it is just super competitive. And you just, you don't know what you're going to get. You know, it's literally a dogfight every night. And I think the only thing to truly prepare us for the dogfight, the conference is going to be, is to is to fight dogs in the non-conference. Um, so we are, we're starting with Norfolk State. You know, they went to the NCAA tournament, they won their league, and, and they have dogs. And so now we just have to figure out how to string some wins together. I, I do believe that if we can fight through this non-conference schedule, that we have a real shot at being good in the league. But the only way to learn how to fight a dog is to fight other dogs. And so that's, that's what we're doing this year with our non-conference schedule. What do you think is the biggest thing 
that you're stressing your team right, stressing to your team right now in practice, that has to translate earlier in the season? Because I'm sure there are things that are going to gradually come. You're a different team in February and March than who you're going to be on November the 6th. But if there's something that you definitely want to see from this group, right from the get-go, what does it need to be to be able to compete and win? For me, it's confidence. And I think that we didn't gain confidence last year until later. And when we gained that confidence, then we, we won basketball games, right? I think that our confidence dictates everything. It dictates our ability to defend, to rebound, to score against tough opponents. Um, and I do think that we wavered in that a lot last year. You know, we were very, very senior dominant with Riley and Sid and Bree, um, and, and they carried it. I mean, Sid was as confident as it got. <laughs> Um, and and she still had hard days. And I think that if we can be confident that we can actually compete, no matter who it is we're playing against, no matter what history says that we've lost to this team before or whatever it may be, then I think that we're going to be in a good spot. We'll be better defenders. We'll be more efficient scorers. But if we come out and we're unsure, if we ever come onto that floor and we're like, I don't know, I don't know if we can win this game, I don't know if I'm good enough to compete with these with these teams, then we're gonna struggle. And so if we can just come out every single day, like we're supposed to be here, we're supposed to be at the top, or we're supposed to be where we wanna go, we're supposed to reach our, our goals, then I think we'll be in a good spot. Whereas last year we set goals and we had a lot of people that didn't know if we could reach them until the very end. We won games and they're like, oh, maybe we can do this, right? So that's what I hope we show this year that we're a, a building team for sure. Like we're absolutely rebuilding, but we're also confident in what we're building and we know that it's gonna click. We just have to trust the process. Well, Aaron, great to be with you and congratulations on a really successful First season, William and Mary going to the CAA tournament semifinals, 18 wins on the year, top four finish in the league. And we wish Coach Dick, Dickerson Davis and the tribe the best here in year two. Coach, thanks for the time. Thank you so much, thanks, guys. Coach. Absolutely. So there she is, the head coach of William and Mary, Aaron Dickerson Davis. Let's get to the Towson Tigers. We're going to be hearing from associate head coach Christy Rogers in a few moments. But before we do that, we got a chance to talk with preseason player of the year in the CAA, known for her defensive tenacity, reigning defensive player of the year in the league. Now she's the top preseason honoree in this conference. It's Kylie Cornegay Lucas of Towson. Here's our Field of 68 exclusive conversation. She is the reigning CAA Defensive Player of the Year, was on the All-CAA first team last season, and now Kylie Cornegay Lucas of the Towson Tigers is your CAA Women's Basketball Preseason Player of the Year. Kylie, congratulations. Let's start right with this. What's the significance of the honor to, to get this from the other coaches in the league to be voted the top player in your conference um it means a lot i'm highly appreciative for the um, awards um i feel like it was well deserved i worked hard for it so yeah it's exciting where's your work ethic come from um really just the heart the effort just loving the game just giving it like 100 percent every time I, I step on the court how did you fall in love with basketball Honestly, at a young age, I was playing like my mom had me playing like all different kind of sports. Like in the summer, I started off playing like small, a, lot, a whole lot of like rec sports. And finally, I like my mom put me in basketball. And ever since then, it was eight. Ever since then, I just fell in love with the game. I've been playing ever since. You talk about your mom. Uh, tell me her name and, and what kind of an example she's been for you in your life. Uh, my mom, Nessie, and honestly, like, she's my number one supporter um, since high school, since actually, like, middle school. She's come to, like, all my games. Like, even if she can't make it, she's watching it at work, on her phone. Just always involved. She's always involved with everything. So I think about your journey, Kylie, and you were at Virginia, 
you move on to the program uh, that you're at with that you're with now in Towson. And look, you you've been through a couple of head coaches in your college career because when you originally came to Towson, Laura Harper, your current head coach, had not been there yet. So, what was your first meeting with Coach Harper like, and what is it about her that you feel you're connected with? Um, I met her. Um... She came with like a lot of energy, a lot of um, emotion. Um, I could just feel like her love for the game. She uh, made it clear how she was excited to coach me um, and how she wanted to better my game and what she can um, offer to me and how to uh, expand my game. So she got me at that. All right, let's talk about the expansion of your game. How would you break down the way it's expanded thus far? And what type of tricks are in store without giving us too much info? What What's next for... Kylie Corning A. Lucas here this upcoming season. Um, I feel like there's always room for growth. So, or it's just like working on my handling, um, my mid range, even my uh, three pointer. So, hopefully, we uh, see me putting more shots up this year. Now, you were the defensive player of the year in the CAA last season. You were second in the league in steals per game with over two and a half per contest. You were a really good rebounder of the basketball. You led the team in steals and blocks with 26. You played 31 minutes per game. You were everywhere for your team. What's your defensive mindset? Because a lot of players, they don't want to play defense. But mm -hmm. you do. Um, honestly, um, I just like making other team mad. <laughs> so I like just getting in everybody's grill. Also, like, I'm heavy on defense because I feel like everybody can score but can't somebody from scoring so I feel like if you score all the points it doesn't really matter if the other team's scoring so eventually somebody got to get a stop and I just uh do my part you like making the other team mad do you mind talking during the game and showing off your fire showing off your yeah career? I'm very I'm very vocal on the court um yeah so sometimes I even get in trouble from the rest so it's also something I gotta watch on but yeah that's just me as talking last year you and the tigers were in the caa championship game we know that that resulted in a defeat to monmouth how much does that drive you this season honestly it, it's a big drive it's, it's honestly motivation like we we obviously lost in the game which we didn't want but that's just more fuel for this year and hopefully we get to the championship and come out winning. All right, last one before I let you go. I, I got to have some of this preseason player of the year mojo rub off on all of us. All right, we all want to be like you. So before a big game, what three artists do you have in your headphones? Three artists, uh, I, I have to say Little Drake and Rod Wave. Kylie Cornergay Lucas, congratulations on CAA Preseason Player of the Year honors and best of luck this upcoming year. She is Kylie Cornergay Lucas, CAA Women's Basketball Preseason Player of the Year for the CAA favorites, the Towson Tigers. And it is great to be joined now by their associate head coach, Christy Rogers, here. On CAA Women's Basketball Media Day on the Field of 68 Media Network, John Fanta, Monica Moore with you as well. Coach Rogers, great to have you with us. Let's start right there. When you think about Kylie Cornegay Lucas and what makes her unique, you, you've coached a lot of great players, but what makes her different from anybody else? Yeah, I mean, Kylie is a special, special and rare talent. Um, you know, I've had the the fortunate, um, you know, circumstance to coach a lot of great players over the year, but never have I coached a player that has led a team in almost every statistical category. Um, and that was as a junior. So, you know, we're, we're entering her senior year, having led the team in points, rebounds, steals, assists. Um, and I think she knows this is her last go around and she's gearing up for for a good one for this this uh, final lap. 
Coach, obviously your team has the bullseye on their back. Everyone is expecting big things from Towson. I know you guys also feel like you might have a little unfinished business after the tournament last year. Can you talk about the team's mentality right now? What are their goals? What are those big things that they're focusing on? Because I know they are very hungry to be very strong this year. Yeah, absolutely. I mean, you know, the way we ended our season last year was, of course, not how we would have liked it to end. Um, but I think our kids took the proper time to reflect on that and to, you know, take accountability to where we may have, uh, you know, fallen short. So this summer, I mean, I saw an investment level and a focus that I've never seen from some of these young ladies before. Uh, we had a phenomenal summer, a great preseason. And I think their focus and investment level is just as high as it's ever been. Um, you know, we returned nine players. I'm very proud to say that we did not have one player enter the transfer transfer portal after last season. So being able to return nine who got so close um, to, you know, cutting down nets and falling short, the motivation level is extremely high. And then bringing in six new players who know what we've been through, have a lot of great experience of their own. Uh, you know, I think we've got exciting things ahead and we're just focusing on day to day. Coach, I know people focus a lot on Kylie, and they should, because she is just one of those rare talents. But looking down your roster, you've already alluded to it, you have so much talent. Quinziah Fulmore, obviously, is one of the ones that jumps off the page in the low post. Can you talk about what she's been working on in the off season? how she has been focused to come back and build off of everything that she did last year? Yeah, oh my goodness. I, I can't say enough about Quinn Fulmore. Um, you know, she was one of those kids that I think was really hurt about how our season ended and she started working right away. Um, it, it, this this preseason, it's been about, should we kick Quinn out of the gym? Is she in here too much? Um, and she has taken probably the greatest leap of a post player I've ever coached. Um, she's doing just so many good things for us. And, you know, she's also working on herself off the court as well and her mentality and her approach um, her pace, her reps, everything has taken a jump for her. And I think she's geared up to have a really great junior year for us. Coach, let's turn to Patricia Anunga and the way that she's been able to evolve. And in what ways have you seen her grow? And, and I'm also curious because you, you're in constant dialogue with your players about raising their game, elevating. What have your conversation with Patricia been like? Yeah, yeah. Pat Pat is a special kid. Uh, I've coached 15 years at the Division One level, and it's not even close that I've ever coached a kid that works as hard as Pat does. Um, she is by far the hardest worker I have ever coached and probably will ever coach. Um, she is just craving getting better every day. Uh, you know, she's a kid, you ask her what her goals are, and her only answer is, I want to see how good I can be. And you ask her, do you, do you have you know, aspirations of playing at the next level? And the answer is, I just want to see how good I can be. Um, so she's really worked on expanding her game. You know, last year she came in coming off of a shoulder surgery, uh, missed, you know, our first seven, eight games. Uh, so it was really slow getting her going last year. And I don't even think we saw what she was capable until the very end. Uh, but having a healthy Pat coming in from day one this year, um, and just being able to score and be so dynamic in the way that she is, very excited for her. Um, I think she's put in the work, and it's her time to show what she can do. It comes to mind, all this talent, all this work ethic, you, you've got all the pieces, right, to, to be successful. But I think from the outside world, you know, we, we all kind of talk about it, you, you all have to execute it and the, the daily grind. When you've got this group that's at the top, how do you avoid complacency? Mm, that's a great question. If you figure that out, let me know. Um, <laughs> no, I think, I think you know, we, we are taking it day by day. We are taking it drill by drill, possession by possession. Uh, I think the biggest thing with this group, you know, I met with our leaders yesterday, is keeping them focused on the process and keeping them focused on the preparation. Um, we've, got, we've got the tools we need. We've got the tools we need to be great, but those tools mean nothing if we don't put in the work and we don't prepare properly. So those are the conversations we're having. 
Coach, you've already talked about the fact you have a lot of players returning. You have your top three scores from last year returning. So you have that great nucleus. And you also alluded to the fact that you have new players coming in. With a team as, as tight as I know your team is, that can be a little daunting to come into a new program. Can you talk a little bit about how that chemistry is being created? Are there particular players who've just really taken it upon themselves to help this new team, this new group, completely gel as much as we saw that the last year's team had, had gelled? Yeah, yeah, no, that's a great question. Um, and it, it was kind of cool bringing in six new players. We brought in two freshmen, two transfers, and two JUCO kids. Um, so, you know, we, we brought in those six newcomers and each have a very valuable piece they're bringing to the table. And I think, you know, our, our returners realize, you know, if, if we want to get what we want to get and not fall short again, um, a lot of that has to do with chemistry. And so our returners did a phenomenal job of embracing the newcomers, um, kind of leading the way on how we do things and some minds, some names that really come to mind. Um, you know, Pat is our returning captain. She is a leader for us. She's done a good job taking some under her wing. Um, I think Alexia Nelson has stepped up in a leadership role far beyond what we ever could even ask for. She's been phenomenal and that's what you want out of your point guard. And then, uh, you know, Kylie leads, leads the way every day. Everyone looks to Kylie. What is Kylie doing? Um, so we're really grateful to have some upperclassmen that have really embraced that challenge. Coach, who do you feel like could be flying under the radar for this group heading into this season? Ooh, you're asking for my secrets now. Um, as far as our team or our opponents? Well, I, I guess we'll, we'll start with, with your group. I mean, you know, we, preseason honors come out, and let's face it, mm -hmm. there's always a player or two who feels like, I can land there. And, and there's always that, that piece to a roster that might come up vital that doesn't always even show up on a box score. So who's busting their tail in Tigers practice? Sure, sure. Great question. Um, I mean, I think there's going to be some surprises from our roster this year. We've changed a few things here and there. Our foundation remains the same. Um, but I think uh, India Johnson is prepped to have a fantastic year. You know, she was our sixth man last year for the most part, coming off the bench as a freshman. And um, I think, you know, a lot of people see her as a shooter. And India is so much more than a shooter. Um, so she has really put in the work. She has put in the studying, um, the playbook, things like that, that freshmen have trouble with. She's not having trouble with anymore. So I think she's someone that's geared up to have a fantastic year. Um, and, and I, will go back to Lex Nelson. I think she's playing her best basketball that she's played since she's been in college. So I think those, those two kids are really going to step up in a big way for us. How wild is this league? Uh, this league is tough. It's, I mean, and that's why we love it. It's a battle night in and night out. Um, you know, I think every team is capable of beating anybody any night. Um, you know, us losing to Monmouth pretty badly in that championship game, they're going to be tough. Stony Brook's going to be tough. Drexel, you can never count out Drexel. Um, Delaware's bringing a lot back. I mean, top to bottom, the league is strong and it's going to continue to be strong. And that's what we're preparing for, knowing that there are no easy games on our schedule come January. Christy Coach, Rogers. Been so go ahead, oh, go ahead, John. I was just going to ask really quickly a very, very tough question for you, Coach. Has there been a moment so far this season where you said, yeah, that moment, that really shows who we are? That That's something that just, that's what defines us as a team that you would point to? Uh, great question. And fortunately, no, not yet. Um, I don't think we've had that moment yet. And I'm glad because I think if we had it this early, I might be concerned. Um, we have a lot to work on. We've got a lot of areas to grow in. We have not arrived yet. We are not even close to arriving yet. Um, and so we're learning our lessons as we go. So not yet, but I'll, I'll keep you tuned. I'll check in with you later. <laughs> Christy, thank you so much for the time. Christy Rogers, Associate Head Coach of the Towson Tigers, the preseason number one in the CAA Women's Basketball Poll. Coach, thanks so much. Thank you guys for having me. There she is. There's Christy Rogers of Towson. We go from her to Sarah Jenkins, the head coach at Delaware, entering year two at the helm. Jenkins led the Blue Hens to a 16-14 record last year, nine wins in the CAA, 
in the second round of the CAA tournament. And if you look at the Blue Hens here, they are preseason number four in the conference poll, welcoming back a couple of starters. So it's great to have you here, Coach Jenkins. When you think about your group and, and what they can be this season, what can year two in your regime be for the Blue Hens? You know, I'm excited about our group. You know what I'm not excited about is how close this camera is on my face. Jeez Louise. Uh, we're very, very excited uh, about our group. Um, you know, we're, we're in a very unique situation. And uh, last year, you know, we, we turned over our roster and we had eight new players on our roster. This year we have seven. Um, and so it's two years where we, we, we're bringing in a large amount of uh, newcomers, but but I'm very, very excited about the talent that we have on this team and, and the talent on our roster. And I think that we have an opportunity to do some really great things here. Coach, of course, one player that I think everyone's talking about is Clark Sconyers turning her defense, amazing. Can you talk a little bit about everything she brings to your program? I don't want you to say her defense is amazing, like in her presence, because I don't tell her that it's great <laughs> at all. Do not, do not say that around her. Please don't. Uh, you know, I, I'm excited about her, and, and I think for her, you know, coming from Minnesota, you know, she was coming from a program that she didn't get an opportunity to play a ton of minutes, and now she, she's in a program where she's a focal point of what we do. Um, you know, and I think your one was her just kind of getting her feet wet and understanding, you know, the role that she's going to have in this program and, and how to really excel in that position. And so I think year two is going to be incredible for her. I think it's going to be her best year ever. Um, and really excited about what's to come for her. You know, coach, I've been talking to a lot of coaches about the non-conference schedule and I was reading your quotes about what you had to say about your schedule and how it was really going to give your team a chance to adjust to different playing styles and to kind of see the different things that are out there to prepare your team for conference play. Could you talk a little bit about that and kind of what all your team is looking to get from that non-conference schedule? You know, the big thing for us, you know, and I think that one thing that we're collectively trying to do in our league is to create non-conference schedules that uh, give us the potential to to continue to play uh, at, into postseason. Um, and for us, as we kind of evaluate the teams that we play and, and the opponents that we, we take on in the non-con, we're looking at, at A, similar styles to what we see in the conference, and, and, and B, we want to look at playing, you know, high-level competition. And we've we've got some really good teams that we're playing this year. I'm really excited about you know seeing our group compete uh, against teams. We've got you know AAC teams. We've got you know we're playing in the MTE where if we win you know one game we play Iowa the next round. So you know opportunities to just play high level competition and compete and just see all around different styles of play. I think will be really important for us. Coach, looking at your team, one of the players, not only an impact player, but a person, is Tara Cousins. And she took home the CAA's most prestigious honor, the Dean Ellers Leadership Award, last year. She's also the SAC president. How proud are you of her? And when you have someone like that on your team in your locker room, what's it do? Yeah, unbelievable leader. And I think, you know, they're very rare situations where you get the opportunity to coach individuals who are natural born leaders and just have those qualities um, naturally instilled in them. And she's one of those kids for us. And, um, you know, I'm excited about her. I'm excited about having her here. And, you know, she, she's she got one more year left with us because she's got her COVID year and, um, you know, excited to see, you know, what's for what's to come for her. And she's evolving and, and continuing to develop as a player as well. And so watching her just kind of make the transformation has been absolutely incredible. Coach, you already talked about the fact that you have seven players coming in, the four transfers, three three freshmen. Can you talk about how the integra integration is going with those players into what you already have within your culture as a team? And who are some of the big players that are playing a big role in helping make that very smooth. Yeah, I, you know, for us, where it is with, you know, with, with the new players that we have, they're going to play a lot of minutes for us, you know, and that, you know, that's no secret there. We've got some really good players that are coming in and they're going to, they're going to play a significant amount of minutes. I've got, you know, freshmen that are coming in here and, you know, most of my freshmen are, are going to play a lot for us, you know, and so them understanding the transition of what it looks like to play at the collegiate level and what it takes to really compete 
at a high level and to play at our pace. You know, we're really working on, we, we want to play a fast paced game and, um, you know, getting them used to playing at that pace, you know, and, and, and I think our girls, I think we have just such a great core group of kids. Like they're, they're very, they hang out all the time. And so they're very welcoming. They, they spend so much time together. So I think that's been a major plus for us and just integrating them and everybody learning and understanding each other and understanding their roles. Coach, when you think about this conference and the challenge of it, you've seen it from different angles in this league, being a part of the Delaware staff previously, now being the head coach of the Blue Hens. You're picked fourth, and I just look at the top five, top six teams in this league. Look, we saw the seventh seed win the conference tournament last year. How do you go about the marathon in the CAA? It, it's it's nuts and it, it's it's a great league to be a part of what i am going to do is i'm going to have a private meeting though with all the coaches in the league because what they're going to stop doing is picking me in the top five every year that's what they're going to stop doing they do that every year pick me in the top five top five top five top five no but it is a it is a great opportunity and it's a really good league and the competitiveness you know is you can't ask for anything else right you want to compete every day and you want to have an opportunity to play good teams and play good competition you know and and, and they set the bar really high right when, when you're when when you're when you're picked to be in the top half of the league, you know, that's hard to do in our league to be in the top half because we have such a competitive league. And so, you know, I'm excited. I'm excited for the opportunity and excited for for the opportunity to compete. One of the things that that we've talked about with with certain coaches today, look, it's it's a long season. Who you will be in November, December, you, you'll be a different team. Uh, I knock on wood here on my desk, health provided fully uh, in February, March. So when you do take the floor in November with this group, what's that thing, that question that that you're asking yourself internally that you want to find out an answer to from your players? You know, I, the biggest thing, and I think you get to see some of that early on when, we, when we're doing our scrimmages and exhibitions, you kind of start to see who your group is and, and what they can be and the potential that they have. And, and for me, with a whole new team again, you know, pretty much um, in year two, the big thing for me is I, I have to get us to be consistent. And I think the consistency is the big piece for us and, and doing the same things well on a regular basis. And so as we step on the floor in November, you know, that that's what I want to see. I want to see a whole new team figure out how in the world to be consistent. Right. And that and I think that's going to take us a long way. Um, and I think that's really going to help us have sustained success. And not just in the league, but as a program. Right. And, and getting your team to, to perform at a certain level consistently. And so that that's our goal. Well, Coach, we appreciate the time. Thank you so much for joining us. And Sarah Jenkins, I don't know if that message to the other coaches about preseason top five, I'm not sure how that'll resonate. I don't think that's going to work. We'll keep, we'll, we want to hear how that goes with the other coaches. I'll, I'll keep you posted. I'm going to text them in the group chat right now and stir up some, some trouble. <laughs> Coach Jenkins, thanks so much. Thank you so much, guys. Have a good one. We appreciate it. There she is, Sarah Jenkins of Delaware. Great to be joined by her. John Fanta, Monica Moore with you. Again, preseason poll in this league. Towson 1, Stony Brook 2, Northeastern 3, Delaware 4, then Coach Harmony's Charleston Cougars at number 5. So I'll ask you the question now. You got Monmouth at 6, Drexel 7, A&T at 8, William & Mary 9, Campbell at 10. From 6 to 10, who could be the dark horse in this conference? Oh, it's a tough question just because of what we, we saw last year. I think any of these teams certainly can really start to rise once you get to February and you're seeing the teams that are really gelling a lot. I will tell you, North Carolina a and last year was one of the ones that just really stood out to me start to finish. We talked about their record. Obviously, they, they lose some players to graduation, but they bring back a lot of talent that I'm very excited to see how they gel together as a team. So that's a team that that I always have on my radar, always a fun one to watch. Um, 
I'm very excited for Campbell. Again, we're going to see them for the first time in this league. They return a lot of talent. So to see them go into this league to see how they compete, because that, again, to me, was the biggest storyline last year of all the storylines. We bring in four new programs, and those four programs made such a massive entrance. I remember we were talking about how some of them were undefeated for a while within conference play. They really brought it. Monmouth wins the championship. A and T, Stony Brook, Hampton. The league has always had fantastic teams, but when you add that level of talent, it just gets better and better. It does, and I think that when you're talking about the the parity of a league, you want to be able to show up to a conference tournament and say, "Hey." There could be any of four to six teams that could win this thing. Last year, there were even more in the CAA. I mean, it's you're just not going to get a seven seed winning your conference tournament every year. That was history in the league. They're the first seven. It was Monmouth in their first season, their first trip to the big dance since 1983. But but that that showed us what this league is about, and, and that is is that you cannot predict any result in this conference. That's the fun of March. And when these teams show up to Washington, D.C. for the conference tournament, it's a new season. That's exactly right. And you see players just continue to grow and they get better and better and they have those moments to shine when they get to the conference tournament. One of my other big storylines we'll talk about last year, which will introduce, I think, a storyline for this year was the freshman in this league. Raven Preston was one of the big standouts. We've already seen her on the preseason honors list. She was our freshman of the year. I thought she was phenomenal Elon last year in terms of how ready to play that she was. Emma Von Essen was one of the ones that caught my eye. We're going to talk about her a little later. So I think watching the freshmen progress from the start of the season to seeing the way that they contributed come tournament time, it's always one of my favorite things to see, just that progression. And there's already some freshmen that I have my eyes on. We, of course, just heard Coach Jenkins talk about her freshmen who are going to get tons of minutes, so they're going to get that full experience. And I think they're going to be expected by the time that we get into conference play and tournament time to be some of the big contributors for Delaware. John Fanta, Monica Moore with you. We have been on with you since 9 a.m. with CAA Men's Basketball Media Day coverage. And on the men's side, that league is absolutely stacked. Was last year with so many different storylines uh, that we saw play out throughout the conference tournament with College of Charleston going to the NCAA tournament, giving San Diego State all that they could handle. And on the men's side, folks, preseason poll, Charleston, UNCW, Drexel, Hofstra, and Delaware making up the top five. On the women's side, it's the Towson Tigers who are picked at the top with Stony Brook and Northeastern filling out the top three. So it, it is such a fun time of year. And talking with coaches earlier this week, one of the takeaways that, that I, I garnered uh, just throughout media days and all across the country, and I think this is the case in the CAA, is that when you have the offseason that we have in college basketball, which really isn't an offseason, it's roster turnover, finding a way to adapt. You hope you have continuity. But preseason polls, they're fun to look at. They, they don't – we see them turn – they could be totally different – by the time we get to final standings, because of the way the sport is shaped, there's just a randomness to how seasons can go, right? No, it's very true. It's uh, you know, I'm, I'm glad that we're not the ones that are voting on the CAA preseason poll. It would be very hard to do because all of these teams are going to change so much. But it is fun to see where we think we're going to start to try to make some projections. I think the coaches did a great job in what they came up with. But when it's all said and done, just as we saw last year, it's going to look completely different when we get to March. Let's turn to Hampton under head coach David Six. Beg your pardon, we're going to go to North Carolina A&T here. We'll get to Coach Six at some point. So let's welcome in Terrell Robinson of North Carolina A&T. Coach Robinson's team finished in the top four of the CAA last year, trip to the CAA quarterfinals, 
coming in this conference, winning 18 games, 12 and 6 in the CAA. So, Coach, it's great to have you with us here. Year one in this league, the word that we would say is, wow, impressive the way that you came in and this program was able to perform at a high level. What can happen in year two? Well, first, you know, good afternoon. It's good to see you guys again. I'm excited about another year of basketball and obviously CAA basketball. Um, I am hoping that we can start off how we did to start the CAA and then finish a little bit better. You know, one of the things I'm talking to our young women about is just being consistent, being consistent in our roles, being consistent in our attention to detail. Coach, I don't know if you were able to hear what we were talking about. I, I picked you guys as one of my ones to, to watch, so so don't disappoint me. <laughs> no, just based on what we saw last year out of your team, I was so impressed with the way that you came into this league. And I do want to ask you about some of the individual players that I've certainly got my eyes on. I'll start with Malia Burkholm. In terms of her defense, how she sets the tone with her ability to disrupt what opposing teams' offenses are doing, can you talk about just the level of effort, the heart, that she brings to the defense of your team? Yeah, Malia is, you know, she's, um, to me, she always takes a professional um, approach to everything. You know, she's going to, you know, give her best effort. She's going to try to have attention to detail. Um, you know, that that ability, that instinct that she has, that anticipation ability, you know, you can you can give that to her mom and dad. They really instill some, some talent in her. Um, I'm, I'm excited about this year, but I, you know, I don't think Malia is just a defensive player. I think everybody this year really see how well um, she can be offensively as well. You know, I'm excited about Malia and obviously with the, the departure of Jasmine Harris, um, we got to find Malia some help. And just talking about some of that help that we certainly expect to see. Can we talk about Jordan Dorsey and the way she facilitates offensively, everything she brings to the team, just all around exceptional play? You said it, Jordan is our is our engine um, and she's had a fantastic summer. Um, Jordan, you know, took an internship during the first half of summer. And you know, when they're away, you never know what they're doing as a coach. You know, she joined the team in the second half of the summer um, and came back. Um, by far right now um, in practice um, every day, our best player. She, she's been um, lights out in terms of her, her leadership. She was voted again, team captain. Um, we had an uh, intra-squad uh, intra scrimmage. Um, she stood out, you know, and Jordan is, is ready for the next level in terms of being one of the top guards in the CAA. Coach Robinson is our guest from North Carolina a and Terrell Robinson and, and Coach, I look at, at you and you are synonymous with the institution that is North Carolina A&T. You played for the men's basketball program. You were a graduate assistant. You were an assistant coach. And now you're North Carolina A&T women's basketball's all-time winningest coach. What has made this home for you? Um, the administrators. Um you know, our chancellor who announced his retirement at the end of this year, um, the people, the people uh, like, you know, Danielle Williams and Billy Ed Edgerston that you all probably do not know. Um, they make it worthwhile every day. And then the bottom line, the young women and the staff that make the decision to work with, you, you know, this has been nothing but a personal and fun ride for me. Um, and, and that's why I also take us being picked eighth personally. You know, I really do think that we have an opportunity and a chance to, to prove Monica right as the dark horse, and um, and we're going to we're going to you know we're going to use that motivation, um, being one of the teams that that you know led the conference um, for the majority of the of the year last year, um, and fell short at the end um, on our own rights, and that's some of the things we're talking about now. But um, I love this institution. I love you know this women's basketball program, and um, every day we is it's personal for us. What do you think is going to be the wrinkle in your identity this upcoming season? Maybe it's an area of depth. Maybe it's something in the way that you think you can play with this team specifically. You talked a lot about how Malia could – it's about finding ways to, to get that supporting cast going. How, how would you expand upon that and what you think could be the strength of this particular team? 
You know, well, a couple of things. You know, what we were able to do last year was with five kids, it was their first year playing in our program. You know, Jordan Dorsey, Demaya Tucker, and Jasmine Harris were our returning starters. You know, we plugged in Malia, who, you know, now we're talking about as a CAA All Second Team. I can't wait to see her a second year in our system. Um, so there's there's that factor. Um, and, and another thing with Malia, a young lady who uh, stepped away from our program for a year, who's now back, Sean Kelly Darts, who was on our last team back in 2021 when we went to the NCAA tournament. She was our starting point guard. I think that was something that we fell short. Um, Jordan Dorsey's more than a point guard. I love to play Jordan off the ball. I would love to play Malia Bracone in full time um, off the ball. And we weren't able to do that last year. We were short ball handlers. So when Jordan got tired, Malia had to handle the ball versus shooting and being a scorer. But uh, Sean Kelly really adds, um, you know, that factor for us as far as our depth. Um, another young lady who was CAA, uh, made the all CAA rookie team, um, Shania Clark. Um, the transformation of her body and the work that she's done um, this summer, I think the league is going to be really excited about that 6'4 kid who can handle land shoot threes. Um, and, and her nickname is Shaq, so she's able to dominate in the paint. Um, so it's just a year of our young women, um, our, our core, um, our foundation, um, you know, being more comfortable in their roles and in, in our system. Like I tell them every day in practice, it's obvious our system is good enough. We stepped into a league that picked us 10th. Um, we were in first place more than half the season. Now we got to be consistent in those roles. And there, there shouldn't be a doubt right now that if we follow the same course and have more understanding where we'll be at the end of the season. Well, Coach, we appreciate the time. Best of luck this season. And yes, Monica Moore called it last year. She's in her. She's got the crystal ball out again, and I, I think she sees it in A and T once again. We look forward to watching your team be that CAA dark horse again, Coach. I appreciate it. You guys take care. Thank you, Tara Robinson of North Carolina A and T. Let's get to David Six of Hampton. Hampton. A team that we talked about came into the conference last year with those three other new members. Coach Six now joining us on CA Women's Basketball Media Day on the field of 68. So, Coach, three returning starters for your team. What do you think is possible for this Hampton team, and what are the things that you're stressing for this upcoming season to be a success? Well, I I, I think if – if uh... A lot of things have to go right. Um, we have a young lady hurt right now. Uh, we need her, to, but she's going to be back. Uh, she's uh, going to be back here in the next couple of weeks. Uh, if if everybody gels together, uh, uh, we have a young lady named uh, Janae Dublin uh, who transferred to us, who's going to be really good for us. I think if it, if, if that happens, we're going to surprise a lot of people. Coach, just looking at your upcoming schedule, I mean, you, you start off with a bang on the road. You're going to Providence. You're going to Chapel Hill. Can you talk about this schedule and all the tests that you have early on for your team? Well, um, you know, you, you can't be the best unless you play the best. Um, and, uh, you, you know, the CAA is a very, very competitive conference. And so we wanted to start and get ourselves ready right away so we definitely came to through with a a, a a great schedule and coach you you've already alluded to the fact that one of your your players is injured and i'm, I'm not sure um but I, I did want to ask about cameron hill is one to watch i'm not sure which player you were alluding to but just in terms of the big focuses for cameron hill what she brings to the program and uh, everything we can expect uh, to see uh, she she is battling a, 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 a disc in her back right now, um, but um, we definitely need her. Uh, uh, she's worked hard during the summer to 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 get in shape and 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 do what she, what she can do. Um, you know, I, I, as I said before, uh, she can lead us along with Amaya Rees. We can do some things in this conference. David, I, I want to go beyond this year's team here and talk about about you because for those of our viewers on the field of 68 that don't know, back in 
2019, you were given the USBWA Most Courageous Award. You've won the, the KAL Award as well. And uh, I know in 2018, you, you, you had a, a medical incident, went through rigorous phys physical therapy, uh, suffering a, a frozen shoulder. I, I, I Just looking back at that time in your life, when, when you had to face the fight, uh, you more than met it. And it feels like that's been a theme throughout your life. How would you expand upon that? Well, um, you know, at the end of the day, um, I wasn't taking care of myself the way I'm supposed to. I can, I can, I can admit that. And uh, uh, I had a stroke. Uh, the interesting thing about it is I had a stroke in the John Hopkins Hospital parking lot. So I was at the hospital when I had a stroke. So I was blessed with that. And uh, it's, it's been a struggle to get back. But at the end of the day, um, I've gotten back and, and uh, I'm here doing what I love. Uh, the administration's been great. Uh, I love my young ladies and, and uh, we ready to go. Coach, is, I there see a, a theme for, is there a theme for this season, a couple of words that you repeat to your team or kind of just something that the team is, is really looking at that's gonna be uh, their, their theme or mantra? Um, we, 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 we just want to play hard. I mean, I, I mean, you can't put it no simpler than that. I, you know, I think if you play hard, thing, good things are going to happen for us. And, and, uh, right now they're working on that, uh, getting around. We got a, a scrimmage this weekend. We'll, so we'll be able to see, you know, kind of where we are with about two weeks to go and, and we move on from there. All right, coach, before we let you go, Yankees blanket in the background. Yankees fan? <laughs> oh yes. I am a I'm a diehard New Yorker. Now I'm not all New York, you know. I I'm not a Nick fan. Uh when I Walt Frazier killed that for me when I was a little kid. But I am a Yankee fan. Well, who is your basketball team then? The Lakers. Oh, the Lakers. <laughs> Coach, don't tell me you're a Cowboy fan, too. No, 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 no. But I'm, a, I'm, Who's your I'm football mostly team? Uh, I don't really have a football team. I don't, I, you know, I just like football. I like football because I can watch it and not critique what they're doing or anything like that. I could just be a fan. So I, I like football in that respect. But I wouldn't buy a, a, a shirt or anything like that. I'm a Laker and a, and a Yankee fan. <laughs> well, we're Hampton fans uh, because of you and your fight and your team. We're excited to watch you this upcoming season. Head coach David Six, 15th year at Hampton with the Pirates. Coach, we appreciate you. Thanks so much. Thank you. Thank you. Thanks, Coach. There he is. There's David Six. Great to be joined by him. John Fanta, Monica Moore with you. So let's get to the all CAA preseason first team we caught up with the different honorees over the last week those conversations coming your way in just a few moments that first team Aaron Artagon of Northeastern Kylie Cornegay Lucas of Towson is also the preseason player of the year Jada Logan of Charleston Charisse Pittman of Stony Brook and Raven Preston of Elon we have not talked to Elon yet oh, and Coach Charlotte Smith. We'll talk more about that in a few moments. But first, let's get to those conversations with the All-CAA preseason first team in women's basketball. We continue on CAA Women's Basketball Media Day here on the field of 68 Media Network with our next All-CAA preseason first team selection. It's Darren Artagon from Northeastern, the senior from Turkey, was an all-CAA first-team selection last season, so this is no surprise to see her on the preseason team. Darren, first off, you're from Turkey. Uh, you were at Arizona, and then you transferred into Northeastern. What's allowed you to find the best version of yourself as a Husky? Um, the reason I came to Northeastern was to take more responsibility um, as a point guard. Um, and so... I would say like getting that and earning that leadership was the main part. 
when you think about heading into this season as a senior, coming off of a great year in the CAA tournament, you had a 27-point 10 assist performance against Stony Brook. You had several great performances for your team. What's your mindset heading into this season? Um, it's definitely going to be the same thing. Um, I mean, yeah, I love to score. I love to, you know, but like at the end of the day, I love being a point guard and creating um, opportunities for my teammates and for myself. Like it's basically going to be the same thing, but I feel like I am more responsible this year because we want to achieve more things. Um, so, you know, staying um, consistent and being competitive every day in the practices. Um, yeah. You have a new head coach, Priscilla Edwards Lloyd. So tell me about your first encounter with Priscilla and what it's been like getting coached by her. So we, <laughs> the first conversation we had um, was, I guess, a little bit awkward because I was going back to Turkey. Um, I had my national team, uh, so I had to go back after the school ended. But uh, she just got the job. You know, we just kind of like have a habit maybe 15 to 20 minute of like conversation but that was about it but from that conversation we still like had a good like i guess click like good energy from her and since i'm here um since summer two it's been like we're growing our uh relationship together and i'm growing as a person i'm, I'm learning new things um for coach p priscilla i mean so here you are as one of the best players in the <laughs> caa Darren of the Northeastern Huskies on the preseason All-CAA Women's Basketball First Team. Darren, best of luck in your senior season. Thank you. Thank you. We continue with our conversations on the field of 68 at CAA Women's Basketball Media Day with an All-CAA preseason first team selection. She is Sharice Pittman of the Stony Brook Seawolves joining us now. Averaged over 13 points per game last year. Averaged over eight rebounds per game. She was second in the CAA. So, Sharice, let's start with this. You transferred into Stony Brook from James Madison. Why has Stony Brook become such a great home for you? Um, I would say, like, the family atmosphere here. Um, I love the school as well. Um, the coaching staff, the team, the environment. So, I it just was a great fit for me. How would you break down your first season? And in what ways do you want to continue to elevate? Um, first season coming in, I think it went well. Um, we obviously didn't finish how we wanted to finish because the end goal at the end of every season is to win a championship. But um, I think, you know, continuing to stay in the gym and getting better every single day and, you know, ultimately reaching our end goal, which is winning the championship. And you guys are expected to be one of the top teams in the CAA this upcoming season. Is there something in the locker room, maybe a message, maybe a phrase that you and your teammates have this preseason to get after it and go after that CAA title? Um, our message really since the summer, really, or really since we ended, is just taking it one day at a time, one practice at a time, one workout at a time, and one game at a time. And I think when we string those together, I think eventually we will get to our end goal, which is a championship. All right, Sharice, let's go rapid fire here. Your favorite meal? Uh, pasta. Love it. The movie or show that you love to stream? Uh, Grey's Anatomy. That's a great call. Three artists it. that you're listening to on your pregame playlist. Um, G Herbo, Rod Wave, and Lil Baby. I can give you any destination to go on a vacation to. Where are you heading? Dubai. The best Halloween candy? Ooh, Snickers. You could go to dinner with any celebrity. Who are you heading out with? Beyonce. Best concert you've ever been to? A G Herbo concert. The Stony Brook Seawolves women's basketball season will be a success if what? We win games and win the championship. 
And Sharice Pittman's going to be at the forefront of that. Sharice, way to be. Way to handle that rapid fire with ease. Best of luck this season. Can't wait to see you and the Seawolves in action. Thank you. Our coverage of CAA Women's Basketball Media Day continues as we welcome in two more all-conference first-team honorees in the preseason. It's Charleston fifth-year senior Jada Logan and the reigning CAA Rookie of the Year Raven Preston of Elon. So, ladies, let's get right into it. I'll start with you, Jada. As you enter your fifth year of college basketball, as you received this preseason recognition, you were honored on the second team last year. How much uh, is this a starting point for you, and how excited are you for your Charleston program to get into it this season and, and be a contender? Well, it's very exciting, but um, at the end of the day, the work's not done. You know, we got a whole season ahead of us right now and battling getting back on the court um, from a knee surgery. So I'm just really excited to get full blast with my team. Raven, let's turn to you. Reigning CAA Freshman of the Year. Before we look ahead, let's look back. How special was it to come into a program? Of course, you had a vision when you came into Elon, and you were able to, to win that honor and, and rep for your program, but also fulfill a lot of the things that you would have liked to do in your first season. Mm -hmm. um, it was really special. I was really blessed to be able just to have the season that I did. Um, just all around, that my coaches helped with all of that, and I'm just excited for this next season. All right, let's have some fun here. Jada. <laughs> I want to know from you, you could play two on two. You could select any teammate in the WNBA, past or present <laughs> player, any player all time. You could team up with any one player. Who are you teaming up with? Oh, that's so tough. Ugh. I would probably say Maya Moore. I would like to see her back on the court again. That's who I would that's a big. That's a big time answer. That's a big yeah. time answer. Raven? Who are you teaming up with? Coach Smith. <laughs> <laughs> Why Coach Smith? That's a good answer. <laughs> uh, because she's just she's just a bucket. She's just forget how like special she is every day, but she's really a good player. Sometimes she hops in practice and gives us buckets. So <laughs> describe Raven, I'll stay with you. Describe CAA women's basketball. What makes the league special? Um, I feel like the league is just wide open. Every like every game we came and competed, um, you never knew what you were going to get from any team. It's just like huge on competition at a high level, and you just get you just don't know what you're going to get uh, day in day out. Now, Jada, I'm going to give you your flowers here because you recorded the second triple double in program history last year, and you almost had another triple double. Uh, later on in the season, you had a great year. When you had that triple-double, tell me about that. Let's relive it. Did you know you were coming up on it? Did you have any idea? Well, at first I didn't really know until um, I think I was like two rebounds and maybe two assists away. And Coach Harney pulled me aside. She was like, hey, kid, you're, you're really close to a triple-double. And she was like, if you want it, you know, this is how far you are away. So obviously I wanted it um, to make some type of histories. Um, so I went out there and just worked for it. That's awesome. Raven, your season highlight that comes to mind last year is you hit a game-winning buzzer beater three-pointer to beat Delaware. This ended up on the Sports Center top 10. Relive that <laughs> yeah. moment with us. Um, so we had drew up a play and it didn't go any way how we expected it to. And I just remember getting the ball and seeing the time, which is, I basically just threw it up and hope for the best. <laughs> <laughs> All right, before I let you go, I got to know, do either of you have a superstition of any sort? <laughs> um, I, yeah, I'm a pretty superstitious player. I have to do almost everything the right way. Like, day before and game prior to the game. Whether it's like, right. oh, did I get a cup of coffee this morning? Like, I need to get a cup of coffee. <laughs> okay. All right. I uh, like that. You got to get a cup of coffee. Raven? 
Uh, I am too, like the type of shoe I wear. So if I have a good game in one shoe, then I'm just going to wear that the rest of the, the, rest of the season. <laughs> Give us your favorite shoe. Um, well, last season, I don't even know what they were, but they were uh like high top, white, and like maroon. But this year I haven't found my shoe yet, so we're just trying them out. <laughs> well, you're going to find it. You're both going to find it, and you're both going to have a great season, and we wish you the best of luck this year. Charleston's Jada Logan, Elon's Raven, Preston, both on the all-CAA preseason first team. Ladies, thank you so much. Thank, thank you. you. Welcome back to CAA Women's Basketball Media Day on the Field of 68 Media Network. We have been with you for close to five hours with continuous coverage here on the Field of 68. John Fanta and my partner, Monica Moore, with all of you. And let's talk about the Elon Phoenix. And to do that, we welcome in their head coach, Charlotte Smith, who is with us now. The 1994 Final Four Most Outstanding player when she hit that three-pointer giving North Carolina the national title with the win over Louisiana Tech. 23 rebounds, not to mention, in that game as well. Coach, before we talk about your team this year, I've got to ask you that question. How much do you still have random folks ask you about that game? Quite often, honestly, and especially with it being the 30-year anniversary. I'm dating myself, but it is the 30 30- 30th year anniversary of the shot. So it, it's pretty neat that that shot has etched this way in the history books forever. Coach, I want to talk about Raven Preston. We know she's a great player. Um, we also know that she's a very intelligent young woman because in the clip that we just saw before you, John asked her who she would team up with if she could team up with anybody to play. And her answer, Coach Smith. She says she is absolutely a bucket. So we know she's a very smart young woman, but can you talk about Raven Preston? Everything we saw yesterday, yes, last year, she was phenomenal, but what should we expect to see from her in year two? You know, we refer to Raven as the Swiss army knife. She does a little bit of everything on both sides of the ball, um, whether it's getting in passing lanes, getting steals, rebounds, um, you know, we're expecting for Raven Preston to be a walking double-double this season um, and to be a little bit more vocal and be more of a leader for the team this year. Coach John's already asked a little bit about, about your history as a player and looking at your non-conference schedule, certainly there are some games that jump out to us. Of course, going back to play UNC Chapel Hill, that's a big one. You're playing NC State. Can you talk a little bit about some of these marquee matchups on your schedule, how you think they're gonna help your team grow and be ready for conference play? Right, these matchups are all about building confidence and momentum in the non-conference season. You know, those games, you, you win some and you lose some. But what you can take away from those games are the great things that you did against top uh, caliber competition. And in knowing if we can execute these things on offense and defense against, say, a North Carolina or an NC State, definitely we can do it against anybody in the country. And, you know, we say you can't beat them unless you play them. And so we're always up for the challenge in terms of a competitive non-conference schedule. Charlotte, when we talk about the state of women's basketball and the rigorous day-to-day of coaching, I mean, the, the fact is this sport has changed to a point where there really is no off-season. You're not only talking about player retention, but going out to the transfer portal, trying to deal with all of that. Uh, we know how NIL has 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 certainly impacted things as well. You have an interesting perspective because you played the game at the highest of levels and now you're coaching it at, at a school that, that look, the, the fact is the, the players that you're recruiting are, are not the, the players that necessarily the, the top, top, top of the court are, are bringing in. How, how would you break down what it's like day to day coaching in the sport I don't know the difficulties or or the challenges that come with it because I don't know if the viewers totally understand what that process is like of running a program 
like Elon and what needs to go into it in our current age of women's basketball? Right. Well, it's all about you understanding your identity, um, your program's culture, your university's culture, and in terms of what you bring to the table. Uh, we know who we are. Uh, NIL doesn't change who we are. Cost of attendance doesn't change who we are. We know what we have to offer. And so it's a special niche for whoever decides to come here. But if you can understand like the value, number one, of a great education at a great institution and preparing you for a lifetime of success, if you can understand being under the leadership of a staff that absolutely cares about you as a person and helping develop you holistically, if you embrace and embody those things, then you can see the value of that minus the NIL and the cost of attendance. I think we've lost our way in terms of what's important. I don't knock any of those things, but at the end of the day, I know my purpose. I know what I'm called to do and I stand in that. Coach, we've already talked a little bit about Raven Preston. You have some other great returning players as well. I wanted to specifically ask you about Cameron Doty, what she's going to bring to the program, what have been her big focuses, and how do you expect for her to help lead your team? Right. Well, that's one of the things that's like really important for our team this year. When you look at our record from last year, I, I told our players today, it's not, an, it's not indicative of who we were and who we are. When you think of a roster of eight of 14 being players with zero experience and still having, you know, I took the average of nine games that we lost and it was 3.3 points. Nine games we lost, 3.3 points. So the value of having experience is really gonna pay off this year. Um, you know, for Cameron Doty, for us, she'll be an invaluable leader for us because she won't be on the court this year. Um, I'm very excited about the fact that we have players returning in Maya Johnson, uh, Vanessa, and Asia, who is our core group of leaders that we have that came back for you know, another year. So experience was a big thing that we needed. So we're really excited about having Maya Johnson and Vanessa returning to our roster. And you think about all those players that didn't have experience last year, they have a experience under their belts. And so hopefully those games that we're losing by three, that we lost by three, four, five, you know, under 10 points, we can close those games this season. Coach, do you still jump into five on five action with your team? <laughs> Every now and then, I literally just sent them a video that I had posted um, of me dunking and the shot, the national championship. And I tell them, you know, I used to ball just a little bit. Maybe I'll come out of retirement. So Every now and then I'll get out there, but you know, I, I, not as much this year, but I got to get back on my job. Look, you've brought up Maya Johnson a couple of times here. In what ways have you seen her grow? Her confidence level, just in practice, you know, her face up game is really improved, being able to put it on the floor. Um, so just confidence defensively. And we know what she's going to bring to the table in terms of defense. Like Maya Johnson is the type of player, we can switch one through five with her because she can defend any and everybody. So I'm just excited about what she'll bring to the table in terms of a leadership, her experience, you know, her confidence that she now has offensively and just being a great defensive captain for us as well. Well, coach, we appreciate your time. We wish you the best of luck this season. And if you do get out on the court with your team, we need footage of that. <laughs> All right. We, we record every practice, so I'll, I'll send it to you. Charlotte Smith, she's got games. She's got the media day jacket. She's ready to go for a new season with the Phoenix. Coach, thanks so much. Thank you. We appreciate your time. All right. Let's turn the page here to UNCW. It's a new era. Nicole Woods taking over this program and a, a program that, that, look, they are looking to rise. And we're going to talk about how that begins here with Coach Woods. Nicole joining us now on CA Women's Basketball Media Day on Field 68. Coach Woods, it is great to have you with us. We're excited for this new era. And, and I guess that's where we'll begin. What of the opening months on the job entail? What are your goals? 
Well, thank you for having me first and foremost. You know, the first few months, any first time head coach will say it was like drinking water out of a fire hose. You know, everything was getting everywhere except for in my mouth. And, you know, I didn't have a staff for the first three months. So it, it was crazy. It was a crazy time. A crazy in a good way, though. Crazy in a good way. Um, I could not have. Um, asked for a better first group for me to coach. Um, they've done everything that I've asked them to do. They work hard. They come with a great attitude every day and we get 1% better. Um, my, my number one goal for them is to have fun, get back to, you know, playing the game that they love and going out there and just having a good time doing it. Our first week of workouts, we had spirit week like you had back in high school, just to kind of lighten the mood a little bit. Um, so, you know, to have fun. And I tell people when they watch UNCW women's basketball, they're going to see three things. We're going to compete. We're going to rebound and we're going to defend. We're going to do those three things every single game and we're going to have a good time doing it and we'll see what happens after that all right coach well, you opened the door by bringing this up so let's talk more about spirit week because i need to know what the days were who had the best costumes who was most into it so tell us a little bit more about that because that sounds phenomenal you know, everybody was into it. It definitely was a thing. I know we had, um, of course, I'm going to draw a blank on everything, but we had silly socks um, one day. We had um, pro day another day where they got to wear um, their favorite, um, you know, professional jersey. We had retro day um, where they wore, you know, uh, something that was uh, retro. And we had, it was four days, and I can't remember what the other day was. Um, but it, it was a good silly sock. Did I say silly socks? You did. It was something. Yeah, it was, was something else. Like I can't <laughs> yeah, it, it was something else. But they had a blast. You know, we got to practice uh, like that. We took some pictures. And, you know, it was just a good time. It was a good time. And, you know, for me, um, we, we um, have uh, what I call my six P's of progress. Um, and that's kind of our mantra for the program. And, you know, passion is, is the number one P. And so um, in passion, that is, of course, passion for the game that you love, um, passion for each other, passion for uh, in, in terms of everything we do. So we, of course, wanted to lead with that. And everything I do, I lead with, with love. And so um, I wasn't going to change that just because I said, you know, move one seat over. Coach, well, coach, obviously, who, oh, sorry, go ahead, John. Who inspired you to get into coaching and, and what's your why? Oh, that's a very good question. You know, I actually never wanted to be a coach ever. My friends laugh at me now. Um, it's it's just a it's an ongoing joke with like my college teammates and my high school teammates because I told them that I was going to never be a coach and then I became a coach and I definitely said I was never going to be a head coach literally when I when it was announced that I got the job I had 765 text messages and half of them were saying you said you would never be a head coach and so um you know I learned, a, I should have learned a long time ago that, you know, God usually laughs at us when we tell them, you know, our plans. And, um, you know, I will say um, Missy Tiber was my first, uh, was my coach in college at Belmont Abbey College. And she got the job at SIU Carbondale. And she offered me a GA position to um, get my master's. And, you know, I went into it just thinking, hey, you know, I'll get a free master's. I had no desire to coach. I was going to go open up my boys and girls club and that was going to be it. And so I like to think she tricked me, you know, into into coaching because here I am. That was in 2009. So what, 14 years later, um, here I am. Uh, but in terms of, of coaching, you know, my, my calling in life has always been to to help people. And I've always had a heart for young people. Um, I was a Boys and Girls Club kid growing up. Um, I ran a Boys and Girls Club when I came back from playing overseas. And so it's always kind of been, you know, my thing. My master's is in public administration with a concentration in nonprofit. And so I think it was more so of the combination of the two, right? Getting to 
do something that I love in basketball. And then kind of, I, I call it my ministry, you know, being able to be there for my players, you know, coaching just happened to be, uh, be the perfect uh, gig for me. I tried the corporate world. I was an accounting major. So I was an accountant coming out of school and uh, God bless all the accountants, you know, it just wasn't for me. Um, and then I came out and, and decided to do something different. And so I guess this is different. Well, Coach, let's talk a little bit about this non-conference schedule because there are definitely some road tests for you guys on this schedule. Can you highlight some of the big games you guys are looking forward to and just give us a sense of how you think that conference schedule is going to shape your team or the non-conference schedule, you know, rather? We're excited about all the games. <laughs> you know, everybody wants to talk about who's on the schedule, and that's not so much our focus. Our focus is on us. Um, you know, of course, we go out to Nebraska, and we go out to Iowa State, right? And we have these these big names, and of course, we're we're looking forward to that. But um, we're we're looking forward to the opportunity to compete. Um, you know, we were we were chosen last and I think everybody expected that and you know we we already had a chip on our shoulder before then you know and so it's definitely going to be bulletin board material for us um every single day um it's funny that you said um our program needs to rise above um or something like that and um ironically that is the the motto that our our team chose for our for this year, for us to rise above. It's been a rough few years um, for our program, but this group believes. And I believe that when you have a, a group of people that come together for a common cause, that we can we can do a, a lot of great things um, on the court this year. So we're, we're super excited. We've got an a, a energetic group to say the least, and they do everything I ask them to do. And so I'm just gonna try not to get in their way and mess that up. Coach, when you've got a lot of, of, of new, first off, you, you just said it, drinking water from a fire hose. This is year one. Uh, I don't know if it's a source of inspiration. I'm not sure if it's somebody texting you every morning. But, but I know one thing. Any coach calls upon someone or something to help them through the process. Who, who do you call upon? Who's there for you day in and day out that you look for for that wisdom, that, that daily insight? Well, I, of course, call on the good Lord. You know, that's that's first and foremost um, every single day. Uh, but I have a lot of mentors um, in, in the game. Um, Tiffany Tucker is, is right here with me, my senior women's administrator. Um, she's, she's amazing. I talked to her a good bit. I also have my former boss um, at UNC Charlotte um, that I was with for the last 10 years, Kara Consuegra. Um, so I know she's a phone call away. Uh, Lynn Bria, who I started my coaching career with um, my first two years. Um, she's a great inspiration. And I also hired a, a coach as well. Um, so us coaches need coaching uh, too. And so I've hired a, co a coach at Mar Walsh that I meet with um, once every two weeks. And if I need something in the meantime, you know, I talk to her. So look, I, I'm not, I'm one of those that if I don't know, or if I've got a question, I'm absolutely going to reach out and um, reach out to the, folk, the, the people who I feel like can help the best, just kind of dependent on the situation. Well, from not thinking that you were ever going to be a coach to now leading the Seahawks and getting out to the harbor with them for year one. And my, I must say, before we, we wrap up this conversation, is UNCW not a gorgeous, gorgeous campus? I, I got to imagine you're loving being there. Well, they call it, you know, we call it UNC wonderful for a reason because it, it really is wonderful. And, you know, I'm a beach girl, so this is even better for me. I live eight minutes away from the beach and it's nothing like, you know, maybe having a tough day and you can just go and watch the sunset over the over the ocean or, you know, just, you know, you know, put your feet in the sand. It makes things 1% uh, uh, better than what it was before. And absolutely a gorgeous campus. Nicole, good luck this year. Thanks for taking the time. Thank you so much. 
There she is, Nicole Woods, the head coach at UNCW. UNC, wonderful. We will see what happens for her in year one at the helm of the Seahawks. Speaking of first-year head coaches, let's go to Northeastern. Priscilla Edwards-Lloyd taking over at Northeastern. Priscilla, it is great to see you. Great to see you guys. How are we doing? We're doing well. We're doing well. We're, we're excited for you. And, and that's the first question. Obviously, you knew things about Northeastern uh, when you took this job. What have you learned about the place since taking the job? Oh, man, you know, I, I've learned it's even more incredible than uh, than I knew of, you know, in terms of not only just the, the athletics, but the academics here. You know, it's a great institution. It's globally recognized in a lot of different ways and, you know, just I wish I could go back and be a student again because this is exactly the type of campus that I would want to be on, you know, in terms of opportunity. And of course, you got the high level of hoops that are going on here as well. Coach, just looking at your roster, there's so much to be excited about. You return a lot of talent. Darren Artigan, obviously one of the ones everyone's talking about. She's a great scorer, a facilitator, a leader. Can you give us a sense of a progression that you're seeing over the past few weeks in terms of her game and what we can expect to see this season? Yeah, Darren is amazing. You know, she uh, she's a hooper through and through. Um, you know, she, she picked up a lot of experience internationally this summer playing with her national team, and that was a great experience for her to learn and grow. Um, but, you know, she, she, she's coming in with a chip on her shoulder and, you know, she has things that she wants to accomplish individually, but also for the team. You know, it's a big part of, of why a lot of this group is still together. So, um, you know, Darren's been an incredible leader for us and, and we're looking forward to, to what she's going to do this season. And because you do return so much of that talent, can you give us a sense? You said that she, that Darren has a little bit of a chip on her shoulder. I know this team feels like there's so many goals that they want to accomplish. Can you give us a sense of the things that they're talking about, what their themes are, what things are just motivating them, their mantras, and so we can get a, a better sense of where they're headed this year? Yeah, for sure. Um, you know, this team, one thing that they mentioned from my first meeting with them when I took the job was, um, you know, how much they, they love each other and they're connected and, and, and they definitely want to be a team that even grows to be more connected. Uh, that was something that they felt uh, was the difference last year for them and, and wanted to keep continue with that momentum. Um, they know they left a lot of things on the table, you know, basketball wise, but, you know, it, it, respecting the process of you have to get back to that point. And you have to take it day by day to get there. So they talked a lot about, you know, over the summer, the goals that they wanted to, to accomplish on and off the court. And, um, and, and, you know, they're lofty, they're lofty ones. And uh, I think they're capable of doing it. You know, so right now we're in phase one of that, which is just to become a team that, you know, is connected and is practicing hard and preparing for, for everything that non-conference is gonna bring. And, and then when we get to that next phase in conference, you know, then, then we'll talk about accomplishing what's next on that list. But they're goal oriented, they're driven and, and, and they're connected in that process. Priscilla, you have an all CAA second team preseason selection and Jamima Motima what stands out to you about her and how has she grown since you've started working with her? Yeah, G's another incredible talent. Um, what's probably stood out the most to me with G is is how she's she's coming out of her shell. You know, she's a pretty quiet, reserved uh, kid who, who just goes about her business. Um, but but she has a great, great, great personality. She has a great feel for the game and, and she's someone that has grown so much. I would say more so off the court, you know, in terms of, of of sharing the insights and, and the IQ that she has with her teammates. You know, now she's talking freshmen through things on the court and, and is really using her voice, you know, to, to be a leader on this team and develop and grow in that role. So I've been really impressed with that. Um, she's always in the gym. You know, if you hear a ball bouncing or you hear some music playing, the chances are it's going to be G. Uh, but for her to take that step of being more of a leader and a vocal leader is something that, that has been really impressive. Coach, we've already talked about some of the stars of the team. Deja Bristol was one of my favorites last year. I talked about her so much coming off the bench for your program. Are there some players that might be a little under the radar that people haven't been talking as much about, but from what you're seeing, you think pretty soon they're definitely going to be talking a lot about them? 
yeah, I mean, you know, pick a day and there's going to be somebody who's going to stand out in some different ways in practice. Um, you know, I, I think, you know, we, we, we've relied on, on players like Jay, Jalen Batts, who brings experience as well, you know, being a fifth year, she, she's someone who, again, is, is an incredible leader too. You know, she talks everybody through on the court. She, she knows every rotation. She flies around. She's active. She can score. She can, she can make plays. Um, she's someone that brings a lot of energy to, to what we're doing. Um, you know, I also think Asha Parker is someone who is an incredible, credible uh, leader as well. She's a workhorse. Um, you know, she's someone who always brings great energy to practice. Um, you know, she's just someone who's very, very competitive and, and is looking to, to continue to grow on some of the strides she made last year as well. You know, the, depending on the day, it could be anyone. You know, I, I think that that's the beauty in, in right now is everyone's kind of getting out there and showing what they can do and what they're capable of. And it's, it's, been, it's been really good to see. Coach, we've been asking coaches all throughout media day, do you jump into five on five with your team? I know you've got game. You were a Bonnie at St. Bonaventure. Do you jump in? Uh, I do not jump in. Um, you know, I'm currently uh, nursing a strained hamstring from uh, just running to the commuter rail in the morning. So, <laughs> so right now I'm on the injury reserve. Uh, I keep it to. Uh, in my morning workout and, uh, and I, I keep it pushing. So I do make half court shots though. That That is a thing. <laughs> you make half, okay. Is there video of this? Possibly, yeah, we'll dig in the crates. If not, I can toss one up today and uh, send it to you guys. <laughs> <laughs> wow, how, how very cool. Oh, I was gonna say who on the roster rivals you the most in terms of being able to knock down some of those crazy shots? Ah oh, man, I don't know. I haven't, uh, you know, we, we we ended practice, you know, like a week ago with a half course shot and everybody went, everybody in the program went and I had to kick the cap it off to, to finish up practice. So uh, we're, we're still auditioning for some trick shot makers around here. So stay tuned. Well, Priscilla, we appreciate the time and wish you the best of luck in year one at the helm of the Huskies and thanks so much. Appreciate that, guys. Go Huskies. There she is, Coach Edwards Lloyd of Northeastern. Excited for her preseason top three in the CA Women's Basketball preseason poll. Towson at one, Stony Brook at two, Northeastern at three. Let's turn to the newest member in the CAA, the Campbell Camels. Their leader is Ronnie Fisher. He's joining us now. Ronnie Welcome to the CAA. It's great to have you. Thanks, guys. It's great to be on this call today. Really excited about this year. Well, we'll start right there because you join a league. And as much as you're preparing for everybody else, everybody else has to be ready for what you are bringing to the table. But What's been that process uh, between you and your staff and what will that process be of just learning this conference, the styles, the DNA of these teams and, and who you're going to be going up against? Yeah, I think we've had the same approach that we've had um, for the past seven years we've been here. Uh, we're, we're worried about our team right now. We have plenty to worry about uh, and, and uh, we're, we're trying to get better uh, on the offensive end, the defensive end, and, and trying to grow closer as a team. Uh, we Obviously, I know a little bit about the teams in our league, and uh, the parity is so great, and the, and the league is such a good league, but we're, we're worried about us right now. Uh, fortunately, we don't play till January 5th in the league, and, and we'll have plenty of time to see video on the teams. I'm not as worried about them as I am us, and I, I really feel like if we can get ourselves better and, and do some of the same things we've done for the past seven years, we'll be fine. Coach, you obviously return a lot of good talent from last season that I know will be the nucleus of your team. I know last year, Shai Tuli was out for a bit. And my understanding is she, is she she's back. Can you talk a little bit about her in terms of what she brings to the program, the leadership, and just everything on the floor? Yeah, uh, Shai, she she got off to a great start last year, and, and uh, she was playing really well. And seven games in, she... Uh, she hurt her hand and, and thought she was going to be able to, uh, to tough out, tough it out and everything. She tried for a couple of days, but she ended up having that surgery. So that was a really big loss for our team. She, um, 
not only is she a very good player, but she was she's a leader of our team, and and she's she's earned that role as um, every day coming to work, and and our other players respect her, and she also has a confidence about her that we feed off of. So it was tough to lose her last year, uh, but I was really proud um, of our team. We really stepped up and did some nice things, and some other players maybe. Uh, made some progress that they wouldn't have made uh, had Shy uh, been there. So as much as I hate that it happened last year, it was tough to swallow, but hopefully we're going to be a little better for it this year. And it's Coach, great to we have talk her about back. Some... Yeah. Absolutely. And I know she was still working and growing and learning even when she was not out on the floor. Can we talk about some of those other players that really – when given the moment when their number was called to step up and provide a little bit more, you really saw that out of them last year. They really answered the call when the team needed them. Yeah, we, we have some veterans that I've been really proud of. Uh, we, we have, we call, we have three super seniors, you know, Cheyenne, she's working on your number six, I think. And uh, Brittany Staves and Swinya Nuremberg are both uh, five year players uh that as seniors they're they're going to be called on to to even step up what they did last year they were so solid for us last year though on both ends offensively and defensively and then at the, in the junior class which were last year which are seniors now christabella zuma uh, she was the first team all-conference player and and really came into her own last year uh, i feel like she she her best days are ahead of her too so really really love what she's added and then Sarah Hammock Fitzgerald is another um, senior this year that's uh, really done well in the off season. She's worked hard to, uh, to really come in here and contribute and really feel good about those veteran players. Coach, when you think about Cam Campbell and the institution, uh, for those CAA fans, uh, for those of us who have not been on your campus and, and have not been at your home, uh, the home of the Campbells. What is the power of the place? What what's the place mean to you, and and what is this institution bringing to the CAA? Yeah, that's. Uh, I could talk for the next thirty minutes on that if you'd like. Uh, th this is an, a, an amazing place. Uh, it really drew me um, seven years ago, and uh, the first thing that Campbell offers is amazing people. Uh, that are just solid from our athletic department to our president of the college. It's, it's that place where you really know no strangers. And, and uh, uh, that's what brought me and my family here. Uh, the other thing is athletically, uh, there's a real passion to win and, and, and win at a high level. And, and you can look at all of our sports. Uh, it's really amazing the success that we've had. And, and uh, uh, across the board in all sports. And I think that's a big reason that we, um, that, that we're so fortunate to get the uh, chance to come into the CAA. And, uh, you know, I know there's a lot of good teams in there, but we're, we, we're used to winning and we don't want to stop. So uh, we're really motivated to, to uh, work hard and, and compete in this league from day one, just like all of our sports. And uh, I think uh, we have an amazing place to play and, I think in our seven years in the Big South, I think we led the attendance for women's basketball for six of them. And uh, it's, a, it's a great home court advantage. I think some teams are going to come in here and really enjoy the atmosphere. And it's a great place for basketball on the men's and women's side both. So uh, hopefully um, the people enjoy coming here, but hopefully it won't be very fun for them too. So. <laughs> Coach, we've talked a lot about some of the returning big names that, that we know that you have. Is there anybody who's been a little under the radar that you can highlight for us that you just what you're seeing right now, you think they're poised to have a breakout year for the program or at least someone we should keep our eyes on? Yeah, I think the beauty of our team is that we're really balanced. Uh, but but I, I love, uh, you know, I just mentioned our juniors and seniors a second ago, but Audrey Fuller, uh, she's a junior this year. You know, she started every game last year, I believe. And, and she has a chance to really take a step forward for us. She did a tremendous job for us last year. And, and I think she has a chance to be that person. And in, in the sophomore class, uh, Gigi Boone was a uh, all freshman team uh, candidate last year in the Big South. And, and she has a ton of potential. I love her. She's very exciting to watch. Uh, 
And then Gemma Nunez in that class as well, uh, she has a, had a terrific off season and, and uh, I've been so impressed with her in practice. And all those players are going to make a big impact, if not start for us. And then in the freshman class, we have um, three really good newcomers uh, in Paris Smith and, and, and um, Hadley Dill and, and Jessica Woods that uh, are really talented freshmen. Uh, I have so much confidence in every one of those players uh, to step in and play, and we'll see who kind of steps up. But I, I love the balance of our team more than the stars. Coach Fisher, I, I don't, I don't want to make any assumptions here uh, because we've been asking all the coaches this. Do you still, do you still have game? You still get out on the court and play. Yeah, I heard your last question. Some other coaches there. I I do not get out on the court and play. I was wondering if you're going to ask me that question. I appreciate it, you know. Uh, but but I I do run a little bit and and uh, and and we we compete a little bit out there and run a little bit. But I let them do the play and then I I get over there and try to coach. It doesn't sound like you have to do any playing because by the looks of it, hearing about your team, there's balance as you just said, and you use the word depth. I mean that. I know it's early. It's a long marathon, but but don't you feel like if you've got this group from here till the journey to March, that practice, you, you're actually able to get better through that, working on yourselves and having a full complement of players that that five on five is game like. Yeah, you're, you're right. And, and, you know, like the same motto that we've had, uh, we have no players that have been voted on the first team or second team all conference. And, and uh, we, our goal is to be the best team. And, and that's that's who we are. Our, our kids, our motto is to sweat and serve. And and uh, we're, we're going to be a tremendous team. And hopefully at the end of the year, we may have a few on the first or second team. Uh, but uh, we are all about uh, team. And that's who we are. And, and that's our focus. And that hasn't changed since we got here. So hopefully that'll carry over into the CAA. How much orange do you have in your closet? <laughs> I have a lot now, but I had none when I came seven years, eight years ago. Uh, but I've got a lot in there now and I love orange. My, my blood's starting to bleed orange a little bit here. And I hope to I hope I stay here many more years. Well, we love orange now too in the CAA, the Campbell Fighting Campbells entering the CAA, a new era for the program. Ronnie Fisher's leading the way. Coach, thanks for the time. Good luck this year. Thank you, guys. Appreciate the time. We appreciate you. Uh, let's turn to the reigning tournament champions in the CAA, the Monmouth Hawks. What a run it was last year. Their first NCAA tournament appearance since 1983. Jenny Boggess and the job that she was able to do amazing as a seventh seed, and they went dancing. And, Coach, it's great to see you. Last time we saw you was on that floor at Towson where you and your team were celebrating. You had your cap on. You were cutting down the net. So we've, we've got to look back at that. You've been a part of so many great basketball moments. Where's that week sit for you? I think we're, uh, we're just waiting to get Coach our audio. I lost you guys. Sorry about that. Um, no, you got it, Coach. Irony, Coach where's, that, where's that week uh, sit for you in your basketball career? The irony of me not having a voice and also being muted is is fantastic. But, um, no, that week, it, a game changer for for not only me and my family and, and all of the hard work, but for these players. You know, for we had four graduate seniors on our roster, and for them and their families to experience it, and to witness, you know, the work pay off for a number of players on our team that the year before had only won two basketball games that season. So an extremely special group. Very, very proud of it. Uh, we were a seven seed for a reason. So there's the coach in me. Um, and, and we have a lot of work to do to build on that. But the momentum that was created and the work that our players put in was unbelievable. That'll, that'll be at the top for a long time. It'll always be our first here at Monmouth. 
Coach, just looking at the sign behind you, it says you've uh, something like you, you've come a long way, but you've got a long, long way to go. Is that a little bit about what you're talking about with your team this year, not resting on their laurels? Obviously, I still have chills thinking about that weekend in terms of watching your team play and what they were able to collectively do as a team. But is that a little bit of the message you're sending them or, or how do you build off of that emotion, but also make clear now a whole new season, there's a whole new mountain to climb. Absolutely. Well, first and foremost, you guys are a big part of our program now because you guys were on the call and you're on our highlight that we share with recruits. So you guys are just a big a part as a big a part of it. Um, so you're part of the memories and, and we celebrate you guys with us and the chills and the feels and everything that you guys were able to create in those memories. But uh, Dr. Martin Luther King Jr.'s daughter spoke at Monmouth and I was able to go with some of the players. And that was a really powerful, impactful thing. And that was the program they gave a while. And that is something that we do talk about. Um, let's celebrate how far we've come but let's focus on the process and the daily grind of getting better individually and collectively. Um, it feels a lot like year one to me, if I'm being really transparent. We have eight new players on our roster. Uh, they're learning the system. We have a new starting point guard. We've had a ton of success uh, with Stella Clark and Bree Tinsley holding down the one. And now we have Dro, who's joined us and, and we are, we're gonna have her for two years. So I'm really excited about that. But I love this team. I love their energy. We're bigger, faster, stronger. Um, yes, we're gonna, hang the banner on November 10th for St. John's and celebrate those accomplishments. And then, you know, as a coach, I'd like to put that away and move forward uh, with the business at hand. Coach, you do have a big player returning in terms of Ariana Vanderhoop. We watched her play in terms of that tournament. What she did, particularly in the tournament final, was just it was a great team performance, a great individual performance. Can you talk a little bit about her, what she brings to the program? I know we're all excited to see what the next evolution is going to bring for her. Yeah, she is the most hardworking, selfless kid you could ever dream of. She's a consummate professional. She takes what she does very seriously. She loves the game of basketball and players like her are really easy to coach. She comes in with a great energy and work ethic every day. Her teammates love her. She's almost too selfless at times. I would love to see her get more more opportunities, um, especially from beyond the arc. She was a little shy. Uh, I think she made single digit three pointers her freshman year and was up to 31 made threes last year. And I've challenged her whole year to double that this year. So again, a dream to coach. We absolutely love her. She's assuming the role of a leader this year and really owning that. So I couldn't be more proud of that young woman. Jenny, you, you brought up point guard play and you, you mentioned the name, but tell us a little bit more about your new point guard. Oh, well, she's dynamic. Uh, you know, she's a three level scorer. She plays with a lot more pace on both ends of the floor than we've had in the past. You know, again, Bree Tins was, was so steady for us, led us in assists and three pointers made last year. Uh, but Dro brings a different level of athleticism and defensively. You know, we're going to be able to play a little bit more my style um, and get up in ball hawk, play a little bit more 94 feet defensively. Uh, she's just got a contagious energy about her. She's fun. She's silly when it's time to be silly. And she's a killer when it's time to be a killer. And again, we've had so much success in finding players that fit my personality and coaching preferences. And, you know, what what are those things? Uh, Self-motivated, competitive great teammates and drove falls into that category and is a is a 10 out of 10 in all three areas i'm curious a lot of coaches will talk about how it's hard if not hardest to win a regular season title in a league right because you're going through the gauntlet all that the journey and and oftentimes you'll hear of coaches try to say well how do i wrap around my best from that regular season journey into the conference tournament. The thing is, you've actually, you've done that. You, you found a way to put that week together. It's kind of the reverse, uh, at least from, from our vantage point, of you put that week together where you showed how great you can be. Your kids saw, and yes, you have a lot of new, but what's the process with, with your returnees, with even the new, of, but especially the returnees of, hey, look what we can be. Now, how do we channel that into the marathon? Absolutely. And we I'm a stats person. I'm a numbers person. So the first thing that jumps off the page from last season is our only, you know, more than 10 point loss was our first conference loss against A&T. 
after that, we lost by 10 or fewer. And, and again, we were nine and nine in conference play. We struggled on the road, um, which was kind of discouraging for a veteran team. We're actually younger this year than we were last year. Uh, so those are things that we talk about as a staff. How can we be better? But I think the championship was a culmination of those lessons of the, the close loss at A&T you know, the close loss um, at Elon, Charleston, you know, those competitive games on the road, those gritty tough games, we learned lessons. Every possession matters. Every box out counts. Every free throw counts. And so I've challenged this group, hey, let's not relearn those lessons that we've already learned. Let's carry those forward. And that's what leaving the jersey in a better place is. That's what, you know, leadership is, is like we come to show everything we have for full 40 minutes every single night. And we did that in the tournament, uh, but I think that was really the first time that we did that last season. Coach, you've already talked about the fact that you have uh, some newer players on the roster. You're a younger team. You've given us a sense of some of that new talent. Can you talk to us a little bit more about some of the newcomers that we're going to see pretty early on and just some players we want to keep our eyes on? Yeah, so other than Tro, I would say Taisha really jumps off the page. She's going to be our starting four player. She's four or five. Uh, stretch three shooter, again, increased our athleticism and our size. We're a bigger team than we were last year. I thought we were pretty big. Uh, she runs well. She can be the point of our press. Um, again, attacks downhill. Looks more like a CAA athlete at, at the first spot than we had last year with Lovin Marcicano, who was incredible for us. Yeah, I wouldn't trade Lovin for the world. Um, but we've just leveled up on that on that athletic side, defensively and offensively. And the thing, again, about Ty, incredible teammate. I'm like, take that shot, kid. You're wide open. Um, but we're, we're very selfless. We're moving the ball around. We're learning to figure each other out. And then Jay Haynes came over from LaSalle um, before her junior season. She was a, the A-10 breakout player of the year in the preseason and then had a couple little injuries um, that kept her from really getting her flow. And so she's a big odd for us, plus defender, three-point shooter, uh, high IQ kid, played a great system over there at LaSalle. So we're excited to add her. I would say our freshman that's going to add the most early on is Rosalie Marcel. Uh, she's a Canadian freshman, um, just a really fun kid to watch play. She's got international experience playing with Team Canada and is buying into our system and fitting in with our returners really well. Coach, before we let you go, you talked about what the moment last March meant to your family. So expand upon that and and uh, tell all the viewers out there about your wonderful family. Uh, so, well, first, my partner, Chris, and my wife, uh, you know, we met when I was at Marquette as an assistant coach, and she moved to State College uh, when Coach Keeger got the head job at Penn State and left her family in Wisconsin and then came with me to help me chase my dream at the Jersey Shore. And just being transparent, when you ask a Midwesterner, like, hey, you want to move to Jersey? Um, it's, it's not always a like, let's go. Um, so she trusted me and believed in my dream and the vision and that I would choose something that was right for our family. And so she's I read the other day, if you marry well, everything gets easier. So I've certainly, certainly done that. Um, she's been so supportive. And my father lives here as well. Um, you know, he's He's my other rock. He moved up here to be near. He needs to be near me or my brother. But he's at every game, seeing him on the court. Um, and then, honestly, I looked over and I saw my best friend from high school who lives in D.C. And that was when the emotion really hit. Uh, you know, I tell these players all the time, you're representing something bigger than you. And to know the people that have been on my journey and supported me and supported us along the way, uh, the entire Monmouth community was behind us. Uh, Coach Rice, Coach Callahan, you know, our, our leadership, our president, everyone was so excited for Mama's women's basketball, and we're so proud to represent this institution. We're excited for you. We're excited for another season of Mama Fox women's basketball and to see what's in store with some new faces, but also others of championship caliber who did it last March, providing one of the best moments of championship week when the seven seeded Hawks won the CAA tournament. Coach, thanks so much for the time. Best of luck this season. It's been a great day. Thank you all. Enjoy watching. Thank you. Thank you, Jenny Vagas, doing a terrific job at Monmouth. We will see what's in store for this season. That was really a memorable run. And I'll tell you what, Monica, if there's any takeaway from today, from my end, and I, I want to get yours, it's a, there is, a, again, 
a wide openness to this conference where there's so much talent. You see the parity across all conference teams. I, I see some, I mean, Ariana Vanderhoop is an honorable mention for preseason. And to me, on her best day, she, she's an all-conference team member. And that kind of sums up the nature of this conference. It's just so competitive. And you're exactly right. I mean, on any given day, some of these players just stand out because of what they can bring and also just the leadership that they provide. But I agree with you. I mean, we talked about it earlier. It's really hard to do a preseason poll because so much is going to change. There's so much talent. There's a lot of games to be played. It just makes you really excited to have the non-conference season get started and then to jump into conference play. But back to Monmouth for a minute. I mentioned it earlier, but I think it just bears repeating to defeat the number one, the number two, and the number three seeds on your way to winning the tournament. They faced tough competition time and time again. And what impressed me the most about the performance is they never faltered. They seemed so confident. Coaches talk all the time about how you really have to believe. And just seeing how locked in that team was, how in the huddles they would focus so much on Coach Bogus and what she was saying. They believed every word that she said to them that weekend. It was just that connection, that relationship that we saw. It was something to see. Tay, when we look at the table in this league, taking a, away a lot of different things, but I'll give you the team that, that I think is poised for a big turnaround year and, and could spring onto the scene nationally and, and that is Jenna and Chiarico and Charleston because you return all five starters she's back ready to go 100 percent and you've got a veteran coach in Robin Harmony you could feel the vibe talking with Charleston today that they're upset with 11 and 18 a year ago and when you have your entire starting lineup back in this era of college basketball look out for the Cougars folks I completely agree with that. And she said something that I think is, is always true, but it's something that we need to keep our eyes on is that when you lose a player to injury in a season, like Jenna Anna Carico, who is just tremendous, that is a tough loss. But what happens invariably is that other players step into roles, they develop, they get other skills, they become even stronger on the floor. She's got a lot of those players back really took that opportunity. So I agree with you, John. They are absolutely ones to watch. Let's cap it off here with an exclamation point and go out to Hofstra and welcome in Danielle Santos Atkinson. You're five at the helm of the pride. Yeah, we're ending with some New York flavor here on CAA <laughs> Women's Basketball Media Day. Coach, I love seeing that smile. Love being able to talk with you. We're going to end with a bang here with the Hoffs to try. Let, let's start right with this. What excites you the most about your team heading into this year? Yes. The, the thing that I talk about all the time that is so exciting about this team uh, is not only just their desire and their want to win and to compete, but their willingness to do whatever it takes in order to get that done. And I think that's a difference amongst a, a lot of teams. You have some teams that want it, that talk about it, um, but they're not always willing to work for it. And this team has come in every single day and they get after it. They compete uh, and they are winners. They've got a winning mindset unlike no other. And it just gets me excited and gives me goosebumps. Coach, I loved watching your team play in the tournament last year. And you were just talking about that work ethic. There were a couple of players that really stood out to me all season long, but I got to watch them in the tournament and they were true standouts to me just because you just saw that desire out on the court. Allie Knights is one of the ones I'm thinking about. Emma Von Essen is one of the ones I'm thinking about. Can you talk about them and some of the other players that really just exemplify what you just said? Because that just rings so, so true to me when I watch them play. Yes. I mean, those two uh, in particular, they're very consistent. Uh, you know what you're going to get day in and day out from practice. They're going to come in. They're going to be early. Uh, they're going to practice. They're going to give it everything that they have, every possession. Uh, they're not one of those players. They're, they're not those players that are just waiting until game time to turn it on. Uh, they work every single day uh, in practice, every drill, every rep. They're not taking reps off. Uh, and when you have that sort of consistency, you get better and you get better at a high level. 
Uh, and when you have that sort of consistency, you're reliable. And as you mentioned, those are players that we can continue to rely on. Um, the other players in that mix, you have Sorelli Neza, you got Zaima Swint, both of those players in the tournament um, really shined uh, and, and were able to compete again at a, at, a, at a very high level. And those are players that when you are reliable and dependable and consistent uh, every day in practice, then you will be able to see uh, what you're looking to see in the upcoming in the upcoming year. And if I could ask a little more specifically about Sorelli Neza, because, you know, we see on the screen right now, average 10 points per game last year. She had that big game against Hampton, I think it was, where she had 24 back um, mm -hmm. last winter. We see that scoring presence that she, she really is capable of being. Her consistency was so huge. Can you talk a little bit more about where she's been focused preparing for this year? Yeah, I think one of the great things about Sorelli is just her maturity. Uh, off the floor, on the floor. She plays with such a steadiness uh, that it allows her to go through the runs of the game and remain consistent. Uh, offensively, with her scoring uh, presence, she is so versatile. She can score in a variety of ways. She's got a great three-point shot. Um, she's got a beautiful pull-up jumper, and she's got a quick explosive first step that allows her to get to the basket with the ability to score over bigger and larger players. And so with that versatility, we love to take advantage of it on the offensive end and, and put her the ball in her hands and, and put her in a position to be able to score. Um, but she's done a great job for us. But again, I, I think her leadership and her maturity are, are the, some of the biggest things that have really helped us over these past years and is really going to play a large part uh, coming into this season. Danielle, focusing on you and your coaching journey uh, a little bit, of course, uh, playing at, at Florida, three postseason appearances, during your career there, but you've been a part of the Women's Basketball Coaches Association, Women's Coaches Next Up program. You've been a part of the Women's Coaches Leadership Academy. You've had that that role. And, and I want to know two things. One, what's it mean to be a coach day in and day out? And two, we need more black women coaches in college basketball. That That's something that I, I think needs to continue to grow. Uh, how yes. passionate are you about that and also mentoring other women? Absolutely. This is, uh, I was counting the other day on my fingers, uh, that this is year 18. And when I think about that and, and how fast it's gone, it's amazing. Uh, my parents are with us throughout the year, amazing support for me. And when you get in the thick of it, you get stressed out, you're tired. And my mom always asks me, do you still love it? And I tell her, absolutely. Um, I love it. I love what I do. I, I feel as though this is my purpose. And to be able to walk in my purpose every single day and, and have the opportunity to do it uh, at, at a place like Hofstra, to have the opportunity to do it with the players that we have on our team, uh, that is special for me. It is. Uh, when you talk about mentoring, uh, that is that is one of the ultimate passions for me. I, I want to be a mentor for our players. I want our players to be able to see that you can be a mom, um, you can be a, a black woman in, in professional sports, uh, and you can be great at all of them. Uh, and you don't have to sacrifice anything to be able to do what you want to do and achieve your goals. And that is that is what I love to do in, in impacting the lives of the people that are part of our program and the young women that are on our team. Um, that is what I wake up to do every single day. And the fact that I get to do all of those things while coaching basketball, which I absolutely love and, and competing, it's an absolute blessing. Um, and it's something that I don't take for granted. And it, it is something that I try to do every single day at a, at a high level for these players on our team and for all the coaches and, and players and, and people that are looking to coach uh, and, and be a head coach one day. Coach, we've talked a lot about some of the returning players that you have. You do have a lot of talent returning, but you've brought in a lot of newcomers as well. You have a lot of key transfers coming in. Can you preview for us some of these newcomers that we're going to see a lot of and that you think are going to bring a lot to this team this year? Yeah, I'm excited about our new players because I feel as though they have brought some pieces to our team in, in areas where we needed to get better. Um, within just when you're looking at the group, we've brought in some athleticism. And I think one of the things we, 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 we wanted to do was get quicker to, to be able to be more aggressive offensively and defensively. So from an athletic standpoint, we're, we're a bit more athletic. Um, we've got to continue to rebound the basketball. And, and we've brought in uh, some size at that guard spot. 
um, some strength at the guard spot and, and some and some length uh, and, and our post spot and physicality uh, to be able to rebound that basketball, to be able to stretch the floor from a face-up post perspective, um, some versatility there, which we lost in Brandy. Um, and so I'm excited. We have Brooke, uh, Brooke Anya, who is physical. She's versatile, can play inside out, um, played uh, is coming from a championship program where she's been a part of the championship. She knows what that's like. She knows what it looks like. Uh, and she's been there. So I love that about her, her leadership and her maturity as well. And, and as a senior on the floor, um, she gets it. And, and we're going to continue to lean on that. We've got two freshmen and, and Anna Brown and Michaela Carter. And again, they they stretch us in, in that athleticism and, and really push us to get after it. Um, they both have the ability to score from the perimeter. Um, and it's great defensively, offensively. And then you've got Jemiah, who is, is long, lean. She's going to get in there, fly around, and rebound that basketball. Um, but again, from that face-up spot, just her versatility and being able to play multiple positions on the floor and, and multiple spots on the floor, it's got us more athletic, we're more versatile, um, and I'm excited about them. everybody coming in. Danielle, you're taking the curtain down on our comprehensive, close to six hours of coverage of CAA Basketball Media Day. So I'll leave you with this. How would you define this conference and what makes it what it is. Yes, competitive, top to bottom. And that's what I love. Um, every day you come out there, and I think it was a testament to that last year. Any given night after games, we're checking scores, and it's like, whoa, this this upset here and this team here. Um, but when you look at them, I don't know if they're upsets. I, I think it's such a balanced league. Um, every given night that every time you walk out on the floor, you've got to bring your A game. You've got to be ready to go. Um, and you want to be competitive. I think it's those teams that are that are willing to fight, that are willing to to play for 40 minutes and do the little things. Those are the teams that are successful in the end, uh, and those are the teams that are are able to to pull it out and, and have success not year round, but also in the tournament. But I, I I really enjoy our conference. I think it is competitive not just within league but nationally. Um, and I think uh, the additions to our conference have only enhanced our conference and and made us stronger. Coach Danielle Santos Atkinson leading Hofstra to the quarterfinals of the 2023 CAA Women's Basketball Championship, winning two games in the CAA tournament for the first time since 2019. Let's see what's in store for 2023-24. Coach, appreciate you taking the time from Long Island. Best of luck and grab a slice for us one of these days over there in Long Island. They got the best pizza. We will, absolutely. Thank you. There she is, Coach Santos Atkinson. We appreciate her. Monica Moore, it's been a pleasure to be with you. Final thoughts here on CAA Women's Basketball Media Day. Well, you, you might think we'd be tired after talking with all those coaches, but I am absolutely so fired up right now. I wish that the season started tomorrow because I cannot wait to see these teams play. They all have different things that they bring to the table. And when conference play starts, let me tell you, everything's up for grabs. There will be upsets. There will be players that just give these unbelievably exceptional performances. And there will be one team, like we saw last year, that will just gel together in the right moment. And we'll be crowning them as champions when tournament time rolls around. And I cannot wait for all of it. We want to thank Dagan Hughes, our producer behind the scenes, making everything work. We want to thank Jeff Goodman. We want to thank Rob Dowster. I want to thank you, Monica Moore. I want to thank Joe D'Antonio and his entire conference staff. So many people made this day come together. Miles McQuiggan, Rob Washburn, uh, Hunter Peters. The list goes on and on and on. Sean Murphy and the whole, whole crew over at the Coastal Athletic Association. I'm John Fanta. Thank you for tuning in to CAA Basketball Media Day on the Field of 68 Media Network. So exciting for all of us here at the Field of 68 family to partner with the CAA and to partner with so many other conferences across college basketball and continue to bring you great preseason coverage, folks. The season is inching closer. We're just over two weeks away. So head on over to the Field of 68 YouTube for your latest content. And this broadcast, of course, will be archived on our YouTube page. You can check out all of our conversations with the coaches. Thanks to all the CAA for their help. And thanks again to all of you for watching. So long. This has been CAA Basketball Media Day.